It's pretty out of this world to have an astronaut making the ceremonial move in round three of the FIDE World Championship. The people's hero of Kazakhstan, Talgat Musabayev, graced the players with his presence today. After the second round, Jan leads by one point, with the score currently sitting at 1.5, 0.5, with yesterday being a rest day. Today's game started off as a Queen's Gambit declined with nothing unusual. Rather that, after 11 moves, the position started to look awfully familiar. Turns out it was identical to a game played just yesterday against Daniel Dubov and Amirzan Anatov in a simul hosted by FIDE. Surprisingly, that game too ended in a draw. Sorry for the spoiler. So right now, okay, Ding can of course play the non-committal move, Knight BD7. And by the way, we're following the game Giri Ding from the Chessable Masters from May 2022. Also, Nepo Kramnik from the Zurich Chess Challenge 2007 Blitz game. Uh, so both players have experience in this position. Moves started to be repeated as we catch Jan glance at his notation, and Ding seemed rather comfortable at this point. The game ended in a move repetition. I mean, my, I don't know, my prediction would be like it's a very logical place for the game to end in a repetition. Yes. Obviously, Ding is ready for it. And I think, as you say, it is justified here. Mm -hmm. I really don't see a better plan for either side. He doesn't look like oh, he's going to. Yeah, when you start looking at your score sheet, you know that that's not the sign of someone who's but I think, uh, trying to avoid a repetition. That, that is true. They have actually drawn the game. And yeah, and they're talking to each other after the game. Yeah, um, I think Ding looks a little bit happier. Yes, I, I, yeah, well, even, I even though he probably wanted more of a fight, he's... Uh, must be happy to have equalized well, not had any problems and so on. But it seems that uh, uh, the game was also quite well played. We've been looking for all sorts of alternatives and they weren't easy. So at the end, a uh, high level draw. As we join players in the press conference, Ding Li Ren discusses the final position. Yeah, in the, uh, instead of 9c7, I also considered d4, but it was, was too risky if we take on d4 with the pawn. So I think in the end, the draw is a pretty uh, decent result for both of us. Jan Lepomnishi thought he played the Carlsbad structure inaccurately. I think a lot of games was played in this Carlsbad structure, so it's, uh, I guess maybe I played like in some suboptimal way because yeah, somehow I, maybe there was a moment when I could like uh, get his knowledge, but uh, yeah, I guess after bishop b5 takes, when I took on d7, d7 is quite a move, and uh, I felt like suddenly I should be <coughs> accurate, like should be precise, not to, yeah, I mean, surely I'm not like too happy, <laughs> obviously, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think a close game. Ding addresses his emotions and how he overcame his mental block. Um, I'm getting better um, and better. You can see I spend more time uh, on the stage, then just hide in the restroom. <laughs> Thank you. And I would ask this question right away. Uh, you said earlier that your friends <coughs> helped you mm -hmm. to, to, to have more positive energy. Can you share exactly how they helped you? At some point, I thought I may have some problem with my mental, <laughs> with my mind, but in the end, it's not so serious as I expected. He uh, talks to me and, and uh, even suggest that if I, I need a, a doctor, but in the end maybe it's not that serious. It's maybe can, com can be concluded as a pressure before the match. Tomorrow, Ding takes the white pieces in an attempt to level the score. Catch the commentary team tomorrow at 3 p.m. for the fourth round of the FIDE World Championship match. Check out FIDE Twitter and have your questions answered by commentators and players. See you soon. As the world holds its breath, two unstoppable minds prepare for immortality. One from the land of the dragon, the other from the land of the bear. 
together, they will write history. The patient and precise Ding, carefully calculating every move to gain a strategic advantage, facing the aggressive Nepomniachi, who is always looking to take risks and never afraid to make bold moves to pressure his opponents. Their eyes might be fixed on the board, but their minds will be focused on victory. These two titans of the chessboard have fought their way through the ranks, demonstrating skill, strategy, and a fierce competitive spirit. Now they will go head to head and fight for the ultimate title, the FIDE World Championship Crown. Where champions come and go, chess endures. And I'm just very, very happy birthday, Gary. Oh, yeah. Yes. You don't, they don't get audio. Oh, we are back with our audio. Um, I think, I don't know, maybe we, we missed the whole part where we were congratulating Gary. We'll just do it again. Yeah. So today, guys, is April 13th, and it is the birthday of Gary Casper. He's turning 60 years old today, and we wanted to congratulate Gary, to thank him for all of his many contributions to the game of chess and to wish him good health, uh, longevity, energy, and many creative achievements. Yes, absolutely. A le truly legendary champion. Um, Long-time colleague of mine. I've had the pleasure, even the honor, of uh, sp spending um, a very, very big part of my career competing with him. And uh, just very, very happy 60th birthday, Gary. It's truly really historic day for chess. Vishy, you, you mentioned in your book how it's hard to sometimes to believe that you know you're getting older, that you've been in chess for so long, you've you know you've um, you know you've come up as like the young player, you and all your colleagues like Boris Gelfand, and you kind of joked about the older guys when you were young, and now you're at this age, and you kind of it's hard to believe that you're here. I mean, I mean you don't really feel that old, do you? Not at all. There were times when. Boris and me would talk about, let's say, Luboyevich or Timon, and uh, we'd say, my God, can you imagine? They're 40 already, and, and the other one would reply, uh, what is 40? That seems unbelievable. That conversation is very, very fresh in my head, and here uh, we are well past 40 ourselves. Um, yes, you, uh, you, you see everything else change around you. Uh, that's how you figure it out, but uh, we try to stay young at heart. Yeah. Well, let's, get, let's talk about the match and what we're expecting to see today. So it seemed to me, Vishy, that game three brought about a palpable change in the dynamics of the match, which up to that point had been going very unfavorably for a Ding Li Ren. And pretty much everything that could have been going wrong for him did go wrong for him in the first two games. But game three, uh, after game three, it suddenly seemed not so bad for him. What are your thoughts on that? I agree fully. After a, a defeat and the kind of defeat he suffered, you need to get back to some sort of equilibrium. You, you need to find your balance again. And if you're still groggy after this uh, really knockout punch, then it's very tough for you to play. So I think yesterday he was able to settle in with black, comfortable draw. He looked genuinely happy in the press conference. There's a lovely smile in that uh, picture they took. And hopefully that's some relief. Also, by now, I think that defeat feels a long time ago. It was uh, three days ago. There was a rest in between. There was another day, uh, another chess game played. So it's receded in his mind. But um, look, he's going to continue the match every day. 
knowing that he's a point behind. It's a, like a sword hanging over you. It's not going to fall right now, but you know that it's, uh, its influence you'll feel all through the rest of the match. So he's going to have to start um, um, accelerating. And I think he might as well start today. You cannot uh, coast too much. Obviously, you have to decide when you're ready for it. But I think uh, um, you know, use every game you have to put pressure on you. Well, let me ask you a question, Vishy. I heard you describing once a world championship match as a series of mini matches. Mm -hmm. So for example, like if they're split up in two games, it's let's say it could be six mini matches or seven mini matches of two games. Is it possible for him to just completely erase this loss from his memory and be like, OK, I lost that mini match of two games. Now um, I'm on to my next mini match. Partially. You, you do feel at some point that uh, you come to terms with anything. No matter how bitter it feels, you come to terms with it. and. A day or two later, you've accepted. You've accepted that you're minus one. You've accepted that that game is gone. And that is very close to finding your equilibrium again. But um, uh, he does have to start. Uh, he knows that uh, the score is hanging over his head, like I said. So, um, But I, what I was also referring to is the fact that in a given match, you can have swings. You can be in great form for four days. And then suddenly, you don't know what uh, happens to you. Your level drops. You struggle the next few days, even lose a game, and you know you have. That's what really what I was referring to in many mm -hmm. matches. Um, of course, we are not even talking the 24 game matches. Even within a 12 game match, you have two bad days, then suddenly three good days, and then two bad days. You know, it can go like that, and you mentally wonder what's uh, different, what yeah. changed. So, but maybe the best thing is to assume that uh, these things are just part of a match, and uh, not fret too much about it. Well, let's talk about the press conferences. I mean, this is one of the best ways for us as chess fans to get an insight into the inner mental state of the players. And one of the things that's been striking in the press conferences is that actually the player that has been more forthright about uh, how he's been feeling has been dinged. Um, and I say, you know, surprising just because, you know, he's known as a rather reserved, quiet guy, uh, has been described even as shy, and obviously, um, it's kind of harder for him to communicate in English than Jan. And yet all the juicy nuggets have been coming out uh, from him in the press conferences about how he's been feeling. He's been telling us that he was quite depressed and um, you know, uncertain in his first games. Um, obviously, the, the second game, was a, was a, he described it as a catastrophe, catastrophe for him. And after the third game, you know, he was saying that with the support of his friends, um, he's feeling a lot better. Um, so what do you think, Vishy? I mean, have you been surprised by this level of forthrightness for him? Is that like a typical thing? Um, I think he is uh, rising to the occasion as a, I mean, here he has a platform. People are interested in him for a moment and no one else. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no one to share the limelight with. And maybe the spotlight, the focus, and uh, he opens up. Also, um, it's you know a lot of his personal issues that he spoke about. It happened when he was unable to play chess. And so maybe it weighed even more heavily on him, that he was sitting at home and thinking about it. Uh, in a sense, if he had been able to travel somewhere and play, it would have been an outlet. But he lacked that, and uh, maybe he took it uh, harder. Uh, but you're right, it's very fascinating to get a, such a glimpse into him, because um, he said, I think he went beyond what even I would feel uh, uh, compelled to say. There mm -hmm. are things I would decide not to mention, but he seemed really. Um, open about everything, and uh, that's a fascinating insight. I've known him for many years, and I did not know this side of him, so. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it might be even kind of therapeutic for him to be just talking about what he's feeling and not hiding it. And um, even though Jan is, in general, a very you know gregarious guy, you know, I think with an outgoing personality, um, he's been a lot more sphinx-like in the press conferences. And one thing that I noticed was that he didn't really show any emotion after winning his second game. Like I would have expected to see, you know, a little bit more smiling, a little bit, you know, more of that energy, especially when you win this kind of crushing game as black. But he kind of came to the press conference and it was all business as usual, is what it seemed like. And I understand, of course, that when your opponent is there having lost such a game, you don't want to be jumping on their grave and, you know, fist pumping. Um, you know, some restraint is necessary, but at the same time, I mean, if you're not going to show happiness when you're winning a world championship game, when are you, are you allowed to celebrate in chess fishing? 
What can I tell you? When I won game nine uh, in New York, I was very matter of fact. Of course, I was happy inside, but I didn't quite know where I was and what, what was happening. And, and also, there's the feeling of not wanting to let loose too early, because there is still a, uh, generally when we see uh, people you know, in a tennis court falling on the floor and uh, crying, or uh, in any big sport, you celebrate the thing. The biggest celebrations come at the end, when there is nothing left to prove. Mm -hmm. As long as you still uh, got something to play and work to do, you don't want to do it. Anyway, I remember quite clearly, so we went to the press conference. And then somebody told me, uh, I, I think a photographer and also one of the PCA guys, they said, uh, Bishi, can we see a yay or something? So very slow, reluctant yay, and <laughs> they took it, I think. But I didn't feel like doing it at all. So I understand, I understand Jan's situation fully. Uh, when the time does come to celebrate, I'm sure he'll celebrate. And equally, if I had won the second game that day, I would have slept beautifully that night. I would have gone home, enjoyed, guilt-free, you can cut yourself some slack. And on the third, uh, on the rest day, I would have started to get back to work. So there is happiness, happiness you show and happiness you don't show. I, I thought uh, nothing surprising about that. In fact, I'd be surprised if people went crazy unless they genuinely feel the cameras on them. Well, I mean, so how about your uh, inner happiness, the one that you weren't showing, like on a scale of one to 10? How happy were you at winning that first world championship game against Gary? I was very happy at the same time, I think probably seven. Uh, at the same time, I knew that uh, now there was a wounded tiger on the other side, or blah, 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 and uh, that there'd be work to do. And also quickly, my God, what do I have to do with black? What do I have to do in this game, that game? And we saw in that first match, there was every reason to <laughs> worry because things went wrong right away. So. Um, even a win is not always an unalloyed blessing. Sometimes uh, the winner needs as much time to get used to the new situation as the loser. Mm -hmm. um, so basically you're saying that it's quite normal for a world championship participant to be pretty sober even about their wins, try to kind of conserve their, uh, n their nervous energy, even their positive emotions, um, keep it kind of to a minimum because the match is long and you just don't want to uh, be bathing in those emotions for too, for too much of the time. There's an element of that, but I also remember something uh, somebody told me. He said, why, why do people act as if they don't deserve to win, as if it was a miracle that they won? Mm -hmm. They should act as if it's normal that they won. They should act as if that is within their capability. Uh, do they not believe in themselves? Which is another way to think. So, you know, definitely you want to say, uh, you know, I. I was very focused, I hung in there till the end, and I hauled it in, and great job done or whatever, but you never want to overdo it, because uh, at some level, do you think it shouldn't have happened? Do you think you won a lottery ticket? No, you, uh, you did something that was within your capability. Then, uh, I mean, simply, you have all these balancing emotions. Uh, certainly, you're happy, but uh, at, at any rate, I would not go crazy showing it. Well, you know, I guess, um the reason it's an interesting topic for me is because in general, chess players don't show a lot of emotions. And we know, we know that a lot of chess is, uh, is suffering. And the better you get, the less of a chance you have to experience these highs, right? Because you, as you get stronger, you know, and you're, you know, who are you going to be happy that you beat? Only people who are better than you. Well, what if you're one of the best in the world? You, there's, only, <laughs> there, there's only a few people that you can beat that will make you happy. And everything else is just kind of considered like, oh, that's a given. You know, so when something happens or something, you know, you're playing a match and it's a, you know, it's a tough situation, you get that win, it seems like, you know, like a chess player should, um, should enjoy that moment. You're right, and uh, the same uh, with me. I, I, I am genuinely happy, but uh, not happy enough to show it like that. And I don't feel that if I didn't show it, I missed a chance or I don't mm -hmm. relive. If I didn't achieve the thing, I would think that's a missed opportunity, but not the demonstration of it. Uh, there are people I dislike whom I'm very happy to have beaten. There are people I find uh, inconvenient to play. Then I'm very happy. I, there are many challenges and big challenges. But uh, uh, happiness, I think, is really something you feel inside. It's really a, a, a showman's uh, thing to do it um, uh, publicly. Anyway. Let's yeah, well, this conversation Katie. has actually flown by, and the game is about to start. So let's listen to Ketsy introduce the. Uh, Mike Klein, the senior journalist for Chess.com, who's representing Chessable, make the first move today. ...of Chess.com and also representative of Chessable.
Thank you very much. One second for photos. Thank you, and from now the chief arbiter will take over. Thank you. Okay, guys, we are back, and Ding has the white pieces today. We're waiting to see what he's going to do on the first move. It looks like Mike Klein played the move B3 for him, which elicited some smiles from the players. Um, definitely this tradition of having someone make the ceremonial first move tends to get some smiles from the players. Yesterday, actually, Vichy, uh, the astronaut, uh, the people's hero from Kazakhstan made the move d4 for white. We couldn't quite make it out from our vantage point, but he played d4, and that is the reason why Nepo was smiling, because actually that is the move that he planned to play in is the that? game. Sure. All right, so we got c4 from Ding today. Um, so he's making a switch up from his game too, but of course we're not too surprised by this choice of move. And Jan replies with knight f6, so... Which could well transpose mm -hmm. back, so... But Ding, I mean, do you think we're going to see knight c3 perhaps, knight c3, e6, and then kind of a question for white from this position? So it's interesting. In the candidates match, uh, Jan played e5, mm -hmm. Ding went g3, mm -hmm. and that's a very specific line. It, mm -hmm. it will no longer be possible after knight c3. Yeah. So... Um, the fact of knight f6 itself uh, kind of saying, I'm going to decline that particular uh, theoretical battle. OK, so yeah, knight f6. It's interesting that he did not go for the move that brought him that victory in the candidate's game. He is uh, going for e5, yes. though. But mm -hmm. g3, c6 is not the line anymore. That was a very specific thing, a response to bishop g2. So now, um, uh, after e5, which has happened, Okay. They will just go for the four knights, mm -hmm. and, C3, and I assume e5. g3. Ah, okay. Though these days people play a3, e3, all sorts of other things, but even d3. Yeah, so you know, Vishy, I was surprised in this line uh, at the American Cup when my <coughs> opponent played the move e4. Yes, that is um, that is a modern computerized line, I guess, but it's uh, a pretty impressive one. Black is a whole pawn down, mm -hmm. uh, and. It's not even like he's far ahead in development because when white plays knight g3, it's in fact black whose knight mm -hmm. has to catch up. But black lashes out with h5, h4, kicks the knight around some more. Well, I, I, since we're going so far, we might as well show the line. Mm -hmm. um, so recently, there's a sort of computer-based line which goes like this. Knight uh, c6, yes. So you take. kick the knight. Everything they taught us not to do when we were young, but computers now show that black has good compensation here. And it's this typical new way of playing chess, which is to push the hedge pawn all the way up the board, mm -hmm. either on h3 or on h4, that it yeah. has a significant influence on the game. So a very topical line, but these guys are going, is he, did he go e3? Yeah, he went yes, e3 he has and, gone this e3 should and this should be 4 has yeah. happened. Nice. Uh, now there are a couple of lines. One is to go queen c2, and black sometimes just takes mm -hmm. it. Plays you can also go d6. And d5, yeah. Yes, and uh, but also there is uh, knight d5. Mm -hmm. But I suspect we won't see that. So let's let's uh, try to explain to the viewers, Vishy. This is like a reversed Sicilian, right? Mm -hmm. And Nepo definitely has a liking for these reverse Sicilian lines. Um, now, bishop b4, yeah, queen c2, right? So it's actually on the board. Now we're waiting black's move. You said black can take this knight. Uh, oh, I think you can play what? Isn't it d6? Move, right? You can play d6 as well, d6. right? d6, okay. So because of knight d5, we just go back to c5 and wait some more. If I'm not mistaken. This knight, something else. But yeah, and what would white play here? Is it like, we don't have any, like, Maybe a3 or? Yeah, or even on the previous move, you could play a3, bishop takes c3, queen c3. But then I think at least you've provoked a3 for mm. free. But on the other hand, then black is less likely to play d5. d5. 
Yeah, well, he's taking. But he's just taking it. Yeah, that's considered the the most kind of precise way, I guess, to play. Now, very important. Mm -hmm. Is he going to take with the B pawn, or is he going to take with uh, the queen? Okay. So that yeah. is still uh, relevant. Right. Yeah. Very big difference. Um, He's going for the, the pawn. pawn. Yeah, okay. look at that, right? Because yeah, queen c3, then black goes queen e7, defending that pawn, and then they play d5, and it's considered that this is quite okay mm -hmm. for black. Um, but bc3, okay, I don't know as much about this position. Obviously, it's probably like a, yeah. Oh, actually, is this a famous line? It kind of reminds me of some, is it Karpov games? Kar Kasparov, Karpov with like, there are these Grunfels and this structure. I don't know, Vishy, why I'm thinking of that. Yes, well, I think they do go d6, uh, d3, and then one fashionable idea is to, to play e4. Yeah. Uh, d4. No, sorry. Uh, d6, d3, e4 as a pawn Ah, sack. you want to sack the pawn. OK, d6, d3, d3 e4. give up the pawn. Not exactly this position, but d takes e4, and then you can play against these pawns. Because though white is a pawn up, he's got two sets of double mm. pawns, which is a very clumsy pawn structure. You can't really get your pawn mass going. Mm -hmm. um, Black might put his knight on c5 or something. Um, also, instead of e4, if you castle, mm -hmm. uh, then white will go, white e4. Will go e4. And then yeah. you, you have to move the knight to e8 or h5 or whatever and try to play f5. So all sorts mm -hmm. of interesting ideas. He's gone d6. Let's see what will happen. I suspect he'll just play d3. Uh, Actually, in that case, Vishy, you can also play <laughs> E4, right? Yeah, I think he's gone D3. Has he no? gone D3? He's gone E4. Oh, Sorry, it was that one that he touched. OK, so he's eliminating this yeah, uh, D3, exa E4 thing. Exactly. But now yeah. if I castle and white plays whatever D3, then we'll have to see how black uh, goes for the, is he going for the F5 yeah. break? Or is he just going to potter around? I have to say, I do like the way this game is developing, right? So like a longer, longer fight, maneuvering game. I also think it's less theoretical than a lot of other things that could have happened. Um, and this structure, by the way, can be, I mean, it's a very double-edged structure, right? Like, uh, one hand, white has the two bishops, better center, but then they've got those double C pawns, black often um, looks for counterplay on the queen side like that, right, Vishy, once this pawn mm -hmm. goes to d3. Um, where, I mean, in terms of other counterplay, I don't know, do you think, like, in the long run, black will look at these ideas, or that's not going to be so attractive when this bishop gets to this diagonal? Also, we have to... Uh, in this position, mm -hmm. there are lines like this. Mm. Where white has conserved this move queen c2. Mm -hmm. And uh, now black will again try to move his knight and play f5. So mm -hmm. easy break to make. But white can maybe do g3, knight h4, and try mm -hmm. to restrain that. Um, lots of details, but. Um, I think a6, b5 used to be effective, and nowadays they just clamp down with a4, and they say, uh, even at the cost of weakening my mm. pawns, I'm just not going to allow it. But uh. OK, so Nepo is back to the board. Um, let's see how far his preparation goes in this game. I mean, already he's slowed down a little bit. So after e4, well, we can expect to move castles, right? Because that's the only direction black is castling in these positions. So let's say black castles, white goes. I mean, maybe you don't even need to play d3 yet, Vishy, right? I mean, you can sort of hold off with that a little bit. Such as bishop e2, maybe? So that's the question. So where, do you, where does the bishop go in these positions? Is it e2 or is it g2, since this move is in general not? Uh, g3 is uh, interesting, mm -hmm. uh, because if knight e8, maybe oh, but you're maybe going knight h4. Yeah, do you feel like at any point there's like some bishop g4 move or? I think you would just go, go bishop h4. g2 and uh, d3 h3. Uh, and then you, ha and yeah, you also have this next, yeah. yeah. Because a closed position, but I can expand on the king side. And uh, that's maybe white's mm. incentive, yeah. So, you know, we've been talking about difficulty sleeping during a world championship match, Vichy, and it looks like Nepo. Is catching up uh, yeah. at the board. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, let's let's see. So he's obviously in his um, remembering By his the way, prep pose. It, it is possible that, uh, in fact, it is more likely that he's just uh, trying to settle into the game. But chess players have lovely ways to s 
to concentrate in, during a game, as well as predictably immortalized in the Queen's Gambit. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. So we got uh, E4, okay, if Nepo castles, then Ding is going to have to show us where he plans to develop this bishop. Yes. So what's your intuitive feel? Which one do you like more? I think if I wanted to go bishop g4, I could do it now, so that you have to come in bishop e2. But I don't know if I really oh, accomplished anything. You mean instead, instead that. of castles yes. for black? Mm -hmm. You want to go here, maybe. Ah, okay, you're stopping me from going g3. You're also, obviously, I, I don't think I can have like ideas like that. So early in the game. D3, um, f I think I'll take a knight h5, and it's not really worth it, right, strategically. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're not going to be allowing, I think, these double pawns, two, s two sets of double pawns, and then the problem is you knight can't even play. Knight h5, stop f4. Yes. Yeah, you can't even play f4. So here the knights are doing quite well, and yeah, that queen is coming in, and we don't want that. So, well, let me ask you, I mean, how insane is this move? Can I take? Can on you e4? take an e4 because I see at the end there's an f5 break. Yes, motion, right? yes, there's a five. Yeah, exactly. So queen takes h4. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that we could do something with this h3, pin. H3, yes. Yeah. So h3, but I have f5 have protecting the bishop and mm -hmm. uh, kicking your queen from the fourth. So yeah, so that way you're going to be able to save your bishop, and that didn't quite work out for white. So yeah, that mm -hmm. move is premature. So let's try bishop e2. Now. Castles, castles. Yeah, you never really want to take this knight, right? I mean, so easily like that, because I mean, you should be worse with the two knights against the two bishops. It's not a two bishops position because the pawn structure is really closed mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to open up. But on the other hand, they're lurking in the background, always waiting for things to open up. And um, black doesn't have the kind of uh, ideal squares for the knights which yet, which he can use. I mean, if, if the pawn was on d5, then c5 suggests itself and so on. But here it just feels that um, there's no need to volunteer this bishop takes mm -hmm. f3 capture. So let's say black castles and white castles. I mean, I could even start with h3 and ask you right mm -hmm. away. So perhaps bishop g4 is not such a great move, really. OK, Nepo, I think, has castled, which is the most natural move in the position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. Um, ah, okay, well he's castled instead of bishop g4, so that this is the point where Ding does have a choice about where to develop his bishop, and you see how quick he is to come back to the board. I have to say, Vishu, that I think, um, you know, the players were receptive to, like, the concerns of the chess world about how much time they were spending in the rest area, because it was just clear, like, once they got those points and questions at the press conference after game two, game three we saw a completely different story, now we see the players at the board all the time. Yes, very much. I think uh, at the beginning they were not, um, maybe they couldn't visualize the visual impact that they were mm -hmm. uh, having, but now they see clearly that you have to kind of put yourself in the place of the audience and see, you know, what is it the audience sees? And then they realize, well, uh, hanging out in the restroom too much yeah. uh, looks strange, and they've both, yes, modified that particular aspect. That's true. Yeah, and I think that makes sense, you know, when you're playing a match for the world crown that you should care just, you know, a little bit about what the chess f fans around the world are thinking. And yeah, it's much, much more enjoyable experience for the fans to see the players at the board. I mean, see already how much expression we're getting Very much. Uh, from Jan. I mean, this, you know, again, it's not, it, well, this, is this a posture that you've ever held when you've been playing Avishi? Because it kind of, it's a little bit unusual, right? The sort of like the half asleep, you know, head, head down on the table type of pose. Yes, it is uh, quite strange because, but when you are tense, mm -hmm. one of the things you really long to do is to yawn. Mm -hmm. And for the players, it's a big problem uh, because you're not going to yawn while there's such high resolution cameras focused on you. So you, you have to cope with it when you can. But then it's, I think, better to get up, go to your <laughs> restroom, uh, face away, and uh, yawn or something. Uh, sometimes you feel the need to stretch yourself. You, Thing because you do feel a lot of tension there, and, and it's only going up, so you want to think. But uh, mm. you do have to think about the visual impact. Oh, wait, so, oh, we have a move from Ding. OK, Bishop I was E2. wondering why he got up. OK, he did play Bishop E2. And that is what is causing Nepo to think. So Bishop E2, yeah, he decided it wasn't necessary to fianchetto that bishop. 
And yeah, it's time to talk about some plans here, Vishy. So we have this, this plan of F5, right? So you could go, for example, and I don't H5? know. Okay, you'd like knight h5. I was thinking maybe knight e8. So let's see, knight h5. So there's obviously a reason that you think that there's not going to be a discovery. Is it like queen g5 at the end or? Knight takes e5. Mm -hmm. First of all, there was knight f4, mm -hmm. which may not work. It probably isn't going to work, but uh, it's fun while it's there. Okay, let's try it. Let's try yeah, it. So, so knight takes c6, knight takes, six, knight takes g2, and king f1. King f1. By the way, even king d1. Yes, but then I can just capture on, capture on c6. But you would get, an, wouldn't you get like enormous compensation, I don't know, in some sort of position like, so we have seven pawns each. I mean, like this. Like this seems like I have a very impressive center. That's true, but uh, I would get in queen h4. Yeah, and I'm threatening H4. to swap one of the bishops. I'm threatening yeah, you want to go knight of yeah. four. Okay, so it's not, it's not so clear. Of course, white's king is in the center, not very comfortable. But king f1, mm -hmm. the question is, do I want to play bishop h3? Knight yeah. takes d8, knight c2, check. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, this is king g1. Mm -hmm. uh, knight takes c2, rook b1, and maybe that knight isn't going, <laughs> is being trapped. So. Oh well, that is, is not is ideal. It, but it, wait, yeah, is is this knight being? I guess um, so. You're saying like if I take back with something, so how are you trapping this knight? I Let's could just go see rook. Uh, I mean, I maybe bishop b two. King f two, but then you're going to play f five. How about this one? Or rook b two. Mm, Ninety one. Oh, you're going to e one. Oh yeah, I'm going here. Oh yeah, you're going to play bishop g two. Bishop takes h one. I don't know. Yeah, but that's what I'm thinking. Like this, can we? Trap this guy. I mean F five. F five. Rook c one, and you're you're fast. Rook f six. Rook f six. Yeah. Let's just see that for a second. Rook f six. Okay, that's a small small threat right here. And how am I saving myself? Hmm. I have to like. Yeah. You can't say already. You're losing the piece by force. Oh yeah, You'll because you're also H5. coming down here as well. And you're missing things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But by the way, look at that. Jan has played knight h5. Knight h5, yes. But more interesting, I think, is g3. Mm -hmm. Right here. Yes, because if uh, f5, mm -hmm. you could play knight h4. Mm -hmm. I could play knight f4, because the knight on h4 is mm -hmm. being attacked by the black queen. So if you took gf4, I'd play queen h4. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, you would take on f5, I would take on e2. It is also a kind of mess. But I think but black this is, is not a bad mess not a, for black. I don't think this yeah. is a way to do it for black. So For white, sorry. Exactly, right. Because this. So Ding mm -hmm. Liren has gone d4. OK, so this is a um, completely different direction. And he looks like he has seen this position before, which is already yeah. a better sign than. Yeah, he hasn't spent much time at all. Um, I mean, only a few minutes, and we already made uh, nine <laughs> moves. So we're following some games here. Uh, in fact, Report versus Zaragatsky from 10 years ago is after 9d4. Yes, and we have to bring this up. Uh, mm -hmm. Richard Report is uh, Ding Liren's second here, mm -hmm. um, heavily influencing not only his musical tastes, mm -hmm. but also his uh, openings, it seems. Uh, ev everyone thought H3 in game one was, th I mean, game two was the stamp of Richard. Mm -hmm. And um, here he is copying uh, Richard's openings again. Um. Well, we're going to look up some of these games. Vishy, maybe you can talk about this position for a mm -hmm. second while I look up some So games what can in black do? Black can play F5, maybe? Just to continue his plan. Or black can play queen f6. Sorry, after d4, black can play queen f6. Trying to get knight f4 in. So a couple of ideas here for black. I don't know which one will happen. OK, so Nepo, has he just made a move? No, he's still thinking. Yes. OK, so d4, you've been thinking about queen f6. It's one idea, because uh, g3 does feel strange. I'll, if I go bishop, um, can I take the pawn? Oh, 
Okay, Richard, but you know, I see that there's been hardly any games in this line, like mm. very, very few. And yes, I mean, Richard Report was on the white side of this once in his life 10 years ago after 9D4. And we have some other quite decent players. Actually, I believe this is your second, uh, Gajewski, mm -hmm. right? Was on the white side of this in 2021 at the European Championships. Um, let's see what has been chosen as some moves for black. So we see Knight of Four has been played here. Pawn takes pawn has been played. We have F5 chosen by Alex Yermolinsky. And another F5. And basically it's it. So <clears throat> I've been able to find like four games. Um, in this line, we can see if there's some even more recent games. But meanwhile, let's start talking about some of these moves that have, um, have been seen here before. So we have f5, knight f4, and pawn takes pawn. That's Everything it. except queen f6. Which yeah, is but what I was okay, let's, you know let's what, see. let's talk about queen f6, actually. So the idea of this move is like you want to put the knight here and be able to capture with the queen. He's just gone knight f4. Has he? Okay, so. So he is familiar with this. And I mean, I don't know why I said that. Uh, of course he is, right? He's prepared this for his <laughs> line against the thing. He must have cleaned up, tied up uh, all the loose ends. But anyway, uh, bishop f4. Mm -hmm. If bishop takes f4, e takes f4, and I go, let's say, queen d2, what are you going to do? Queen f6. Because I was hoping to make g3 work, but then I realized you have queen f6. Uh, g3 just rook e8, counterattacking the pawn on e4. Oh, g3 rook e8, yeah. Yes. yeah we have a problem with this pawn. Yeah, and I, I think this is still the game uh, that Rapport's played. So knight f4, Rapport took on f4, and he played the move h4 afterwards. So let's just take a look. He captured the knight and then played h4. This is nice for two yeah. reasons. One is it stops um, black playing g5 ever, mm -hmm. not right away thing, but maybe also it stops knight e7, g6 as a plan because you're going to kick the knight again. Yeah, very. I mean, it's an interesting move. Let's. Um, it did, okay, Ding took very quickly on f4, so he clearly familiar with this. But on top of that, uh, it's probably just the only yeah, move, right? Yeah, it's the only because, move. Uh, yeah. I mean, bishop f1 isn't serious, so. Sure, and I guess if this is your preparation and the knight's on h5 and your pawn's going to d4, I mean, you could predict that knight f4 is one of the moves that you need to consider. So he took on f4 and. And then this move h4. So we're going to see, is he going to follow completely in his second's footsteps here, or is there another idea that has been worked out? Um, well, let's talk about h4. I mean, h4, on one hand, it sort of brings to mind the question of where this king is going to castle. I mean, do you see, I mean, do you see any possibility, Vishy, for this king going queenside in these positions? It could go c1. It could go to d2. It could go to f1. I mean, there's hardly any danger for white in f1. Mm. Um, but h5 gives you the option maybe somewhere to attack rook h4. So uh, you that's more this. significant than, yes, than mm -hmm. anything else. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, again, I find this position like quite fascinating. You know, very unusual pawn structure to start the game with. Um, already a big imbalance. I mean, black has doubled pawns. White has double pawns. White's got the bigger center. Mm -hmm. Already a couple of pieces have been traded. So this is not like this is definitely not like a typical middle game. No, this is quite unusual because of the paucity of games. Uh, this is unexplored territory, and mm -hmm. uh, um, even castles followed by knight e one d three. There are so many interesting plans. Uh, very few of them will work in the end, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm sure there's a good plan for white. Okay, let's take a look at just the standard move castles and see what could make sense here for black. I mean, in general, you would think, I mean, does the pawn structure favor white because of their extra center pawn? Um, so where, where is black's counterplay coming from? Is black interested, for example, in challenging that pawn with f5? Normally, yes, but I think bishop d3, uh, mm -hmm. if you play f5. Mm -hmm. I would say bishop d3 is a fairly nice response for white, assuming mm. you take, I take, I think this is very desirable for white. Mm -hmm. So that must be a factor. So let's explain to the audience why this is mm -hmm. desirable for white. I mean, basically, you're getting this free attack on the h7 pawn. And you're You'd feeling... you probably take the e-file. Yeah, the e-file is going to be a big factor. You feel like this knight's not that great. Um, yeah, and it's kind of hard to neutralize this powerful bishop because you don't have bishop f5. 
right? So this is why f5 immediately and after bishop d3, um, well, okay, let me just, yeah, make a couple of moves here. But I mean, I understand you're basically going to be going like rook e1 in this position. Rook e1, for instance, threatens e5. Also, I could play c5. Mm -hmm. By the way, he castled. Okay. He castled. So he no decided not to follow Richard's move h4. And let's just see where we are right here, castles. And we're trying to figure out what black would like to do here. So we're looking at f5. Um, well, I mean, there's ideas like this, right? Um, suppose you can try to use your extra pawn on the king side and do something super aggressive like that. I don't know if there's like much of an attack, though. No, g5 is um, it's a good move. It uh, come at all, but um, mm -hmm. what should white do? Maybe knight e1 and try to play g3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. So like just conceptually, the plans for each side, right? What, what, I mean, what do, you, what do you think they are? <laughs> I mean, for white, is white going to try to challenge this pawn, try to make that pawn into a target? Does white want to trade it with moves like g3? I would think so, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, if I can play g3 and kind of may force you to decide mm -hmm. um, that you don't want to play g5 and defend it mm -hmm. um, and keep the double pawn, um, then g3 could be a plan. Yes, and uh, basically white wants to kind of use the power of the strong center in this position, right? It's just the fact that it's pretty hard for black to get big counterplay. You know, let's say this knight is very restricted. Um, but okay. One idea mm -hmm. could be that white plays c5. Uh-huh, so c5, that and if I take then d5, d5 uh -huh. and c4, and maybe if you can't stop e5, it could yes. be something. Interesting. Perhaps white has to prepare it a bit, but... Mm -hmm. um, uh, and doubling these pawns is very crucial because, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in theory, the double C pawns are a liability towards the end of the game. But quite often, for white, C5 generates a lot of play and activity mm -hmm. for that pawn. So that could be something uh, we'll have to keep an eye on in every move. And I, I suppose like another really solid move is bishop g4. Mm. He's gone queen f6, though. OK, queen f6 on the board. All right, so what does that move tell us? I mean, I think it tells us that there is some possibility of us seeing a g5 in this game. Mm -hmm. um, what else? I mean, this, the queen's probably going to stay there. I suppose at some point it can also maybe find itself on h6. It's not so bad there. It supports this pawn, um, has a look at the king side. And OK, mm. so now let's try to generate some ideas for white fishing. So the thing with bishop d3 is that we run into bishop g4, right? Yes. Yeah, that's kind of a bit also of perhaps g4, g5. And g5 even. Well, uh, just, let's just rule it out, right? g5. Oh, interesting. So we can uh, comment on Anish Giri's um, statement that Jan has clearly mixed up the prep. What do you think, Vishy? I wouldn't uh, argue with Anisha's insight uh, into Jan. Mm -hmm. Though I must say, if Jan mixed up the prep, he mixed it up confident in the belief he was not mixing it up. Mm -hmm. He looked like queen f6 was the most obvious move on the board. Mm -hmm. But more to the point, I don't see what's wrong with it for black. Right. Um, it seems to me that, I mean, the plans I mentioned are there, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't see how to execute them cleanly. So. It's not what exactly is White's plan exactly then? Is he going to try to get the knight to d5, also through which square? Or um, yeah. By the way, for now, this move also stops like all these c5 ideas. Yes. Right, because totally. now you could just take, and then your knight would have this square. So obviously, yeah. there's no point for White to give up a pawn like that. I mean, yeah, I don't know what he means exactly. Which point he <laughs> mixed up the prep? I mean, um, you know, that that would also be assuming that this position is somehow bad for black, which is not clear. I, I don't uh, see that uh, myself. Um, but maybe there's a very specific line for black. And um, OK, so queen f6 and these types of ideas are definitely in the cards. And the queen is supporting the pawn. So g3, it's very hard to get rid of the f4 pawn, isn't it? 
Correct. OK, let's try this. Um, I mean, should we be repositioning this knight like that? That looks like a very good plan to try and He's gone rook f1. A rook f1, OK. So he's going for bishop d3 and e5. I think mm -hmm, that's clear. Mm -hmm. OK, so I really want to see this. Let's try g5 now. G5, OK. So you're not interested in this trade at all, yeah? Like you don't think positionally it makes some for sense? For me, it's hard because when I play rook a b1, you're going to end up playing b6. Mm -hmm, yeah. Sooner or later. Yeah, let's say I do it. And then when I go, uh, I can play e5 as a tactic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't get rid of your knight. Or I could play h3 first and mm -hmm. then e5. I don't know. It feels messy to me. Uh, I could throw in h3. Yeah. Uh, I could throw in h3. Bishop h5. Or. Mm -hmm. And then throw in queen a4. Mm. And then when you do this, then I've, uh, then I've gotten to where I want, which is e5. Mm -hmm. um, well, let, me, let me just try a little something here. So when you played h3, could I go for this. I'm just kind of interested mm -hmm. in the strategic evaluation of this position. So I have a knight, you have a bishop. I've neutralized this threat for now. How, how bad of a position is this for black? Queen a4. Let me try mm -hmm. that. Queen a4, and I have to go knight a5. And you're going to go c5. Mm -hmm. c5. So then if you don't take, I don't know what hangs. exactly is uh, it. That is true, oh, yeah, but B5. I'm going to go e5. Yeah, B5. Mm. And maybe rook b1, something like that. It's interesting, although I still i am not convinced that we're doing so badly, but you want to play d5 next. You just want those big center pawns, right? Like queen e7, d5? Yes, and uh, then I'm my queen is keeping mm. an eye on the f4 pawn indirectly. Yes. Um, some high, well, here's the thing. You've managed to open up the game you know, for the bishop yes. here. But let's see if there's some other way to do this. I could do, instead of queen a4, I could go, ah, sorry, this is a bishop yeah, h5, so so bishop mm -hmm. f3, bishop f3. Hang on a second, bishop, rook a1, b1, b6. Mm -hmm. If I go e5, you take, if I take, you have the chance to do this first, mm -hmm. which means my pawn structure I have is queen getting g5 blown here. away. Yes, queen g5 or queen, yeah, queen g5. No, he's not gone bishop d3, sorry. Nope, oh, rook f1 is on the board. Yes. You want to find it? Uh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So bishop g4, we've been looking at. Yes. Mm -hmm. Also, could I throw in queen a4? Then you're, you're not able to disentangle that. Mm. So you want to play rook a b1 without me being able to play b6 so easily. And if my knight moves, you keep having these these e5 ideas. Hmm. Well, OK, but let's still kind of examine. I'm just curious. I'm thinking how to do this. So basically, if this knight moves, like how, how big of a deal is e5? As much of a deal as you're going to get, I think, e5. Yeah. Uh, if you take knight e5, I think it's very pleasant as a pet Because you also got, yeah, uh huh, you also got this. You got, in a sense, a pawn majority because the spawn, these pawns can yeah. still move, whereas f4 is stuck. So if I, oh, sorry, if I trade with you, or should I trade with you? Or should I just do that move that I was accidentally doing? But if I trade with you, do you have knight d7? Probably not. Knight d7, right? queen g5, yeah. no, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So you got to take. Mm -hmm. And but so you're saying, nice, yeah, yeah, you're saying this resembles a Petrov. That is Gone just nice bad. for white. Yes. Yeah, you got this. You've got the e file. I've got the double pawns. Yeah, I see. So this is basically white's dream in these positions to get this e5 moving. Okay. Um, so bishop g4, queen a4. So I need to figure out what I'm doing on this move. And basically, your next move is rook a b1, right? Yes. But I've stopped you playing b6. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, should I now go bishop d7? Because I can say that like bis my bishop came from c8, where it was completely undeveloped. Now I got to go here, and I'm going to say that maybe your queen on a4 is not perfect. If I return, kind of guard my knight, have some discoveries, and maybe I'll have that move. 
Yes, uh, rook a b1. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just go b6, and again, what am I proving? Yeah, for now, I don't really I have, have any discoveries. Um, but yeah, but b6 for now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I got my bishop to d7. That's mm -hmm. somewhat useful. Want to play yeah, rook f8? It's interesting that uh, Anish feels that the implication of what he said was that white must be already better. Mm -hmm. So. At least we have an evaluation target. Let's see if we can understand what's going on. Yeah, so, okay, let's see. So there's bishop g4, and but there's another move you wanted to try here, right? g5. Yes, I want to, but then h3, h5, knight h2 is the problem, right? So mm. after h3, I'm not quite getting this. h5 and knight h2. And, and queen g6, queen d1, and yeah, it's not working. Ah, okay, so you're really getting to this pawn before I'm prepared to do anything. I can't push, and I can't really protect the pawn. That is definitely not, not the point. By the way, if this happened, would you play bishop g4 or do you like that move? Yes, I might also delay it. But go bishop h5 first, kick you, see where you're going. Mm -hmm. In general, we wouldn't mind that trade. I mean, if I'm going to play h4, I would not touch my g pawn in the first sure, place. Sure, sure, <laughs> so, sure, sure. Um, um, so basically, you're saying that g5, just h3. And I guess black is it's not getting anywhere with their attack yet. So maybe black, and you have to, of course, have to be very careful with moves like that, because then when the center starts to open up, you're going to start to mm -hmm. regret those pawn moves. So sure. you either make it work or, or don't do it. Um, so h5, knight h2, yeah, things seemed pretty straightforward here that it just doesn't work. No, that's mm -hmm. right. It's, uh, what else can we do? Maybe then black is just a bit uh, uncomfortable. So then let's try bishop g4. I think it's really the key to, because you want to keep that option. Mm -hmm. If I went h3, you were taking and doing, uh, no, we didn't have h3. Here. We, we didn't look at h3. Because we kind of assumed that, yeah, I was going to take. Wait, 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 did we look at h3? No, not in this position. Here we are. Oh. We did have oh, it. Oh, we did yes. have it? OK. Or we had it a move later, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think if you take, I take. Now, it is a bit of a nightmare that you can, you're always stuck with this uh, So I got to get, I gotta get the rook out yeah. of the diagonal. Mm -hmm. So we start with that. And that's basically what we looked at, right? We looked at something very similar, like rook a, b1, yes. b6, queen a4, target the knight. And when he goes to a5, this is when you were suggesting this Wait one. a minute. I just go back mm -hmm. a second. If I skip and I do that, mm -hmm. if you take, then after this, you're forced to go all the way here. Yeah. And this must be a nicer version for me. I do that. Kick the knight. Kick the knight. Then go d5. Either take it or d5, mm. both of which look pretty nice. So basically, you're saying like if you take it, you're getting your pawn back. Plus, I might play rook b4, rook mm -hmm. takes f4 somewhere maybe. And I mean, Also, well, uh, sorry, instead of d takes c5, queen d7 suddenly looks nice also. Queen d7 attacking this pawn. This queen is quite decentralized. You could go queen e6. I go queen takes d6, uh, c7, rook yeah. e7. You said queen e6? Yes. Mm -hmm. queen, queen takes c7. Seven. Queen c7, rook e7. Mm -hmm. Queen d6 forced. Mm -hmm. And then you can take and play something. <laughs> I don't know what. Mm. You can take on e1, uh, Maybe take on d4. Right here. Yeah, because if you take on e1, you can't mm -hmm. take on d4 because I have d7 mm -hmm. in between. But now I take on c5, this must be winning. Yeah. Or much better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, of course, white. Rook b5 takes c5. Yeah, it's white's in nice. the driver's seat here, but. All right, we are going to see a move from Nepo, and I think he played rook, rook e8. e8. Okay, so let's go find that moment. And he's just gone rook eight. So he's waiting mm -hmm. without um, letting white easily achieve mm -hmm. e5. Not a bad, not a bad idea. But 
Okay, that means that like maybe some, some of these ideas are less pertinent now for mm. black, right? Because then you're like leaving this rook on right. the diagonal. Also, should I start with rook ab1 here? Okay, so he plays rook f8. Does he have any specific ideas with this move? I mean, there's no like queen g6. It's not really a big problem, is it? If I go what? I'm just saying, like, are there any specific ideas of this move? It seems to be just that he's holding the white pawn mass mm -hmm. in its place a bit. Right, making it a little harder to go e5, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think in any of these positions white would like to throw in h3 just to stop bishop g4? I was thinking of that, but queen g6 might force me to sack something. Mm -hmm. I'm threatening bishop takes h3. Yep. No, then again, king, uh, queen g6, I just go king h2, and you're not really, can't play queen e4, mm -hmm. so you have to play rook e4 or something, and that's not good for you at all. Well, bishop d3 wins, uh, you just. Uh, and if I play f5 there? I mean, like, we're looking at this yeah. h3 here, king h2. Now you can't take the pawn with the queen because of this beautiful. Battery. Yeah. This, this you can kind of take on e4 with the rook. Mm hmm. But knight h4 wins something, yeah. Knight h4. Oh, knight h4. Yeah, so. And d5 as well. So. Or queen e6, bishop g4 as well. So. Yeah. Though, maybe rook, rook e1, a1. Yeah, actually, here there could be this, right? But anyway, I had bishop d3. Mm -hmm. In th yeah, here bishop d3. Bishop d3, rook d3 takes and I was. E1. Uh -huh. I could take on uh, g6. But even if I played rook e1, you're forced to play f5, which is one of the worst moves you can make. Uh -huh. Because I'm threatening the back rank mate, and you'll have to play f5, and this must be horrible. So black is still up a pawn, but you're thinking this is just really bad. Yes. I think c5 or d5 is very strong here. OK, pick one of those. OK, let's start with c5. <laughs> OK, I'm just so trying that to. I have a queen b3 somewhere. Uh huh. Uh huh. You got, you're coming around to my weak king, huh? But I think uh, bishop takes g6 must have been winning. Yeah. Okay. That two with the rook on e1. So h3 has some interesting like prophylactic value. I thought your idea position. was h3, queen f, g6, king h2, mm -hmm. f5. But I think even that here, bishop d3 should just be pleasant. I mean, it actually should be very strong. Yes, this is, of course, the dream that we're going for. Um, OK, so h3 is interesting. And yeah, no, I actually, I mean, I like it if it works, right? If it works, it seems like an, a useful move to get in, because even against g5 ideas, it's quite nice to have that. Yes. So you're basically saying, OK, so now that you can't put your bishop here, what are you going to do? Right, so that's why this line that we were looking at, it's quite relevant, you know, black's attempts to win this pawn. Only more to eliminate it as a possibility. Rather yeah, than well, we've got to just make sure that we're definitely winning here. So we like bishop d3 here, right, Vishim? Mm -hmm. And then there's rook takes e1. Bishop takes g6. And yeah, and we were saying this is nice, but you're saying also we can try this to get. This must be winning is kind of my. Yeah. And now how do I go about it? Bishop at 7 check looks like a good place. Yeah, you don't really need to go into this stuff, do you? It might win, it might not. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go here. And king f8. King f8, yeah. So why is white winning? Because um, I'm going to trap your queen b2 and it's game over. Wow. That's poor rook. Yeah. I mean, actually, i got to show that this is actually very nice. Right? I mean, because it almost feels like the queen is cut off. And yet everything is still harmonious. Yeah. Like you don't have any of these. Oh wait, rook one e1, second. Rook, rook f1. Rook f1. Bishop d3. Bishop d3. Okay, then you're gonna bishop do it for more harmonious. And then, yeah. <laughs> then I really nailed it. Yeah, that's very nice. Yeah. Okay. So h3 seems to be possible. It doesn't seem to be a blunder of a pawn. So queen mm -hmm. g6 and just king h2. And then if you can't take this pawn, what can you do? I mean, actually, I'm just threatening to go bishop d3. Very simple, right? Mm -hmm. But then I could go queen h5 and threaten bishop g4 or something. So. Mm -hmm. OK, so do you think that we should try to find another move than queen g6 for black? Or 
Or is that kind of the main response? Yeah. I mean, let's say they just play bishop d7, right? We can also just do nothing and develop for black. Yes. How is this going to play out? Bishop d3? And c5? C5 is what it's like. It's like a big idea. I mean, somewhere I can do this move, right? You yes. take, I play E5. I mean, maybe it doesn't work just yet. Right? If I go here. I think, well, let's bite the bullet, take it. Take it, and then, you e5, know, E5. Queen and H6 or whatever. Queen H6, right? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't push because I lose that pawn. And but you can go something like bishop, bishop c4. c4 yeah, I have some compensation here. Yes. But I have moves like knight a5. Yeah. Say. Not Black feels under a lot of pressure, but it's actually very hard to crack mm -hmm. the position. Well, we don't have to sack the pawn just yet. Let's mm -hmm. go bishop d3. That seems to be where the bishop wants to be. And if I play h6, you can do c5 and e5 now because mm -hmm. I've taken away that square mm -hmm. for myself. Yeah, you don't want to do that move. So bishop d3. Um, do you want to move your queen away somewhere? Or I might throw in b6 now. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, b6 so that. Just so that c5 I can, can capture the b pawn. Yeah. And though we still need to check mm -hmm. uh, bishop b5 after that. It's kind of like. So basically, in this position, this is really the main idea for white. Like one of these two pushes with the pawns. Yes, and also after rook f e one, the g three plans are not looking so likely. Yeah, uh, that's right. So that plan is kind of shut off, and um, even maneuvering the knight round doesn't look so easy. So I think uh, once we are here, then it's really about making e five work. Even maybe rook e two and rook e one and e five or something. Yeah, because I mean, but th the thing this is, is already pointless. Now, once black no. has consolidated a bit and played b6, even mm -hmm. that uh, black has a double pawn and a uh, double f pawn, so he mm -hmm. doesn't have an extra pawn there, but white has double c pawn, so it's also <laughs> not a complete extra pawn in terms of, um, it's not like it's on b2. So um, we'll have to weigh the balance here. Yeah, I mean, black basically can even just go rook e7 and rook a8 next. Yes, it looks quite tortured, but wha what, how is white going to take advantage mm -hmm. of it, right? Yeah, but no, because I was thinking of white and trying to double up the rooks mm. here, but you know, if you start I must that, admit that by yeah. now, for me, rookie two, rookie one versus rookie seven, rookie eight in this position seems like uh, way past anything that I knew about this position. Uh -huh. uh, kind of we are getting here, but I don't think that's how you You don't think that's how, how we're going to see things develop? Right. OK. OK, so. But rookie eight, he has played. Uh, and and we got rook f8, rook e8 on the board. And so we're wondering whether white should throw in this h3 move or, or not. You know, you can say, OK, h3 is a tempo. It costs us a tempo. So maybe we can try to do without that move. And basically, OK, so if we try this c5 here, you take and e5. Then you go queen h6, right? Yes. So can we do something here? I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe here the move h3 we really don't need. So how about bishop b5, Bishy? There we go. OK, let me try You're to go ahead with bishop e6. Yeah, I would say, also, don't you have like even that? Yes, it's true, a6 as well, because yeah. bishop takes, queen takes, mm -hmm. obviously. Yes. Otherwise, I get b5 and so on. Yeah. So maybe not, maybe not bishop b5. Then you have bishop g4 coming, right, if I move my bishop. And do you feel like we're on the right track? We're trying to do this pawn sack, or? Uh, I'm not too familiar with the thing, but I mean, I'm going to keep drawing, work my way from some nimzo and <laughs> try to grasp it. But the pawn in f4, I'm. It's not at all common in the Nimzo, so mm -hmm. it's quite unusual detail here. Oh, yeah. Well, normally this position would be with a pawn on, e, uh, on e5, right? Yes. And uh, like white, let's say, having some sort of bishop pair. Here, white doesn't have any advantage of bishop pair. White has uh, some kind of advantage of pawn structure, but it's not um, so easy to take advantage of it. So 
Um, I guess the reason we keep looking at these pawn moves is because white has a light squared bishop, so these pawn moves do um, tend to open up that bishop, right? And right. It's, the only, it's the only pawn that you can move in this position. You obviously never want to push that pawn. So um, yeah, that is why we're trying to make this, this e5 move work. So you're quite limited in like your uh, areas of battle here, right, Vishy? Yeah. I mean, it's like it's basically the center. The very few plans I can come up with. C5, mm -hmm. E5 is the only plans, and um, um, before or after or including Rook AB1, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, I can't. In fact, I just know the plans I can make up. Well, well, we'll let Ding uh, think of a plan right now, and we're gonna go on our first break, guys. Yeah. Um, let's listen to the video that we've got planned for you. It's Leongsto Garcia, journalist from El País. Working for World Championship matches since 1985, uh, perhaps you are the most experienced chess journalist. What is the World Championship match for you? Well, it's something very extraordinary because in general, in sports in general, not only in chess, when we are talking about one person against one person, and that one person is all every day the same, the same opponent, this is very extraordinary because it, this is much more than a sport, simple sport. Psychology is extremely important and so on. So that gives a special flavor to every match for the World Championship. And I think FIDE should do as much as possible to preserve this format. I mean, the big pyramid, you climb the pyramid that you become the challenger and then you play the champion. The champion is like the king waiting for the challenger to, to get there, right? Let's talk about ongoing world championship match between Yane Pomnishi and Ding Liren. What is your forecast for this match? I'm worried about Ding. Uh, his emotional system is broken. And then the big question now will he be able to recover? My answer is if he's able to survive the next two games, game number three and four, then he has a still chances. Because I think that although Niepo is an extremely strong player, of course, but if I have to choose, I think that Ding's understanding of chess is a bit deeper than Niepo. And he has a more universal style. He is able to play very well different kinds of positions. But he has to be at his best. Otherwise, he is going to lose for sure, of course, because Niepo is not only extremely strong, now he has a huge experience because he has learned a lot uh, from the match against Magnus Carlsen. Uh, you know, like in this Kung Fu Panda cartoon, yeah, like there is no secret ingredient in my soup, yeah, so I tried like, yeah, not to put in uh, any secret ingredients. So that's probably the only, the only trick. When I was a small kid, I was studying Kalechin's games, first of all, the first ever Russian world champion. Yeah, I haven't played for half a year and yeah, I think just not playing too much, yeah, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good way to get hungry. I think previously when computers were not so strong, yeah, it was really important like you have like so many guys who can work simultaneously. But now yeah, I think you, if you have more or less nice engine, you get the result, like you hit the space bar and you get the result. Like the amount of work uh, one, one player one can, can do is, is tremendously bigger than before. And yeah, okay, I have my, my own experience, uh, quite, quite a bitter one, but yeah, it's still an experience, so maybe that's a little bit like something which, which probably favors me. 
I can only praise him like, yeah, he's very, very, I know, he's very consistent. Yeah, he's capable of like playing almost as good as an engine. Yeah, and I think uh, pretty much as, as well as Magnus, he doesn't have like obvious like weak points in his, in his play. He's absolutely brilliant chess player. So it goes just without saying. And yeah, I'll pro probably, probably if, I, if I'll be lucky to find some, you know, weaker spots in, you know, in his armor, then, then, the, then would be fine. If not, then okay, I'll fight, you know, as it is. <laughs>
Hello everyone and welcome back to our coverage of the fourth game of the 2023 World Chess Championship match. Uh, this is a great time to tune in because we've had an unorthodox opening Vichy that probably saw an imprecision from Nepo that could have allowed Ding to have a better position. Why don't you walk us through the critical moments up to this point? Sure. So um, going back up here, it seems that Queen of Six is really the move that you want to play, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Knight F. But Jan actually charged in with Knight F4. And this is probably what Anish meant when he said that Jan was misremembering his preparation. So he probably remembered a Queen in F6, and the Queen does indeed go to F6 uh, quite soon in this game. But he mixed up the move order, and he put the Knight first, allowing the straight and getting the doubled F pawns. But also it's a question, what exactly caused Jan to reject it? Let's see, queen f6, if I go g3, mm -hmm. uh, I'm able to play e takes d4, as far as I can tell. Ah, because you're also attacking the d4 Correct. pawn. So... Um, oh, maybe we can show that... that uh, and if you take... Rook and a1 is going to hang. Yeah. Yes. Let's knight take. takes d4, knight takes d4, mm -hmm. and queen takes d4, bishop b2, and queen because c5. the queen was attacking the rook. But luckily, I have this square where mm -hmm. upon I protect the knight. Mm -hmm. And that saves it. Uh, g3, ed4, um, some move like bishop g5. I would go queen f6. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't see how to make this work. Once again, if I capture CD. here, you capture with the ah, knight. Okay. You capture, and now I take that bishop, which was slightly mm -hmm. loose there. So. Uh, queen f6, and if uh, white defends this pawn in the usual way, then knight f4. White could play d5, because yeah. the black knight misses its most useful square, mm. because I have bishop g5. Um, winning the knight. Winning the knight, which should be good even if there's some queen g6, knight f4. I mean, even with some possibility here, I don't believe it. But mm -hmm. uh, more relevant is that I simply go back to b8. Admittedly, yeah. not my first choice. But now my knight has a lovely square coming here. Yeah. So white could play g3 there, because the obvious move to f help the knight loses the piece. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, I could play g6 or queen e7, and then go back with this knight. Though I've lost some time, white is, I forced white to commit here. So um, interesting that Jan actually um, Went for this choice. Did he forget it? Did mm -hmm. he know it? I don't know. But this is quite committal as it goes because now it, the character of the game is kind of defined. White has these two breaks to work with, c5 and um, e5. Or in fact, as Ding is going even more slowly. There was one more critical moment. Um, sorry. Yeah, after white castles. Yes. Queen f6. No, not here. Rook f1. <coughs> Rook e8. And now. Your suggestion of h3 is excellent, because it turns out that bishop really wants to be there. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was well worth delaying it by a move. And um, uh, after what Jan did, which is 13 bishop d3, and I'll promote that. Yes, Ding, Ding kind of hurried with this move. He didn't take the time to stop bishop g4. And actually, Jan uh, got to develop his bishop, forcing back the, the white knight. And you know what's sad? Vichy is that that knight on f3 was helping prepare these e5 breaks, mm. right? So now that it moves back to, to d2, it's a, little bit, you know, it's a little bit more passive. And uh, the current position is with Jan going knight to a5. Yes, and that um, initially wasn't the move I was expecting. White can uh, strengthen his pawn structure by playing knight b3. Um, And if I <coughs> took it, you take with a pawn, and then uh, black could play a5. You might go b4, these typical things. The question is, does white, oh, sorry, here there's a d4 pawn hanging at the end, so you might not want to do this. But um, um, the question is, does white want to commit? Because now we only got a pair of minor pieces, a pair of bishops each. And maybe white, even if his pawn structure is fine, he doesn't have the extra minor piece he would need to be able to make some progress. Yeah. Um, alternately, some version of the old queen a4 plan, or even c5 again, if dc5, mm -hmm. e5. I must say, though, that uh, c5 
it is possible to respond with D6. Mm, I'd simply exactly. take, take. It's not the end of the world. I mean, white, uh, if I do this, mm -hmm. then this pawn is also, gonna, you're going to have to keep an eye on it. So, um, in theory, nothing wrong with knight D2, but it's missing obvious routes to get to somewhere mm -hmm. useful. It's missing the uh, one plan that it would have because of that F4 pawn, which mm -hmm. so may not be a, a bad thing after all. Um, what is White's plan going forward? I don't see it. He doesn't. Uh, perhaps it's e5 somewhere. And bishop takes that 7 check. But again, feels like a lot of simplification that you don't need. Yeah, I mean, the problem with this is that you're giving up a center pawn in order to get a side pawn. So after bishop h7, I suppose even just king h8. Also, let's just do mm -hmm. that with h3 thrown in because uh, after knight d2, knight d5, I could go h3. Mm -hmm. And if you went back to d7, I could simply come back to f3. So you ah, are now yes. committed to staying on h5. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of a great point that this knight would love to get back here with the inclusion of that pawn move to h3. Yes. Oh, wait. Mm -hmm. now, now let's see. So you went, I, you went knight a5, I get h3. You play mm -hmm. bishop h5. Mm -hmm. And now let me play rook b1. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see you have a sneaky threat. Unfortunately, you're going to play b6, and uh, if rook b5, you're going to play c5, and I, I've gotten nowhere with this. Oh, okay, c5. <coughs> Black kind of fighting back for space. Um, yeah, this rook is feeling a little bit shut out of the action after this move, and I mean, again, this doesn't seem to really get white anywhere, right? No, I mean, because the white pawns on the queen side are yeah. awful. So even and if you win two or three, yeah. you're just, they're the worst pawns you can have. So, but not rook, uh, perhaps not uh, in that way. So bishop mm -hmm. h5, yeah. there might be some great shot here, like uh, c5, d5, mm -hmm. e5, and, and force your queen to h6. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't see a knockout blow in general. Um, because yeah. Black's position is resilient. He'll put the pawn on b6 and the rook on d8, and you know, it's not that bad, really. Yeah, we know that this c5 pawn sacrifice is a really major idea in this position. Let's see if we can find any compensation here for white. Mm. I mean, white and also has to be kind of careful I'll, I'll about again this move. Yeah. You may not need to take on c5. You could play b6. Mm -hmm. You're saying, OK, like if I play here, you could just ignore me and go right. b6. Um, one plan here for me is I could take on d6. Mm -hmm. You take, I go knight c4. Mm -hmm. And if you take, then I take with the bishop. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'll put it on d5. When your bishop is stuck on h5, it mm. can no longer come to e6 or f7 to challenge. I don't know uh, how much Well, this it actually is, looks it's, it's kind of nice. It's a plan. Yes, right, yeah. it, it does look quite nice because I think here we, we are seeing a clear superiority of the minor piece. Um, and in these positions, just so we go over it, like on f3, which is some, something that white always needs to watch out for, I guess we're just going to be going g3. Quite and yeah. yeah, you don't want to go crazy with g4. I mean, um, that would be. Bishop g4 or something yeah. might be just very. Or queen h4, yeah. Yeah, you don't want any piece of that. So g3, and then your king can always guard. And then now my rook has H3. got a square on e3, which is going to be very pleasant. Mm. So. Unless, you know, shouldn't play f3 unless it's needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take a look again at this pawn sacrifice. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in this position, white's got to play quite actively, right? There's... One other plan mm -hmm. is h3, bishop h5, bishop e2, but I can't believe... Oh, he's gone c5. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so but he, has he, he hasn't bothered with the formality of h3, yes, bishop h5. Yes, he has not so bothered with throwing that in. So he has gone c5, and that definitely is starting to spice up the game. First, let's rule out uh, that b6 is nothing special. OK. So let's just throw in b6. Just slows everything down so that. Yeah. yeah. So we're basically going to be taking on d6. You take, and you just. Do you see anything other than taking? Ah, uh, then taking on d6. I could play h3 here. Yeah, you could throw that move in. Um, and then the bishop has a choice, yeah? He no longer necessarily. I don't think he has a choice, because if he goes bishop h5, mm -hmm. Maybe c6 works. Aha. Uh -huh. OK. If you take with the knight, I have bishop b5. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take, I'll play d5, even though I give you the e5 square, but your knight is gone forever. Yes. And I don't know. I'll have to evaluate that trade off, but uh, it might be good for me. So basically. Also, uh, later on, mm -hmm. when I trade knights, you'll be forced to trade on my terms, and this pawn is quite far advanced or what have you. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I feel like if we get to play that move and 
take that amount of space with this knight cut off on the queen side. Uh, that must so be So I have great. to say, you know, rook e5 is there, and then there's going to be some attacks to face. So yeah. it's... Um, but still, you'll be attacking that. without a knight. So we yes. got to put some faith in White's position. Right. Um, yeah, there's a very cool trick here with this pawn move issue because yeah, after that, there is no way to save yourself from that. Oh, by pin. the way, I didn't even... Oh, I, I needed it because if I do it with the bishop on g4... Mm -hmm. Then the bishop will go to d7. Yes, but well, I, I'll just show you that. c6, mm -hmm. and knight c6, mm -hmm. bishop b5, mm -hmm. bishop uh, d7, mm -hmm. threatening knight b8. So mm -hmm. I go queen a4. And of course, you see the problem in six. A six, yeah. Yes, and then uh, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. If bishop takes c six, I have b five, and the queen and bishop can no longer support each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what you're saying is that on b six, the move h three is a real possibility for white. To I mean, I wish in. he had done it <laughs> before mm -hmm. c five, but. By the way, I think he just took he the just pawn. He just took it, taken on yeah. c five. Okay. These so. Um, Subtleties of not taking the pawn are not going to be coming up in this game. And Nepo isn't going to bother with all that. He's just saying, show me, hit me with your e5, d5. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the game is developing in a very kind this of is aggressive we could have way, asked for right? More, yeah. yeah, yeah, you can feel that. Like, you know, the players are kind of going after each other here. And c5 uh, in these kind of double Nimso structures is very much a birthday boy move. Mm -hmm. uh, birthday boy has made uh, oh, yes. c5 sacks on many, yeah. many occasions, so yes. it's uh, very much in his honor. <laughs> right, I mean, I feel like we've got a couple of things going on today, which is that it's Gary's 60th birthday, you know, so that should be kind of inspiring the players to give him a birthday gift in, um, with a great game. And it's also actually our final day of commentary here together, Vishy. So, um, you know, it would be great, I think, for you to leave after, you know, a decisive game in Asana. Yes, uh, I think uh, a great game today uh, would set it, ni set it up nicely. Even a fascinating game, even without a decisive result, I think is increasing the temperature, so to speak, in the match. Yeah. But uh, of course, a win would be fantastic. Yeah, uh, okay, so. So E5 has happened, and now. Ding is, uh, he is going is to head going six. H6. I think it would have been mm -hmm. strange to trade, uh, Yeah. go to D8 or something, so that. So we now we got. going to H4 as well, but H6 is better because. It looks more natural, yeah. I mean, when I kick you later with knight of three, you don't want to waste more time, mm -hmm. so. Okay. How do we go forward now? Oh, well, first of all, we do have these d5 ideas because there's not a lot of pressure on the e-pawn. But d5, I could go, uh, yes, d5 does seem to be asking to be played. But if can I go c4? Mm -hmm. Let's try to figure out why you want to give away that pawn, I guess. Okay, this this if I took the pawn, it helps you get rid of your knight that's on the side of the board. That and is an incentive. Mm -hmm. And then I want to, f after knight c4, knight c4, mm -hmm. bishop c4, I want to play queen g5. Right. And harass the pawn a bit. I don't know if yeah. it, maybe, maybe asking for e6 is not a good thing for me. Mm. But e6, I might play bishop f3 somewhere. d6, f6, bishop f3. Mm -hmm. So okay, let me, let me figure out what all the threats are here. Okay, you're yeah. threatening my pawn. Obviously. You got a couple of ideas with the bishop that I need to be aware of. Um, I would say this one is, well, I guess um, if I let you do that, then I would. I can't even go back to f1 so Correct. easily because you're going to take and then play f3. And by he the way, gone he D5 has gone and D5. instantly. Yeah. As the most obvious thing on the board. Okay. Wow. Uh, one more move. If I go c4, then queen is coming to c3, and then it's almost impossible for you to attack that e pawn because you would lose another move for defending the knight on a5 and so on. So maybe c4 is relevant. Let's have a look. Yeah, I think this move makes a lot of sense because, I mean, basically, black's problem is this piece on a5, and you know you don't really need those two pawns. It's fine to give up one of them to get that trade. And so, yeah, I think the line that we're looking at is making a lot of sense. So, so queen, queen g5. g5. Yeah. Now let me try e6 first. I'll show you the mm -hmm. variation that I have a problem with. Mm -hmm. e6, I think I'll take it just to avoid e f7 mm -hmm. and all that. And then I go bishop f3. Mm -hmm. Now, as you mentioned, you can't go bishop f1 mm -hmm. because bishop takes g2 and mm -hmm. f3. So uh, bishop f3, you go g3. Exactly. But now I capture, and you have a problem again, mm. that if you take with the thing, I have queen c5 check. Mm -hmm. And if you take the other way, I have queen h5 and mm -hmm. mate. Um, I, why don't we just show g3, queen yeah. h5, and then we. Oh, we do not want we the do game not to want end that, like yeah. that. 
So let me so see, Vishy. Instead of p pushing the pawn, I mean, for some, exactly. This is the move that I wanted to try because it's such a beautiful centralization of the queen. And now I'm ha having a harder time justifying what I've just done because if I go bishop f5, mm -hmm. queen f, queen f3, three, I'm going to repeat. Go back, and yeah. How are you going? To, how are you making progress? Uh, queen but d4. Queen wait d4. a minute. Four. Hang on a second. Mm -hmm. Let I could play queen f3 because mm -hmm. if you go bishop g4, H4? I have h4. Okay, look at that. Yeah. And if you go queen f5, now I yeah, go Yeah, let's back just show let's just yeah. show our audience that if you take the pawn, your idea is like you actually get this pawn, you get a great pin and you completely eliminate black's attack with a great position. So And here this are these mm -hmm. are two super pawns on d5 and e5. Yeah. versus two x additional pawns on the h file and b file which I'm playing yeah. no role whatsoever. So you would go queen f5. Mm -hmm. And then are you going to you don't have I any don't more. have any <laughs> tricks. I yeah. have to go queen e4. Yes. But um, you would take it. Mhm. Mm Rook e4, and then you would throw in bishop f5 because I would have to go back. I do, ah. can't afford to lose the e5 pawn. Yes. And if I went back, mm -hmm. uh, you could just play rook e7, rook e8, or something, and I don't know, or rook yeah. d8 and king f8. Without the queens on the board, you know, the Harder center pawns it, yeah. are not as dangerous, right? So queen e4, bishop f5. Let me try queen d4. Mm -hmm. Okay, so queen e4. Let's go back. One move, move up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right here, we go queen d4. Yes. yes, and now you have bishop h3. Mm -hmm. But I just have uh, g3. And g3. Uh, there is no knockout blow here. Yeah. And plus, you always have this bishop that can kind of help you. Come back to f1. Yeah. Um, yeah, and a lot of, I mean, first of all, I have to say that the queen is amazing on d4. I mean, like, for example, if black ever tries to get their queen in here, it's very helpful that you have a queen that can go to the f4 square, mm -hmm. just in case. Um, and basically, you're preparing to kind of overwhelm black with those pawns, right? Like, look at all that space that you've got for your rooks to maneuver. Yes. So instead of bishop h3, mm -hmm. I was thinking, what about c5? Yeah, you really want to disturb my queen. Yeah, because I need to get that e5 square going. And mm -hmm. now if you go, but you can now go queen d2. By the way, guys, we want to tell you that today's thematic Lee Chess World Championship Arena starts in 10 minutes, and it starts from the position after 9 d4. So if you want to get a better sense of what these pl the opening these players are playing, uh, you're welcome to enjoy the arena. I mean, trying it out over practical games is the best way to figure out what they're doing, and you might spot something they haven't seen yet, so go for it. Yeah. Okay, so... If you play C5, queen takes c5... Yeah, your idea is, let me just try to see if I can understand. Mm, I mean, you're going after my my e-pawn, right? Mm -hmm. is, that that, is that it? That's it, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Queen c5, you want to go bishop h3 right away? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you're G3. opening up an attack. Mm -hmm. Wait, why can't I move my bishop there? Oh, oh uh, queen c5, it seems not to have registered oh, queen takes c5. Oh, it didn't register my move. OK, no problem. Here we go. <laughs> oh, it's reconnecting me to Lee Chess. Oh, that was it. That's I thought wonderful. maybe it's an illegal move, but I couldn't figure out why. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Well, give us a second, guys, as we, as we get the game back. Um, don't we all love little technical problems in the middle of the broadcast? Hmm. I know, the game has just disappeared, Vishin. Well, meanwhile, so, um, I know what, it, oh, here it is. There it is. Oh, beautiful. Here it's back. OK, d5, and we're talking about the move c4. One more thing. Mm -hmm. Can I go rook a d8 here? Rook a d8. So you are attacking this pawn, and on the move c4, what do you want? c6. c6, uh-huh. I mean, even if you go queen c3, I'll play b6, and what's the big deal? Uh, mm. Can I just force you to commit. It's very Grunfeldish, right? You say b6, knight a5, and do your worst with it. Oh, yeah. Point. That's very, well, it's, it's certainly very unusual, right? Like leaving this mm. knight here, kind of like allowing these pawns to move forward. But I guess you've got these sort of undermining plans, yeah? OK. Let's see how we're going to meet this idea. Um, 
Well, actually, I don't have a whole lot of ways to support this pawn. Mm. And that's the problem, right? So like moving it forward seems to be my main strategy. Now the question is, should I go queen g5 or? Well, by the way, Jan is in his rest area, even though it's his turn. So he has adopted Ding's strategy. I honestly think it was kind of a brilliant strategy from Ding to just come back to the chessboard. Because in a way, it's like you're marking your territory. You're going to be like, I'm here all the time. <laughs> you know, and either the other person has to also be like that, or you know they kind of have to cede that territory to you a bit. Yes. You know, so I think yeah, that was just a great, great move from um, from Ding. Um, okay, so d6, and what are you going to do? F6. Um, I don't know. I mean, f6 maybe, but I, what's wrong with queen g5? Besides bishop and seven. <laughs> Mm hmm Well, and that, I don't know, is that even a problem? I mean, you're trying to win this pawn, so maybe it's not a big deal, bishop h7. Then again, I don't know if I'm, because that knight on a5 is not participating, I don't know how to get it back into the game. Like, if you go queen g5, bishop h7, check king and check, queen mm -hmm. c3, mm -hmm. uh, then king h7, queen takes a5, but maybe bishop h3 is quite strong there. Mm, I can't take this pawn yet. Well, actually. Yes, she? actually you can. You can. <laughs> yes. uh, A1 is hanging just yeah. as much as D8. Yes, OK. Yes. Um, well, hold on. Let's just go a little slower for a second. So queen g5, right? You're basically attacking this pawn, and you're saying, I don't have a whole lot of ways to guard it. And if I do attempt to guard it, um, yeah, like let's say I attempt to guard it with just queen c3. Forget the pawn. B6, what else can I do? I think mm -hmm. here it's crystal clear. There's nothing else. OK. So B6. And now at some point, I will threaten F6. Mm. That's my kind of my mm -hmm. case, I guess. Interesting. Well, what if I go F3, Bishy? I don't know. For some reason, I want to take away some of your ideas. I also want to be able to play maybe rookie Rookie, two, two, rookie, rookie one. one, yes. Yeah. Oh, this could be nice. Then that knight on A5 is really marginalized. Mm -hmm. it, it Hard to believe, but you can play knight b7, rook d7, knight d8. But well, I mean, the question is so like, can, can you break like up that. these pawns at any point or not? Like, I mean, if I go bishop c8, no. Rook and D2. I go rook e2, I mean, yeah, you don't really get the time to break things up so easily. Okay, left six. Left six. Mm -hmm. I was thinking maybe even. I was thinking I could ah, get some initiative e1. with this. Yes, yeah. well, let's try it. Rook e1 takes. And then like knight e4 at the end, kind yes, of coming takes. in. Rook e5. Mm -hmm. Queen hit 6. Knight e4. Knight b7. But I make these moves with some nervousness. I mean, rook e7 might just be very strong. Yeah, like the amount of centralization that white has here is enormous. Yes. And this queen is coming in. But OK, I mean, I feel like um, we, of course, we're trying a very risky idea for black, right, yeah. with um, this rook, eight, rook, rook d8, which is inviting, inviting c4. Also, after c4, I could mm -hmm. just play b6 one move. So that it, it happens, c6, d6 happens mm -hmm. in my terms rather than yours. And we'll see where this goes. <laughs> But you don't you don't feel like nervous, Vichy, about allowing these pawns to exist like that? Like you know, maybe C four, just getting rid of, rid of the knight, like your first suggestion. Is I kind would of feel more very nervous at the stage mm -hmm. at the board of um, uh, missing some tactic because it's it's a lot of danger in the position mm -hmm. now for Black. Mm -hmm. But um, my my offhand evaluation right now is that um, these pawns are stuck there. They look very aggressive and nice, but white mm -hmm. is probably going to have to build up a lot more. F3, rookie to rookie one might mm -hmm. be necessary before something happens. And once, if I can pull, force one of them to move forward, which is what I'm trying to accomplish with mm -hmm. c6, then uh, if your pawn is on d6, it's not that dangerous, I think. Because mm. okay. you're stuck as well. So you want to, let's explore a little bit more along these lines then. Rook a d8. I mean, there's hard to find a move that is more natural than c4. So we got to try that. And so now do you want to try b6? There is queen a4 instead of uh, c4. Queen I'm just going to try and four. see if there's a, any little thing we have missed. Uh -huh, but if you go b6, rook d5, queen e8 yes. is obviously a problem. Mm -hmm. Cannot take that pawn, yeah. so b6. b6. Is there anything you see? 
I don't. Basically, how we can use the position of this queen mm. in some smart way is what you're asking. Um, well, I mean, we could always throw away throw that pawn forward, but I don't think it's going to give us very much. I think it's too early. Yeah, in general, you don't want to trade that pawn for that pawn. That's not the concept here. So yeah, no, I'm okay. I'm okay with playing c4 and seeing what what you got. Yeah, I could play b5 here, but uh, I'm not very happy doing it because uh, mm -hmm. even if that white bishop ends up on c4 in the end, mm -hmm. yeah. that's not necessarily what I wanted to stop. So. Yeah, I agree. Like somehow it feels like it's getting a little much, right? I mean. Yeah. I don't know. I no, mean, that uh, I'm that happy one, with rook d5. Rook but, uh, d5 and you got I mean, I'm not really threatening bc4 because knight takes c4, knight takes c4, bishop takes c4, mm -hmm. and we're back where we started in the sense of undermining. And then you've just kind of weakened this pawn. Yes. Yeah, so maybe c6 again? Try that? Or b6? Or b6, yeah. Which one of the Okay, b6, fine. So you're but supporting b6, maybe your knight. f3, rook e2 is already good. Mm. f3, bishop c8. Mm hmm. Rook e2. Mm -hmm. I could go c6 now. Mm -hmm. And if you see nothing better than d6, then. Well, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to find something better than d6. Yeah, but and now, uh, because I'm not wasted time going to g5 and all, I think I have f6 right away. d6, I have f6. Mm -hmm. Because if e takes f6, rook e2 and queen f6 must be great, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, so somehow you're succeeding in breaking up these pawns, which is a little surprising. And my queen is also not on c3 yet. Yeah, it's amazing how you've kind of given me these strong pawns, and then you just plan to, <laughs> to attack them like this. Yes. Uh-huh. Rook d8, OK. Wow. By the way, okay. isn't it kind of significant that uh, Jan is down by 15 minutes in this Position. I think so. I think it's the first time, first time in this so match. Far, right? Yeah, I mean, I can't remember yesterday. Um, yesterday, I think Yan caught up to Ding, but Ding was the one who was yeah, lower exactly, on time. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, he also started, uh, actually, the second game, he was lower on the clock right from the opening just because he was taking a lot of time After, to yeah, respond H3. to Ding's novelty, H3. Um, but overall, of course, the att tendency in this match that everyone has noticed is that Ding tends to be lower yeah, on time. So I think, uh, yeah that this point in the game that Nepo is 15 minutes lower on the clock is definitely a positive sign for Ding. Um, but yeah, rook a d8 was played, and now white's got to figure out how this pawn is going to be defended. So basically, we've just seen two options here. Either you're going to go c4, or you're going to maybe throw in this queen move, mm -hmm. if you find that helpful. But of course, if you throw in the queen move, and then b6 happens, which is generally useful for black, and then your queen's not that happy there. No, it, uh, I think it's only a question of some immediate tactic works, but mm -hmm. I don't see what could. I mean, I guess if you throw your queen over to e4. Yes, but then uh, I think even f5 will hit hard. Queen e4 and... F5, you can actually go back to yeah, a4 I can and go to I'm not a4. accomplished anything. It's quite funny. Okay, well, let, let's just take a look, quick look at this because there is uh, something I always like about the centralization of the pieces in chess. Maybe I'll go bishop h5. Yeah. yeah, let's just show this line, because it looks like the queen is almost trapped. It's very, square left, it's very beautiful. It's very beautiful. And by the way, Ding is playing so quickly. And he, OK, he's gone c4, so he's oh, not. Yeah, but queen a4 I didn't believe. So yeah. let's uh, just throw it out there. So c4, and strategically what is going on is that white's got the massive center, and that would normally be enough to give white a nice advantage, but black, of course, has these ideas of undermining, where you start with this move, you provoke the pawn forward, and then you undermine from here. So some version of that is what Nepo is, um, is going for here. So do you think, you think C C6 the most? Uh, I like C6 because I want white to commit faster. Mm -hmm. And that's what we just looked at, right? C6, is it D6 and F6 right away like that? Or maybe even. Um, yeah, D6, F6. Why not? Ah, yeah. Before we were looking at like queen G5 oh, ideas. Yeah, no, so I we didn't even look at F6. F6. Correct. Okay, let's just take a look at that. 
Okay, Nepo P B6. B6. He's gone for the quiet Okay, B6. so we've also examined that, not a surprise. The thing is now after B6, if I play knight B3, I think you don't want to take it. Mm -hmm. Because then I'll play AB3 and uh, queen C3 and I mm -hmm. keep those pawns. But mm -hmm. you can go back to B7 by now. You're just going to go back, reroute the knight, and this knight's not doing much. And after F6, uh, your knight is actually ready to come to D6. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So very complex position. Yeah, well, we got to figure out what white is going to do here. So b6, the idea of this move, simply protect the knight, also give him a retreat square so he can reroute himself to the center, and, and then play c6 on the next move. To so me, it looks like uh, black cannot be objectively worse, that his position is resilient enough to mm -hmm. handle these two pawns. Mm -hmm. um, unless there's a very direct line, which... Uh, because I, I just, I'm running out of steam in almost all the lines mm -hmm. I'm seeing. That, so my general feel is uh, that black is doing well now. How so do you see white's yeah. uh, chances? Well, that is very specific. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, in generally, I'm biased towards white's position. You know, I love the center pawns, and I kind of feel like, well, center pawns deserve to be respected. But no, I get, I get, and it's like so rare in chess, actually, like the strategies that you're showing us where you allow these pawns to advance the sixth rank and then you somehow succeed in undermining them. I mean, that's a fairly rare thing in chess when it works, right? Um, so let's see. I mean, there's no way I can play something like queen c3, try to protect this pawn and maybe hold these pawns with bishop e4. I mean, it's unlikely to work, but I just wanted to throw it out sure. there as an idea. Let's try c6. Yeah, c6. And then I was thinking maybe I can just try that for now. See what happens if I don't immediately push my pawns forward. You know what's really funny, Vishy? That like, well, I don't know. It doesn't really. Well, like theoretically, if I got to play e6 and you had to take me with the pawn and I could take you, like maybe that could be. That would be very nice. Also, if you follow up later on with knight b3. Uh, yeah, I mean, it could sure. be an interesting c pawn that I get, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So queen c3. Yeah, queen c3, c6, bishop e4. So now, how are you going to make... It's hard for you to make trouble for me on this pawn, so it's I this really one. I really feel like playing queen c3, knight c6, d c6, but there's no way I can double on the d file. <laughs> what, are, what are you saying, Vishy? How, how are you going to do it? queen c3, uh -huh. I, 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 the idea that keeps popping into my head is knight c6, queen c3, just make the move. Uh-huh, yeah. queen c3. Knight c6, d c6, yeah. and some doubling on the d file, oh, but yeah, it's not happening. Oh, yeah, something, yeah, but it's there's not nothing. Happening. No, yeah, it's not that happening. can go here. This queen cannot, sorry, cannot come to d6. Okay. By the way, guys, um, if you're watching this exciting game and you've got some comments and questions, um, feel free to write on Twitter with the hashtag NepoDing or in the YouTube chat, which our producers are going to select for us some interesting questions and comments to read. And that was a lot of fun yesterday, actually, the interaction with the audience. Vision. Yes, very much. Okay, so okay, one queen more C3. Uh -huh. Queen C3, I go C6, you're going bishop E4. C6, bishop E4, yeah. And now knight takes D5, I can't make it work because you... Knight take takes C4, yeah. Yeah, because you go queen, queen takes, takes E4 and I, I don't see the knockout. Yeah, you're trying to basically, you're trying to get me into this fork. But uh, I can't, yeah, queen takes C4. Queen C4. Wait, hang on, queen takes C4, let me play rook E5. Okay, you're getting a lot of my pawns. Ah, but bishop at seven and then it's a rook. That, I think yeah. at that point we'll have to call it for white. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's it. right. Yeah, so we no. white won in the second round. Okay, um, so, okay, here we are, bishop e4. Can I play f5? I can't make it. I know. It's interesting the way you've constructed this, uh, because if I go, let's say, cd5, cd5. Mm -hmm. And I go queen h5, attacking the e pawn. Mm -hmm. You're actually able to defend with the knight f3. Yeah, that's actually a cool point. And yeah, because if, whether you go queen g5 or queen h5, I always have this knight, knight f3. Three. And bishop f3, bishop f3, and suddenly we've got what we wanted. And that knight is not going to be able yes, to join. Yes. The knight is stuck um, on yeah. the grim. This is one of the so dream positions that white could get, I guess, then, where he hasn't yet actually given up one of these squares of the pawns. The pawns are just controlling everything, and it's very hard challenge them at this point yeah. So, so um, yeah let's let's try to keep 
Oh, I'm trying Queen to. Queen C3 is a lovely move here, and then follow up with Bishop E4. Yeah, let's try to break this idea down though for um, and find some counterplay for Black. So basically, yeah, the, the whole point was that if you try these moves, that like Knight F3 is just quite unpleasant, and this is the only pawn that you can really attack, right? And you obviously can't move your knight yet. Yes. And. Okay, queen c3, what about mm -hmm. f6? Mm hmm. Okay, f6. So you're going the other way. You're basically saying, yeah, this is so fascinating. You're, you want me to give up this square. Yes, e6, knight, b7, though yes. I, I do it with a very heavy heart. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> you are giving me something that normally chess players never give their opponent, which is like amazingly advanced uh, pass pawns over here. Okay, one of them is a pass pawn, but the other one is doing a great job supporting. And so knight, b7, okay, you're doing it all to get this outpost for the knight. And but it's got to be better for white. Right, what do you think, Vishy? I mean, come on, like these pawns, the space. I'll, you'll, I'll concede you'll that. You'll concede I, that? Okay. At least uh, it's very hard for me to uh, summon up the <laughs> will to play this, but. Uh, um, so he's gone b6. Yeah. Queen c3. Yeah, we're waiting to see how Ding is going to react, and we're thinking that this could be at least an interesting way improve the queen, support the pawn, and get ready for these various breaks. And I mean, our c6 is really the big break, right? And why wasn't our first approach working? What did we try to do? We tried f3, um, forcing the bishop to move. I think we, we just uh, committed d6 voluntarily. Mm. And that was the mistake. Also, the problem, once you played f3, is you go bishop e4, Yeah. cd5, cd5, I can play f5. And you either drop the d5 pawn, or you break it on f6, and neither ah. one is really suitable for you. And I don't have this retreat anymore. Correct. So keeping that f3 square is the crucial thing. Mm -hmm. So OK, basically you're saying if I take, I wind up losing that pawn in the end. Correct. And yeah, if I don't take, I wind up losing that pawn. Because you have no pins uh, yeah. thanks to the knight on a5. Yeah. It's actually finally fulfilling a role there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You finally get to take it, and then bishop develop your bishop, right. and everything is fine. Uh-huh, okay, so that's somehow this. So we're looking at queen c3, yeah. c6, c6, bishop and e4. then bishop e4, and that's where we're at. It will be interesting if, um, if Ding decides that this is, this is a good idea. Okay, so. Well, hang on, so c takes yeah. b5. Cd5, cd5. Bishop c8. Uh-huh. I'm going to come at you You're from the side. valiantly trying to defend black's position here. Okay, so you're even giving me the f3 square, Vishy. But after knight f3, I want to play f5, and uh, you're going to have to s smash uh -huh. your pawn structure one way or the other. Mm -hmm, I see. Yeah, no, the last thing I want to do is give up one of these. The thing I do is, I think you could play knight b3 here. So let me just try to understand. Mm. What exactly do you want? You want to go bishop b7, b7 that's and, it? Uh, and force you to choose. Yeah, so do you like maybe just like the getting my last piece into the game idea. Try it, bishop b7. Yeah. Bishop b7, and now my knight has to move somewhere, but you're saying every time I play it here. I'm gonna go f5. You're gonna go f5 and. Undermine the d5 thing. Yeah. And, and if you take on f6, I take with the queen, that's no problem, I think. Right, yeah, I don't want that end game. Okay, so in that Maybe case, my knight. it's not that straightforward, because uh, now you could just drop your queen to c2, mm -hmm. I have to play h6. And you know that pawn on d5, the rooks, you know, it might be unpleasant for black. Well, let's go with your first idea, this yeah, knight b3, b3, because I don't even see how black is going to be like feeling that good here. Yeah, it takes. Yeah. A b3, and now you're settling into bishop f3. Yep, and exactly. That's also fine, right? Yeah. Just hold the pawns. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like th these are the kind of pawns I dream about, Vishy. I love that space in the center. Mm. Yeah, and unfortunately, yeah, all these attacks that you can make, bishop just goes back, both pawns are supported, and okay, I mean, maybe you don't move the pawns easily, right? But, I mean, what do you think? Like, how, what would the winning plan be here for white, actually? Like, I don't know, let's say this happened, and bishop this happened, and I made some random pawn move. What's the winning plan for white? You can't push the pawns that easily. That is true. I don't immediately say oh, I'm going to go crashing through. 
Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So maybe like in the long run, it would be nice to win this guy, if that's even possible, but. No, but actually all my pieces are stuck defending those two pawns as well, right? Mm. Yeah. But I reckon it's hard for black to sit like this. Yeah. But okay, this is, it's, I mean, it's interesting if this could be some sort of a balance. Mm. Okay, Mohammed from Twitter is asking us, how can Jan's knight return to play? Well, that's a great conceptual question. Um, I love questions like that. So and let's talk about it. the problem we're trying to uh, figure out now. S thanks to the difficulty of defending these two pawns, d5, e5, mm -hmm. sometimes, as you saw, white is forced to play knight b3. Um, so white's knight is not completely uh, happy either. It's kind of in the way of where the rook needs to be and um, uh, the white bishop wants to be on f3. So there are some issues, but you're right. Uh, you're completely right, Mohammed. One of the dominant themes here is what is black going to do with that knight? Yeah, knight on the side of the board is often a positional problem. And well, that's why Jan protected it. And there are ideas, of course, of the knight coming here one day, provided it has somewhere to go after it goes to b7. So, but mainly, actually, Mohammed, we can change your question and be like, how is black going to fight against white center? That's probably the first thing that you know, Jan needs to figure out. And then together with that, then he'll solve the problem of the knight. Great question. OK, so. Um, mm -hmm. One sec. Uh, queen c3, you said, right? Yes. Let me try f3. Mm. Uh, no, it, uh, sorry, it doesn't work. Because um, I was hoping for g3, c6. And if you went bishop e4, I was going to mm. suggest that queen h3 works. But you can take with the knight. You don't have to take with the bishop. So I, I Well, slip, let me, uh, uh, let me try to understand, Vishy, why yeah. I can't just take the pawn. Then I thought. Uh, I'm going to take, and my king gets open. Maybe f6. Mm. But it's true. Yeah. Even, even in this slightly ugly form, you can play um, e6, e6, and, and it's still. still what if I went like queen f4? Extra pawn. Queen f4 right here. Uh huh. But then maybe even rook, maybe. E, rook e4, even. Queen takes f3, rook a e1, and then just mm. go forward. Nah. Yeah, or, or how about like the calm bishop f1? Then I was hoping queen d4. Uh huh. I'm trying to figure out your idea. If I take and play rook a d1, you're going to be c5. C5 and. But oh, maybe f4. Position. Maybe your pawns are more overwhelming than mine. Yeah, it's a complicated position. But yeah, I mean, okay, f3 is a very interesting try. Like, I mean, I think black has to be looking at all kinds of counterplay ideas. So this is definitely not out of the question. But you were saying, Vishy, that we can even. Uh, G3, C6, mm -hmm. uh, Knight H. Uh, yeah, let's just show our viewers that you know this checkmate threat gets met with Bishop F1, so yeah. it's not going anywhere. Um, so you go C6. Uh -huh, C6, and now Bishop E4. Mm, I still can't do the checkmate because now the pawn is going to hang. And I also can the pawn play, I can actually play knight takes c4 here. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Let me see if I. C oh, because my knight's hanging, huh? Yeah. So because you've opened ah, so up the diagonal. So f3 actually has a kind of point here. Yeah. yeah, you've opened up the diagonal. Okay, but this is not trivial by any means, guys. You got to see some tactics down the line. So Vichy's point is that uh, if I take with my queen. I'm going to take, take on d2. Yeah, you're going to take on d2 first, right? Well, I have to, right? Because. Yes, uh, yes otherwise f7 is going to be an issue. So queen takes d2, and what is going on here? It's still, still a question, actually. Like, I um, don't I mean, really know maybe what's going on. Or mm -hmm. or something. Look, uh, you still have queen a6. I'm not, uh, it's, this is chaotic. But the uh, black is up a pawn. Black is up a pawn. I can play something like h5. And then, uh, you know, that pawn in f3, it's going to haunt your king a while. Yes. So, OK, so you suggested to us the move f3 uh, and g3. But we but just again, decided yeah, knight, we takes knight takes f3. We decided knight takes f3 is at least like um, not so bad. Because even though the white king gets opened up, you don't have like a clear antidote to this, like the way I'm planning to hide him on h1. And you know, I think what's important here is, again, the knight is so far away. 
All right, Ding plays a move that we completely H3. haven't thought about. We haven't thought about because we wanted to do it long back, and by now we have lost interest. And but Ding has been paying attention. So yeah. B six H three. H three. Wow. Wow, that's important because it means that um, he's asking Black to choose right now. But mm. for me, the disadvantage is now Bishop C eight. Because now this plan of yours, queen c3, c6, bishop e4 doesn't work because I have bishop b7 forcing the question. Mm. Okay. So we'll now have to see how that one work, pans out. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is that he did choose not f3, right? He, he doesn't want the pawn there. Mm. He wants that square for his pieces, whether it's the bishop or the knight in the long run. And I mean, overall, I think, okay, it's at least an interesting move. You've got to consider always all your possible but, uh, as threats. I, I mean, I was a bit hasty. Let's go bishop c8. Yeah, bishop c8. I go knight f3. Mm -hmm. C6, mm -hmm. and instead of bishop e4, I have rook d one as well, thanks to the discovered check. Mm -hmm. And maybe now I've gotten my the, the both pawns supported and uh, hale and hearty, <laughs> and uh, we maybe that's a great plan. And basically, at, I mean, at some point you'll play bishop e4 if you need to, right? Yes. So for but example, you know why not yeah. do it after rook d one and everything? Yeah. Is, uh, I mean, you never know. Like you might even have like just as an example, an exchange like sack. No, rook takes d five. Or Oh, rook takes d5. Bishop at 7. Oh, let's look at that. King at 7. I'm oh, sorry, queen at 7. Queen mm -hmm. at takes, king takes. Uh, rook takes d5. But it's not so great because when I go bishop e6, you have a knight g5 intimate. So mm -hmm. I suspect I'll fall short, but uh, uh, it's not that straightforward. Yeah, I mean, I black has those two, yeah. two pass pawns on the queen side. But White's no. pawns are not quite going anywhere, but you think still advantage white in yes, this type of position. Right. Yeah. So h3, if he goes bishop c8, that's mm -hmm. what we're doing, right? Knight f3. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the logical follow-up to h3. And uh, the thing about h3 is brilliant because uh, if you go back, then I have opened up d1 square, f3 square. All the pieces, mm -hmm. squares yeah. I'm missing now right yes. now, rook e2. All the squares I'm missing right now are uh, become available to me. So let's look at bishop h5. It's not my preferred choice, but let's look at it. Mm -hmm. So bishop h5, yeah, I mean, he still hits these squares, but he feels like a little off on the side as well. Let me go queen c3 now. Mm -hmm. What are you going to oh, do? Oh, but uh, do we have like f3 ideas that are like more effective because the pawn is on h3? Maybe. Let's see. Uh, f3. But f3, I mean, I guess I'm going to have to go into g3 things. W why not g4? Why not g4? OK. That is is brave, but I guess like yeah, g four, queen h three, and now uh, knight takes f three because I have that cheapo. Hmm. I can't take you because of the discovery. Yeah. <coughs> and the central pawn mass holds back your rooks, so queen g four check. Mm hmm. I have to go king f1. Mm -hmm. But I'm always threatening rook e3 or something like that. And this must be yeah, nice yeah, white yeah. just holds with the extra piece. OK. So you're saying you can even go g4. And basically, if I go bishop here, g6, you're going to Bishop takes g6. And then you'll but try you to go get hit, this. But you go hit g6. And now yeah, I'm I can't also take. having a problem that queen f3, you have queen takes d2. Mm. And Jan has gone bishop h5 right away. So very, okay. very I think it's clear that uh, these squares are mm. quite crucial for the game. So. OK, so he's on h5, so we're looking at queen c3. Well, let's see if there are any other plans. I could go bishop f5 mm -hmm. and try to play e6 myself. Um, you might go bishop g6. Mm -hmm. Alternately, instead of um, bishop f5, what else can I do? Yeah, because now I can't move this knight because this pawn is going to hang. You can go rook ac1. So what are we what are we trying to accomplish? Bishop five. We're trying to go e six. That's the idea. But we're not really going to be able to now, right? So yeah. So rook c one. Uh, right here. Yeah. Yeah. And then my idea is to play knight f three, and kind of everybody's defended. Yeah. Guard the pawn. Improve the knight. And uh, you know, try to be better. Yeah. So bishop f five is an interesting idea as well. So we have queen c three as an idea. Bishop f5 is an idea. Those That's seem to be the main ones, right? Correct. Queen c3, mm -hmm. uh, what would Jan's idea be? If queen g5, 
Mm -hmm. Then I could go bishop e4 and threaten knight f3, bishop f3, bishop f3, and mm -hmm. then I, I keep everybody happy. Yeah, and you're constantly using this. Bishop at 7 as yeah, a Yeah, the discovery, the discovery on h7 mm -hmm. as a threat. Wow, Vichy. I mean, the game is certainly suspenseful. I think Ding has Brilliant. done a great job. Brilliant. We couldn't job. have asked for a yeah. more interesting game. This is fascinating and... Uh, and that's Simply why a we're going to exciting position. Yeah, that's why we're going to go on a break right now as Ding chooses um, how he wants to uh, build up his position. Actually, he's coming up with the move. So he's Which starting one is in Bishop it? E4. Bishop E4. Okay, let's just talk about that for a second. He's starting in Bishop E4, and he can mm -hmm. always play Queen C3 next after Queen G5. Yeah. So it doesn't matter in that sense. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Alexandra Kostinyuk, the 12th Women's World Chess Champion. For me, a World Championship match is a dream that you're trying to reach as a professional chess player. There are only two players that play this match and of course every single player dreams about getting the sacred place and trying to play for a world championship crown and maybe one day be named a world champion. Every world championship match is a mystery, so of course you never know what to expect. At the beginning of the match uh, the chances are equal, 50-50, either one player is gonna win or the other. We as chess spectators, as chess fans uh, are waiting eagerly and of course we cannot really be sure on what openings uh, the players are gonna use and what novelties they're gonna prepare, but definitely there's gonna be some. And um, I cannot uh, say and I cannot give any significant advantage to any of the player, uh, but I know that every move, every decision, every game at any point can become a crucial one. We remember that in the previous uh, World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nepomnici, game number six of this match was definitely the crucial uh, point that somehow twisted the match in the direction of one player. Whether we're gonna see such a moment this time, well again, we can never be sure, but what we can be sure about that we're gonna witness a lot of fight and a lot of exciting games. We often hear that chess is a draw and of course uh, one can expect many games ending in a draw in a world championship match, but nevertheless I think they're gonna be just enough games with decisive result and um, these games will definitely highlight and make us forget about those inevitable draws that follow a world championship match. Those discussions about chess being a drawish game uh, have been going on for many, many years and um, more and more theory progresses, uh, more and more chances we uh, face with such theoretical draws. But again, as I said, I do believe that uh, these two players will create something that we're gonna talk uh, about and uh, definitely uh, these drawish games that uh, will happen uh, in this match will not, this match is not going to be remembered only um, because of these draws. Of course it's a pity uh, not to see the match between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nepomnici again uh, when Jan Nepomnici won for the second time in a row the Candidates Tournament, um, I think the whole chess world um, was looking forward so much to this match revenge. And um, yeah, it's a pity when the world number one rated player and um, uh, such a, a player who's been on the top of the world for many, many years and played five World Championship matches uh, 
is not defending his title. It's a very special uh, chess tradition, a world championship match. And to tell you the truth, uh, I think, being a chess professional, um, that this tradition actually gives too much advantage to a world champion. Um, a world champion is not obliged to play at all, uh, waiting for uh, his opponent to get through a lot of qualification tournaments and actually winning this whole qualification pass, becoming a candidate sometimes seems as a mission impossible, seems as, uh, as, as hard as winning a world championship match itself. And um, even though I I'm always looking forward to a world championship match. I'm always excited about this event. I understand and uh, respect this tradition. But again, uh, I'm not 100% uh, sure that a world champion should get such uh, so many privileges uh, just to sit and wait uh, for a new opponent, a new candidate. We were lucky, I think, in this sense that uh, Magnus Carlsen, as a world champion, never hit behind this title and never refused to play. And uh, he has been always active as a player, as a top-ranked uh, a chess player in the world as a world champion uh, but uh, is it going to be the same with the new world champion and is it really needed to follow this tradition so uh, closely and to have this world championship match that uh, benefit in a way a world champion so much that's another uh, very interesting question and I'm always happy to see such a discussion because again uh, different systems exist in different kind of sports and uh, maybe we should somehow limit those advantage uh, that a world champion um, gets but that's another question and if i get back to answering the question about uh, magnus carson not playing this match of course this match lost significantly in my eyes uh, nevertheless it's gonna be as exciting and as interesting uh, as always and i'm looking forward to seeing uh, many um, uh, interesting games between Jan Nipomnish and Dean Klenzheng in this uh, World Championship match. As the world holds its breath, two unstoppable minds prepare for immortality. One from the land of the dragon, 
the other from the land of the bear. Together, they will write history. The patient and precise Ding, carefully calculating every move to gain a strategic advantage, facing the aggressive Nepomniachi, who is always looking to take risks and never afraid to make bold moves to pressure his opponents. Their eyes might be fixed on the board, but their minds will be focused on victory. These two titans of the chessboard have fought their way through the ranks, demonstrating skill, strategy, and a fierce competitive spirit. Now they will go head to head and fight for the ultimate title, the FIDE World Championship Crown. Where champions come and go, chess endures. Everyone, we're back with our coverage of the fourth game of the 2023 FIDE World Chess Championship match between Ding Li Ren and Yan Nepomnishi. And Ding had just played the move Bishop E4 before we went to break. Um, nothing has changed in the position so far because Nepo is still thinking over his move. So let's give the audience um, a sense of where we think that the game stands right now, Vishy. The struggle is all around these two advanced pawns on D5 and E5. White um, is going to solve his problem slightly tactically. Uh, the main thing is right now rook takes e5 is not possible because mm -hmm. of bishop h7 check. And we will see the same thing going on after queen g5. We're going to play queen c3, same tactic, same mm -hmm. way of defending. And uh, with the bishop on e4, the pawn breaks don't undermine d5 quite as fast. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, it looks like black's a stable pawn up. But white's got this central pawn mass and good chances to do something with it. And uh, the position's unbalanced enough that uh, uh, it's actually kind of exciting here. Yeah, you know, Vishy, thanks for reminding us that black is a pawn up because I've completely forgotten. <laughs> you know, this is <laughs> yes, not worth remembering, worth yes. remembering that he's we got a pawn up. We haven't talked about this for a long time, but actually, indeed, Ding made a sacrifice with that pawn move to c5 earlier. And so he has these pawns not for free. Uh, actually, black is up a pawn. You really can't feel it in this position so much. Uh, but yeah, it is important to know that. So, you know, white is not just getting this advantage in the center absolutely for free. Black has an extra pawn, I guess you could call it, like, for example, that f4 pawn is the extra pawn. But we expect <coughs> white's next move in this position to be something along the lines of this, right? Yes, queen c3, knight f3. Um, and knight f3 is important because it finally allows the white rook on a1 to come to d1. Mm -hmm. So Jan actually made a crucial decision just one move ago, which is mm -hmm. to keep that bishop on h5, because mm -hmm. he understood how crucial it is that white lacks the f3 square, the d1 square. And so white is going to lose a little bit of time with bishop e4, knight f3, so that mm -hmm. he gets exactly those squares. And um, there's a lot of tension in the center. And uh, uh, yeah, this, I, I don't know how to evaluate this yet, but I'm starting to like white. But then you always have to decide, is it more than a pawn? Mm -hmm. Is it composition for a pawn? What exactly is it? So that's Yeah, so basically are. the battle is over you know, these two pawns in the center versus black's extra pawn. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. OK, so while Jan is busy thinking over his moves, Vishy, um, let's return to the question that we began discussing yesterday, where I asked you what you thought about the world championship cycle and you know, the toll it would take on somebody who is playing a lot of matches you know, year after year, pretty much every two years, um, and the toll it takes on them you know, physically, mentally, from a creative point of view and uh, your own experience with that. And so you were kind of talking through your matches, how excited you were the first time you got to play a match 13 years after your second one against Kramnik. And that was a very different experience by the time you got to your 2012 match against Boris Gelfand. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it takes a toll. So the World Championship cycle, there's a conflict built into it. I remember when um, Kasparov and Karpov used to essentially have three-year matches. So the cycle used to take three years in those days. And that was quite a bit um, slow. It gave people a chance to recover. Um, I think Gary recovered best between 1987 and 
1990. Earlier, mm. he was also stuck playing match after match because mm -hmm. all the revenge matches and other stuff that got built in. Um, then um, I participated in uh, one three-year cycle, then the second one on the PCA side, and um, finally, when it came to Kramnik, we had switched back to two-year cycles. The problem is, built into this, if, if you do three-year cycles, then um, lots of players are going to have to wait a long time for their turn. Mm -hmm. In the sense that we've always had people whom we all strongly feel deserve at least one shot at the world title, and you know, can let's see what that produces in them, uh, versus the problem of someone who's successful and ends up defending his title a few times, and then how many matches in a row do you want to play? That conflict is built into it. Another thing which has happened recently is that um, uh, computers have gotten very, very strong. I mean, they've gotten much stronger than even they were in 2012 or something, so some of the matches that I played versus now. Um, and these two angles have to be considered in the future. Um, I, I think in terms of qualification, it's very healthy that we have these ideas like um, the spot for the best player, uh, the player with the best tournament results. Mm. So there's uh, the FIDE circuit. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to cover a wide variety of tournaments, open tournaments and so on, mm -hmm. give them points and uh, get a qualifier f through that for the candidates. Oh, wow. So that, for instance, addresses it very well because nowadays we have a lot of very good players. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's a problem when you have a candidate and you cut it down to eight, you still feel that a couple of people who didn't make it who mm. maybe deserve a chance. It's, uh, it's quite tough and rigorous in that sense. Uh, but that, this conflict is not easily resolved. You go back to three years, yes, but then there are people who will be waiting much longer and you keep it two years, it's exhausting to do this year after year. So, um, but you know, the World Championship, people didn't always consider it a, a big burden or sacrifice. For them, it was an honor to try it. And uh, um, you know, if you take uh, Kramnik, mm -hmm. he, the way he prepared for London, he is, mm -hmm. uh, it seems that uh, you know, in his book as well, he talks about it. He basically never prepared like that again. Mm -hmm. And you know, I also remember how hard I prepared for some of the earlier matches, but uh, how excited I was to play a match again in uh, 2008 because I'd had 13 years of every kind of tournament. Yeah. But a match is still unique, and and you know, this tradition, this history, all that is worth, uh, I think, uh, you know, putting up with even once. So, you know, let's not make it too much of a complaint, but um, it is a problem. Yeah. Well, I do think that the World Championship match is—it's a beautiful tradition in the history of chess. And I think that there's nothing really comparable to it. And uh, well, OK, we're going to come back to the yeah. subject. Let's take a look at the move that Nepo just played. So he put rook okay, e7 okay, so. on the board. So I guess the point of this move is he simply wants to, to double. double up and get that pawn. OK, so he wants to but pressure. I kind of kept dismissing mm -hmm. that as too slow, but uh, now we're going to have to take it seriously. Um, if I go queen, queen c3, c3 and knight f3, rook e8. Right? If I go knight f3, then already bishop f3, bishop f3, queen g5 is a problem. And you're basically just succeeding in winning this pawn. I still have d6. Mm, OK, let's see how strong the pass pawn is. Correct. But um, um, it actually seems like a pretty good pass pawn. Are you going to have to take once any one and go rook d8? Or but then uh, even bishop d5 must be close to winning okay. and rook e7. So because you're there yeah. now with the bishop dominating the knight, black is essentially a piece mm. down. So that's going to be Oh, yeah. I have crucial. to say, this is, this is too yeah. beautiful. Who says that bishops don't like outposts? Yeah, very right? much. But you can go rook takes e1, queen takes e1, king f8, for instance. Uh -huh. I mean, just to make sure we're not missing a knockout blow. King f8. Yes. Um, probably I do want to play. Mm, so your idea is like here, and then the queen just kind of comes back. I can go bishop d5. Hmm. Uh, but then you have queen f6, d7, queen e7. And queen f6, attacking the pawn. No way to defend it, so d7. And then queen e7, and again, no way and to defend it. And then you get it. And then. You know, black is obviously doing well here. OK. But uh, instead of bishop d5, I think queen mm -hmm. e4 was very strong. Mm. Queen e4, because I'm threatening queen a8 mate, as well as queen takes at 7 uh -huh. So that must be nice for me. 
So that's it. That's it. Well, one second. What if I go queen d8? Then I just queen takes f4. Uh, queen f4, you get the pawn back, and you're basically saying I'm still playing. Or even queen knight. d5 and saying your knight is never coming back. <laughs> mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. so some sort of advantage here. Yes. But um, black could easily play knight b7, d8 before proceeding further. So there are um, lots of choices. Okay, to so you mean that like here, for example, Black doesn't have to play queen uh, queen g5 because on knight b7, I don't have d6. Also, right? instead of bishop takes f3, mm -hmm. f5. Uh, this idea that has been plaguing white for so long. Because yeah, and I don't have any d5s here. Oh, sorry, d6s. Yeah, you're just going to take, check, and move away. Um, so if I take, bishop then you F3. take bishop f3. And Queen f3, and even knight takes c4 is very nice. Yeah. So you like that more than rook takes c5. Rook takes c5, bishop, bishop e6 is an yeah. exchange sack, and you, you have to defi decide how mm -hmm. good that is. But knight c4, rook bishop e6 is also oh, an exchange yeah, sack. Yes. So, uh, but I guess, how would we evaluate this? Crazy position. I mean, you can take even with the queen, right? Yes, and queen f4, you. I think taking is risky because you will not disentangle. I'll just go rook e3, rook e1, maybe. Mm hmm. I'm not getting out of this pin, yeah? Well, this seems. I don't know, completely. Also, hard instead, of to bishop evaluate. E6, uh, instead of bishop e6, maybe d6 is a trick. Ah, you want to win my knight. Except knight d6 <laughs> ruins it, OK? <laughs> ah, no. OK, yeah, look at that. Yeah. There's a lot of tactics. So there is basically, we're uh, you know, so far it's been a slow maneuvering game, right, with like the tactics kind of hidden under the surface. But you know, kudos to Jan. We were not uh, really giving a lot of attention to rook e7. We mm -hmm. were trying to do breakthrough with pawns. Mm -hmm. But rook e7 is a very calm move, saying um, mm -hmm. your pawns are, look beautiful, but they actually are not threatening anything. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's definitely making his intentions against this pawn known. Because Ding Liren cannot double as easily. Mm -hmm. So that is a problem for white. OK, well, queen c3 looks very natural. It's hard to get by without that move. So here, you're still not threatening to take. But I guess at some point soon you will be. Yes. And the question that you're basically leaving white is like, what, what to do with these pieces, how to improve them? The other thing is you could play bishop f3. Mm -hmm. Because now your priority is to get a knight on f3 because mm -hmm. uh, the pawn uh, which is under most pressure is the one on e5. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yes, I would really love to get a knight on f3 and a rook to e4. But to I e1. don't know what's happening after bishop g6. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, bishop g6, maybe bishop g4 is very good because after knight f3, <laughs> queen has run out of squares. Or something yes, like. that's funny. But also, I mean, now like my rook can actually move, right? Yes, uh, rookie to queen g5, rookie one, right? Yeah, yeah I can possible. even do that. I can like prepare for your attack at my pawn on e5 by doing that, and then I'm in time to defend it. Yes. So very tense position, not at all easy to play. Uh, rookie seven. Mm-hmm. Um, Queen c3 is a reasonable, mm -hmm. right? Why, why we can play bishop yeah. f3 and move later. I really like the queen here. Because now if you go queen g5, what did we decide? I mean oh, that's even, when we went knight f3, take, take, rook e8, yeah. d6, right? But you can even do bishop f3, right? OK, tr let's try it. You don't like that? Mm -hmm. No, I'm just double checking. Maybe mm -hmm. bishop g6. So bishop takes f3, knight takes f3, queen f5. Is it easy for white to make progress? I mean, I, let's say I play h6, g5 mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, uh, you're not giving me the e4 square. Again, we come back to this thing. It looks lovely, but how do you break through? Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to play e6, f6, e rook e5, rook e1, something like that. I don't know. No, it doesn't work for the pin, but. Yeah, and like basically, we just don't really have a way to make this move work. I, I find it very hard to believe that that will work, because the knight is able to return to c6, mm -hmm. which also stops the bond right on its track mm -hmm. on d6. So suddenly I'm lacking a plan here. 
Uh huh. Okay. So, so we're saying queen c3. Not easy at all. Queen g5. Yeah. And so the question is, what does white want to have left on the board, the bishop or the knight? What's our conclusion about that? We want the bishop, don't we? Or but then we have less support over e5. Yes, knight f3 takes takes rook e8, and then yes, we were examining d6. But uh, okay. yes, that's right. D6. Okay, so we were looking at this. Uh huh. Mind you, if black goes queen at six, I don't know how we've made progress here. It's a tough position to. If they just go back. Yes. Because I might be threatening uh, rook e8. I mean, I can't. The pawns look great, but I can't push either of them very easily. Hmm. And is white even better? Suddenly, rook e7. Go, can we go like knight h4? G6. And then I stop to think. I mean, one of my ideas was that I always have like this move if I want to come back with a knight. And then you've got the knight uh, as a piece. Knight so, I mean, it's not maybe it's not a big deal, but I mean, I have that idea, right? If I need it, and I guess I I need to do something kind of soon. Although this isn't even really a threat, right? So. Hmm. Yeah, g6, your queen got a little bit cut off. But I still can't go rook d1, it's funny. Okay. Well, let's try it. Let's try bishop f3. Let's see where that goes. And Ding played queen c3, so that's the move that we were expecting. So, bishop f3. Do you want to take and go maybe queen h5, queen f5, or? But then maybe white can think about doubling on the e-file, a rookie two, rookie one, rookie four, and sit on mm -hmm. e-four somehow. Well, we said that this wasn't that big of a deal, this kind of position for black. But g6 is a weakness, because now if I play rookie four uh, mm -hmm. and rookie one, even if you play c6 and I play d6, you can almost never break with f6 anymore, because you weakened your king side. OK, but we, we're still wondering how, um, I guess how you yeah, how you break through in this position. It's funny, because I guess on queen d2, you're going to be forcing me to go g5, which may not necessarily be terrible. I wonder if this is any way to get like a knight to g4. It's not so easy. Yeah, still feels. Still feels pretty tricky. Let's try again up to queen c3. Mm -hmm. and we go back, queen c3. What a tense game this is, wow. I mean, tense yeah. in terms of uh, the pieces are stuck, and uh, but there's a lot of only moves and mm -hmm. things like that. Well, the English opening um, is definitely the way to go, I think, to get out of mm -hmm. the theory and um, and yeah, Ding's pawn sack with c5 was quite interesting. I mean, that was a, that was a big decision that led yes. to him having this big center. So he played that one quite confidently as well. So queen c3, and the main moves are either rook d8 or queen g5. There's not a whole lot else that would make sense for black. Rook d8, we thought even bishop f3 might be possible, right? Yeah, we thought it was possible, but I think did we ultimately settle on knight f3 here? Hard to remember, because <laughs> we've been well, walking around these lines. Way, but bishop yeah. f3, it's true. Bishop f3, bishop g6, bishop g4, I vaguely recall something like that. Uh-huh, OK. So bishop f3, bishop g6. You've been trying not to trade. And then here. Okay, we got a question from Mohan. I know he's one of our YouTube viewers. And how much preparing for the world champion, how, how much did preparing for the world championships affect your practical play, considering how much theory you had to prepare as computers got much stronger in 2012 than ever before? So I guess Mohan has been actually listening to our stream and he's uh, picking up from where we left off, you know, talking about the World Championship matches, Vichy. So, yeah. It's a pretty profound question. Um, 
I was a very natural player growing up. I never worked with a serious coach or had serious openings till I was already 20 years old. Um, and then the very process of learning theory, uh, playing in a more restricted way, uh, restraining yourself, as it were, has uh, consequences in terms of the choices you make. So, you know, you retain some degree of your natural skill, of course. But I was becoming a much more uh, classical, bookish player as time went along. Um, and when you prepare for matches and so on, you need to spend a few days at the end without any assistance, almost letting, I found it helpful before a match to get warmed up, um, to either play crazy stuff in blitz or uh, try to solve positions. You have to do something to get back to the board mm -hmm. because this thing of preparing and thing also can become a kind of dependency that you start to depend on having lines and uh, you forget how to just improvise. So there's always a choice. You try to get better at learning stuff, mm -hmm. and you have to keep going back to um, uh, keeping the natural ability to just play chess and have fun and forget that it's a game between two players. It's not between you and a computer. It's between you and another human being, and you should never lose that. But very pertinent question. Uh, it's a question every player deals with. Yeah, so we were talking, Vishy, like the um, the uniqueness in chess of the world championship matches that have been going you know, for more than a century now. And I definitely feel like it's somehow much more a special thing than just being you know, ranked number one, right? I mean, kind of like that changes. And even in tennis, okay, there's players who are ranked number one, but there is like a special aura, right? A special, you're, you know, you're certainly one of the elect few when you win the world championship title. So it would be um, you know, a sad thing if these matches were kind of eliminated from the chess tradition. Um, on the other hand, like we were talking about, so it seems like the more dominant you are, the more of these matches you win, um, the less attractive they become and the greater the toll they take on you. And even it's wonderful for the challengers who are gearing up to play you know, their first or maybe second match, and they're excited about it because they've got something to gain, but you've only got something to lose. Essentially, you've done a ton of these matches. And you can't even play, you know, focus on your tournaments properly because you're just in that match cycle. So what's the solution to that? Um, let's separate the two things. I think this is a unique tradition. There is nothing else where every player feels, looks up to this cycle where um, in the end you, you know, you follow a long path of qualification. You can be eliminated at any stage and it doesn't matter if you're the highest rated player or not. There's this long, arduous road and you get to the mountain top almost as it were and um, it's part of the journey you know surviving till the end makes it special we don't have another competition like it yeah. we have all kinds of knockouts even in tournaments um, Swiss tournaments round robins double round robins everything else has been tried uh, the cycle and this thing is unique and it's therefore the traditional thing the second question relates more to really this thing of having two year matches because then it gives you very little time. Uh, some people do better than others. Um, I think I may have made mistakes as well in my preparation of the thing, but the problem is after playing one of these matches, I was kind of drained. I didn't want to look at chess for a while mm -hmm. and that affected my work. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is possible, I think, uh, to do it. Again, my second uh, wind of cycles came when in my l mid to late 30s. Mm -hmm. So I got the shot that I wanted earlier. I got it quite late. And uh, you know I, I simply didn't have the energy to uh, prepare and play as hard. Thing. But now, I, looking back, I would say I, I should not have uh, let the team go. Even though we were all sick of seeing each other, mm -hmm. but I, I should have kept working harder and harder for longer, but uh, in order to be able to cope with the tournaments. Um, but. You know, that's the most specific question as to how you space out the tournaments. I think still this is a beautiful tradition. And there is something about watching someone survive year after year till the end. And then um, that's an accomplishment in itself, and it's special. Well, what do you think about some possible solutions to this? Like, for example, I heard uh, Daniil Dubov, he made a video, and he talked about, he said you can either do two things. You can either change it to Fisher Random or shorten the time control as a way to solve the drudge, drudgery of the preparation um, and basically to you know, 
to highlight who the stronger player is, you know, because as you as you take away the whole, um, you know, uh, counting on the preparation, it allows you to see who who the stronger player is in the match. These are very good ideas because what has happened recently is that um, computers um, have evolved so much that we have to find a way to reduce their influence. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to get interesting positions that you cannot work out in some sense. And so the challenge comes again, you know, to, it's certainly possible to experiment with the format and, you know, and look at time controls or other ways to make it, um, um, to cope with this development. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's worth a very serious look. His ideas are quite interesting. What would you think about, like, you know, four rapid games a day? that kind of format for a world championship match? That is uh, quite good. You don't have to go all the way down to rapid, but certainly uh, the time control is one way to slightly minimize the effect of computers. Maybe I don't know mm -hmm. that you would remove uh, chess preparation from rapid. You might have to go even less if you want to completely push out computers from that space. Uh, but nonetheless, I li if, we, if we can keep this idea of a long cycle, uh, and this uh, survival mode and you know the world title like that, certainly um, um, rapid. Ch the other problem I have is we, we already have a world rapid championship and a world bliss yeah. championship, so not to duplicate that, uh, it'd be nice to combine it with some element of classical chess and uh, thing. Maybe uh, Fisher random as well, but again, then we are uh, leaving out the, the the tradition. It's a different tradition. So yeah. we'll, they'll, we'll have to figure out which compromise we want to do. Well, another one could be something like where if you win a certain number of world championship matches, maybe you get the prize of then choosing the format out of a couple of possible different formats. And that way, you know, there is actually an incentive for you to win these matches and be dominant because then you can play in the preferred format that you like. I have um, often been in discussions about you know things we could do and it sounds fun when you're throwing the ideas out but when you actually want to write them down and say this is what we're going to do next time you get much more nervous and second I, I seriously don't think the problem is a lack of incentive to fight I think it is just that the uh, nature of preparation and work has gotten us uh, to this point where um, the opening space is, is compressed exactly and you know and it's also like the stress of playing a world championship match Right, I mean, it's like, it's not like you just calmly, calm, you know, play, you know, for three weeks. I was, you know, we were both reading this book from London to Alista, right? And um, the descriptions of Kramnik's match with Liko, you know, pretty dire. You know, at some point he just couldn't sleep. Why? Because of the opening problems, you know, um, couldn't sleep. And apparently one of his doctors gave him like a sleeping pill, which he decided to take in the middle of one of his games and was basically, completely inert you know, for this game and was quite lucky that Le Leko offered him a draw. And then they drove him off to the hospital after the game. Um, after the match, his seconds told him that he should take some time off. He wasn't able to do that. Two years later, he announced his um, break for six months to, to focus on his health. So I mean, and that was just two matches in that were separated by four years, right? His match against Kasparov, four years later, Leko, and you know, man in the prime of his life and the health is just, uh, is just gone. And it's hard not to see some sort of link to the stress of playing, um, to playing these matches. Yes, but I, I think we can't start cutting the players too much slack. I mean, you want the world title, you've got to put up with it. Uh, you know, at that point, you have to kind of draw the line and say, no, it's got to be difficult still. It's got to be difficult and challenging. It's got to be something worth fighting for. And yes, youth will have an advantage in some areas, but uh, that's just what it is. Um, we, but it, I, there is this thing that uh, opening preparation has gotten to where it is, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll need to think of. I'm sure in the end we'll come up with some sort of very uh, interesting format. It does, you don't have to do away with the classical games. Maybe we combine it a bit. Mm -hmm. I think it's the best because then you keep the tradition, but it's evolving. Uh, We'll see, but I'm, uh, I think if you're not in peak physical shape and you can't take it, then probably you shouldn't but maybe, bother. But maybe you that's are in peak physical shape, you know, and that's the thing, and there's something about this match where you just aren't able to sleep. I mean, it's, it seems to be like an ubiquitous thing. Um, like even like someone, uh, he, they just talk about Kasparov, 
during his match with Kramnik and how he was going into peak physical condition and could calculate you know, the best in his life. And, and yet he was like a shadow of himself because he was so busy dealing with the opening problems in that match. Yes, and, and that is chess. Uh, you can be in peak physical shape, but if you're not able to play, uh, you know, you're not able to get the positions you want, you get depressed. That comes with the territory. Same thing again at the other end. I feel, you know, uh, since World Championship has always about been about breaking your opponent in some mm -hmm. sense, uh, forcing them to confront unfamiliar, difficult problems, still they crack in some way. Um, that has to be just part of the package. Well, speaking of the evolution of these World Championship matches, one thing that we don't have anymore, Vishy, is the candidates' matches. And those matches I recently looked up, some of them were like 12 games. They were the length of a World Championship match these days, but those were only candidates' matches, and there were a, a number of them before you qualified to be a participant in the World Championship match. What do you think about, you know, uh, the fact that they're, they're not around anymore. What was your experience like in them? That is true. The candidates' matches were once a very, very big part of it. But um, um, it's very much a tradition of a slower era. Now people's calendars and everything are so complicated mm -hmm. that uh, the idea that you just have a candidates' match every two months to think, uh, in a sense, a candidates' tournament is a compromise. You just say, we get them all together, we finish it in one place, and because we can't spread out the calendar for a whole year. Imagine that uh, in my first cycle, I played a match January 91. Mm -hmm. I played a second match with Karpov in um, July, August. Mm -hmm. If I had won that, I would have gone on to play uh, in Linares the next year, mm -hmm. the semis. If I had won that, I would have gone 93. This is what Shot did, by the way. Mm -hmm. He would have played uh, in 93 in Escorial. Mm -hmm. And then there was the World Championship waiting. Mm -hmm. And in the second cycle, I played um, um, Romanish in New York. Then I played Michael Adams a few months later. Then mm -hmm. I played um, Gatakamski a few months later. Then went on to play Gary. It's a thing from another era. And at some point, there were also problem organizing these candidate matches. I, I miss them. And when I read these old books, I think. But sometimes you have to also uh, remember that these things happen in a very different time. So. Yeah, I know as you describe it, Vish, and you're like, imagine, I'm like, I imagine, I'm like, oh, that's great for the chess world, all these interesting matches going on. But I, I do see your point that, um, yeah, in today's busy tournament schedule and just, you know, it's just a little bit too much, I think, to ask the players to play, you know, a match or several times a year. Yes, and also organizing multiple candidates matches throughout the year for, I mean, you're organizing three or four at the same time at the early stages. Um, there's an organizational burden. And by the way, we have too many players. We have too many good players. Um, easily, I think, by the time we get to the candidates, I can always point to three or four, and I, I wish that were there. But mm -hmm. we can't have 12 player candidate tournaments and 16 player candidate tournaments. It feels wrong. So you're already pruning it down. I think we have evolved to where we are, and it's probably the right place to be for the moment. Um, but certainly, I enjoy reading these old candidate stories. They're fascinating. So basically, to sum it up, um, you relate to Magnus's decision to withdraw from the World Championship match, like you can understand it, um, or you think that you know the World Champion is kind of like obliged to continue in this in this tradition. Um, I can I can certainly relate to his thing. As I said, uh, I experienced the same feeling of uh, maybe burnout is the wrong word in his case, but you feel mentally blank. You. You're fed up of studying these things again and again. Mm -hmm. It's stronger now than before, because before you could still find uh, ideas to play. And nowadays, openings are much harder to squeeze something out. But I, there, there is a solution. You, you know, you will, um, at some point, people will start doing things like H3, A3, <laughs> and you'll find new space. But um, I can relate to it. I wish he hadn't left, though. Um, it is uh, a nice tradition. And now we've got uh, this match. And uh, th this is also, again, if the quality of games is good, the struggle is intense, mm -hmm. you know, everything's beautiful again. Mm -hmm. uh, what we want is a world championship that people remember and enjoy. Uh, that's the main thing. Yeah, um, God, this is a good moment for me to tell you um, about what Kramnik had to say about this match. So he expects a match with a lot of ups and downs and quite a lot of decisive games. And he actually says that these two players have a similar weakness of being a little bit unstable. So they can be brilliant, but also have games where they play below their level. 
He doesn't think there is a clear favorite, and things can go wrong at any moment for any player, and he expects a roller coaster of a match. Bishy, do you think that he's spot on with his prediction? If uh, Ding wins a game now, he could be spot on. Um, but generally, a couple of people noticed that uh, to describe Ding as being someone who's got ups and downs was surprising because he was generally known for his stability. He's generally mm -hmm. quite solid. And thing. But everyone has uh, doubtful form for a while, then they come back, they have, they're in roaring shape. These are natural cycles. It doesn't mean you're unstable or thing. It's just the way the sport goes. Sometimes you're neutralized, sometimes you're not. Um, I, it, but I feel you kind of have to wind up in that place that um, neither side is, is fully in control of what's happening. Mm -hmm. and games mm -hmm. are being won and lost, and then it gets out of control. Mm -hmm. And they're no longer able to stabilize, but um, I certainly hope it'll happen. <laughs> yeah, well, as Ding ponders his next move, we're going to go on a break, and you guys will have a chance to learn more about astronaut Talgat Musabayev, who made the ceremonial first move yesterday. Uh, he is the People's Hero of Kazakhstan. Enjoy it, guys. Welcome to Astana once again. We're right now in the playing venue where the game three has just ended. The match between Jan Pomnishi and Ding Liren is getting to heat up. And every day we have honorary guests coming here to make the first move for white. Today on the International Day of Human Space Flight, the people's hero of Kazakhstan, astronaut Talgat Musalbaev made the first ceremonial move at the FIDE World Chess Championship match. After some conversation with Jane Pomnishi, the honorary guest decided to play with E-Pawn, but soon he changed his mind and he moved D-Pawn to D4. That was exactly Jane Pomnishi's surprise today to Ding Liren in round three. Except of guessing the right moves, Mr. Musalbaev loves to play chess. In fact, he has been in space several times. One of his journey lasted for one year and he told us that one of his routine was to play chess in the space. We have a very interesting interview with him. Please take a look at that. Я начну с детства. Я в детстве очень много играл в шахматы. Ну вот в отряде космонавтов как такового сейчас значит предмета подготовки значит к полетам космонавтов нет. Вот раньше это в первом первом отряде космонавтов им значит давали основы. Вот потом отошли от этого, потому что очень загруженная подготовка. К первому полету идет человек приблизительно 8-10 лет. Это имея два высших образования, лед, инженерный. Вот, поэтому некогда, к сожалению, шахматами заниматься. Но я занимался шахматами ну, как любитель. Мы брали с собой в космос и шахматы, специальную доску намагниченную, чтобы шахматы фигурки не улетали, и иногда баловались. Но времени, к сожалению, очень мало у космонавта, чтобы заниматься вот таким приятным досугом. Корабль, он маленький, и в нем, значит, три человека еле-еле умещаются, как вы знаете. Но, значит, значит, а на станции, станция очень большая, и там есть возможность и игры, и другие игры, ну и шахматы в том числе. Я еще и на гитаре играл, с собой Возил гитару, играл и пел. Вот я знаю, что Гречка, Георгий Михайлович, мой э, старший друг, брат, значит, к сожалению, его уже с нами нет, он очень хорошо играл в шахматы. Вот, вот это я очень хорошо знаю. Да. Поляков, Валерий Владимирович, рекордсмен мира, первый человек, который э, практически выполнил теоретический полет на Марс и обратно по длительности полетов, находясь на станции, тоже хорошо играл в шахматы. Вот. Я вот этих людей могу
We are back and the players are speeding up as they realize that they still have to make around 20 moves before the time control. Um, they've each got under 40 minutes, so that's not a ton of time given that there is no increment. And therefore we've seen a couple of moves from them uh, in the span of a few minutes. So after a long, long think, Ding responded with a move bishop f3 here, which doesn't really surprise anyone. It was either this or the move knight f3, so he offers up the trade of bishops. And Nepo decides to start rerouting that knight. And Ding responds instead of the trade on h5, which, you know, and then putting the knight on f3, he decides to go rook e2, which is also looking very natural. Yes. Um, I'm wondering after bishop takes f3, mm -hmm. knight takes f3, if I play f6. Okay, so you're trying to exploit this pin. Yes. I think e6 is necessary. Mm -hmm. Then right. I just play knight d6. I don't know how solid this is. Um, if white swapped the knights, mm -hmm. then black's rooks have much less space to work with. Um, but I don't know if this is otherwise, if black plays g5 and queen g6 and just sits tight, mm -hmm. whether it's a stable situation or not. Very hard for me to tell. Yeah, interesting. Um, well, I guess I could just continue for now, maybe putting the rook here. I mean, it's hard to do without that move. So mm. let's start with that. And I am thinking that at some point I will want to reposition this knight as well in terms of where. I don't have amazing ideas, but perhaps knight d2, maybe knight e4. Of course, mm -hmm. I have to also watch out for your own maneuver. But maybe then I'm even happy to sack the exchange on d4 because uh, how mm -hmm. do you get past that e6, d5 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. wall yeah. for the black rook? So No, maybe f6. But what does he want? After rook e2, what, uh, what can Yan okay. be trying for? Rookie too. So, on balance, I, I think it's quite reasonable for white. Um, whether you play f6 or whether you play c6. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jan made a move, so we're going to see. f6 is, is it on F6? the board. Yep. Okay, I think now e6 and. Uh, yeah, there's not a whole lot of choice given that there's so many attackers on this pawn. Unless black is able to undermine very precisely this thing, uh, you know, d5, e6 is more mm -hmm. convincing than uh, any pressure you have on c4. So you're expecting maybe it's them a fortress, to go e6. but uh, yeah, e6, knight, d6. So he's not like in a hurry to trade these bishops yet, and white can't really do much with his bishop either, so it's understandable. And I suppose here we would just go rook a1. It would be quite similar. Hmm. I mean, I guess the question is, does white want him to get that trade, or is, is, is black actually going to try to avoid it? Because our bishop isn't the best either. Do you have an, any interest in avoiding this bishop trade, Vishen? Bishop g6, I was just thinking, because uh, now I cannot play knight e4, because you'll take with the bishop, and then maybe mm. that is much harder to break through. Yeah, because you're leaving me with my bad light squared. Mm. Bishop against your good blockading knight. So... But uh, in mm -hmm. after knight, if he plays knight d6, I think e6 has to be done. Question is, can s is there any d6 mm -hmm. trick? But I don't see it. Ah, you mean like some sort of trick with this yeah, move? That isn't there. Yeah, you just take, right? By the way, right now, I couldn't play rook a1 because you start with bishop f3. Mm -hmm. And I think your cons knight f3, fe5, mm -hmm. rook e5, rook e5. Rook e5, maybe just knight d6 there. Yeah. And basically, white has traded off their beautiful center. Yeah, this is and hard to believe. Don't have, they don't have quite enough. I mean, they can still try to like activate a little bit. I don't know if knight g5 is on the Yeah, knight g5 right. is, the, is the idea. Yeah. Can you neutralize queen and the knight? Knight d6, a queen e7, mm -hmm. uh, queen f6, queen takes c7, knight takes c4. Yeah, I I'm guess afraid it could go wrong for black. Let's put it that way. Yeah, here it seems like you're holding on. Right? You're h6 and you should hold. Queen a4. You want to get you your can't queen go to e5. to c6, yeah. 
No, I, I'm just asking you what yeah. you will do with your night. And if mm -hmm. 96, then I might go queen c6. You get like a just little, a poke little around, something. Just poke around yeah. here and there and see if something get, you get lucky. <laughs> yeah, okay, but still it's not super likely that white is going to want his e-pawn to get traded, mm. right? I so think e6 is more likely. Has he played? He's done. Oh, yeah, he's done. Not a difficult. Okay. Yeah, we tried to find some extra options here for white, but of course this is the most natural. So he goes e6, now black. I mean, I guess we got the answer to the viewer's question from earlier, how black is planning to improve mm. the knight on a5. So if he's, if he's still watching now, he gets to see that. And if you go bishop g6 now, mm -hmm. now I'm stopping knight e4. How do you break through? Yeah, so you're leaving me with this bad bishop. And you're saying, OK, that if I go here, you're just going to go back. Yes. That's your point. Yeah, my bishop is not amazing on f3, I have to say. But OK, I mean, let's go, let's go and do that. Mm -hmm. Bishop h5. And now I was thinking, since I don't one, yeah. need, yeah, I don't need to protect this pawn anymore with two of my rooks, I can afford to bring one of them back. Correct. And then next you could do bishop c2. Exactly. And, um, knight right. e4 maybe exactly. somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. That's the idea. OK, let me play knight d6. Mm -hmm. Bishop c2. And then c2. f3. OK, so. Maybe g3 is just better. Yeah, we, ne yeah, we need to have better. that move. And there's no tactical issues. We got a nice little attack going on that pawn. Yes. Oh, and by the way, I guess we should talk about if I take. Uh, he's given yeah. him the option of uh, exchanging bishops if he wants. So now I can play bishop takes mm -hmm. f5, queen takes f5, OK, e1. I would probably take it. Uh, I don't want to deal with that um, two pieces and that to one of them being this bishop on f3, it just mm -hmm. feels messy. So I would rather just take this uh, bishop off as fast as possible. Okay, you're saying that you're expecting white to make that trade right now? Yes. So trade, trade, and then just go here. Rook e1, no, rook f1 even. I, I mean, I'm threatening knight e4, I don't need that. So rook f1. Yeah, like this, right? No, sorry, uh, sorry, rook e2 to e1. Ah, e2, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know, there's no f rook even. Yes, but yes. I'm <laughs> saying rook f1. Uh -huh. Because it's the rook that started on f1. Uh -huh, and, but anyway. uh -huh. um, yeah. And uh, now. So, why don't you like the doubling of the rooks? What's wrong with it? Is you, you don't want there to be f3 or what? You want the rook to be. F3? I don't see why. I don't, why do I need the doubling? The e pawn, you can't protect it anymore. Uh -huh. You're thinking maybe put the rook on d1 at some yes, point. Yes, I want to play knight e4, and if you go knight f5, I want to go rook a d1 and say, uh -huh. come on. Oh, that come makes to d4. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Okay, so rook e1, and basically what you're trying to do is get the trade of the knight, which is blocking everything. Let's see what Ding He's gone rook e1 did. and didn't take the bishop. Okay. Boy, I'm doing well with my predictions here. <laughs> he not only didn't take the bishop, he brought the second rook. Okay. okay. Yeah, well, he does make a very natural move, but yeah, it is interesting. So I guess he's saying he wants the knight. I mean, he's not afraid of this maneuver because he can always put the knight on f3. Okay, so now the big question for black is, does black want to avoid the bishop trade? Yeah, it is interesting that Ding decided to kind of, well, maybe he thought, you know, Vichy, that since black did not trade himself, that Nepo was just not very inclined to that bishop trade, and therefore he's kind of leaving it there as an option on purpose. But Nepo's gone to f5. Yeah, okay. Does he seriously want to allow that exchange sack? So knight, e four, knight f5, okay, okay, he's being lured to the d4 square. So now, well, OK, I mean, is taking okay, a knight I take, f3? I, no, no, I take, take and rook e4. Because I wanted uh -huh. to ask you about your f4 pawn, how are you going to defend it? OK. Yeah, and rook e4. Yes. I feel like you got more excited about this position suddenly when you saw this pawn hanging. Yes. Yeah, OK, so you can't push it anymore. It's, that's out of the question. So knight d4 doesn't, uh, knight d4 hits something. But you really want to make this exchange sack, huh? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you do it, Vishy, so we can yeah, see this take idea. It, take, take it, take it. it. Take it just to show people that you know the point is that if you can't take, well, By you the can way, I could, take. I could go on knight b3 as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, basically the idea is that there's some kind of fork, so we're getting rid of the knight. And let's evaluate this position. Pawns are even. White has a knight. Black has a rook. 
But of White course, has a pawn mm -hmm. on e6. Yes. That, I would like to emphasize that one. Yeah, yeah, that pawn makes a big difference in the evaluation here. And so you would like to say that's this That's not shape. just a pawn. Yeah, what is that? That's it's like, a big guy. It's a big guy there, OK. You'll, that's so, the Statue of Liberty standing over there. Right, you know. leading the way to freedom for white. <laughs> that's my only hope, <laughs> otherwise I'm busted. <laughs> but anyway, that pawn, that I get, pawn to, I get okay. to look at the Statue of Liberty pretty often <laughs> um, in New York. Um, so, yeah. And so, yeah, so you're saying that these rooks are pretty helpless. Yes, I, the, you, it might be possible for you to undermine with rook uh, d8 and c6, but still, even knight b1, c3, and I, it's it's a rock out there, and I'm going to do stuff. Uh, and Ding has taken the bishop. Behind that, yeah. Is he going to go for your rookie four move? I really think he will. Yes. I really think that's what's going to happen after Nepo comes back to the board, plays queen h5. Just I mean, rookie four, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. not he's not going to go knight f3 trying to stop knight d4. He's By the gonna, way, rookie four. Mm -hmm. Knight d4. I also mm -hmm. have knight b3. Knight b3. So basically just offering up a trade, and then you're stuck with these passive rooks. I Correct. mean, I agree. That also if looks very reasonable. If knight takes b3, queen b3, and I'm going to win the f4 pawn. You cannot. Uh, mm. Ah, no. If I go queen b3. Why do you want to go with the queen instead of the pawn? I thought a b3, a5 might be a. But OK, a b3, mm. a5. He went for it. Rookie four is on the board. Yeah, a b3. And now you cannot even defend that pawn. Uh, I know you can. You can go queen f5. Uh, but then, you know, in the ending, I'm going to win with king a4, b5, c6. Mm. OK, so let's, let's go through that again. So you're saying knight b3, and that's why you're taking with the queen, so that you can, I don't know. No, uh, I mean, that mark wasn't entirely serious. But uh, let's try. Yeah, I, I, I heard something about this king, Vichy, coming here in the end in game. The end game. Yeah. Yeah. That's a little um, far away, but for now, OK. So okay, queen b3, Queen maybe, b3. Yeah. And so you want to win this pawn back. You're definitely going to have to The problem is after queen f5, you're going to get g5, and I don't see how I'm going to win that pawn. But um, Yeah, you're saying that after this and this, that it's actually not that easy to win it. Although, I mean, OK, white's pawns still look really impressive, especially without the blockading knight. Um, yeah, g4, you just step back with your queen. No big deal. It, it's not trivial to break through, but mm -hmm. um, uh, black is threatening nothing. But, but hold on, though, Vishy, though. We still have to talk about this idea some more. Yes, because, yes. yeah, we, I mean, right. that's the white's big, um, that is white's big alternative to knight b3 is to take the also knight. Also, the question is, should I have taken on f4 and allowed you to go sack it on e2 right. or take it this way? But let's go with this one. I, I prefer to get rid of the c pawn. Yeah, so that you know, may, maybe one day after knight b1, c3, there's more options for mm -hmm, me here. Mm -hmm. All right. go queen f5 or something? So queen f5 to protect the pawn. I guess uh, I want to play knight b1, c3 in some way because um, OK, Nepo is ready with his move. What are we going to see? Queen h6. OK. Here we go. Let us and take a look at this move. He's not allowing the exchange sack. And that okay, kind of makes f3, sense. Mm -hmm. But then knight d4, and that's a problem. Because mm -hmm. if queen it f4, then I think queen takes uh, Rook takes, rook d8 is probably much better for black. I'll, when I break c6 now, uh, mm -hmm. it's much harder for you to hold that front. Yeah, you're saying I can't hold those pawns at all. Yes. Wow, really? Like, there's nothing I can do? Like, knight of three doesn't allow me to hold anything? This might happen, by the way, because he did play yes, queen f3. Right. OK, knight d4. Maybe I would take on d4. Mm -hmm. C D four knight B three. Let's just put that on the board. Oh, which where? Um, queen F three knight D four. Mm -hmm. So way back here. Yeah, knight D four. You want to just take it? Mm -hmm. C D four knight mm -hmm. B three. So I'm threatening knight D four knight C six. Obviously, if mm -hmm. you go C five, I go D C six. C5 to just, you know. Yeah, and now D takes C6. And I can't take because of the pin. Correct. Mm -hmm. And you want to just take here and have Correct. a nice position. And put my queen will be a big pawn when and I go D5. queen D5. Yeah, yeah it's going to be a beautiful. In fact, I was wondering if rook D8 here. 
Are you, I think are you seriously thinking seven, about no? <laughs> yes, yes, I was. Uh, I wanted to point out that queen d5 is legal. It's legal. And then go for d6. Yeah. But I think knight d4 might be better. Yeah, just to go. Also, c7, rook takes c7, e7, and queen d5, f7 might be winning. So You're it's, saying uh, c7, yeah, c7, rook c7, rook c7, rook c7, rook c7 sorry, yeah, e7, and, and then queen d5. Over. and Okay, you're basically invading right here, and you're going to get that yeah, and if queen f8. Yeah, king h8. Yeah. No, not queen f7, because you have rook c8, but queen d8 is going to win. Yeah. Queen d8. And that's game over. And what a nice touch, hitting these two rooks yeah. and getting ready for this. So he's gone queen f3, and knight d4 is a blunder. Because takes takes knight mm -hmm. to three, knight b three has got to be good for me. Okay, so we. Okay, he just he just went knight d four. I'm going to look like a genius, and I'm going to look pretty blank at the end of this. But hold on. come on, rook takes d four, knight d three. Hold on, hold on. Knight d four is on the board. So you're saying, just sack the exchange. That's going to be, you know, an amazing. Just do it. Ding. Yeah, it's going to be an amazing um, image. You know, uh, like the opposite of the second game where Nepo was the one who made the exchange sack. And mm. in this game, Ding has a chance to make a winning exchange sack. Well, winning is like at least what well, we're hoping this move uh, But uh, did you notice is. the last few moves, Yan has been blitzing? Yes. He didn't bother with the, he didn't even consider bishop g6. Mm, yeah. Trying because we he thought that blitzing. was a real fortress uh, element, yeah. keeping the light squared bishops. He didn't bother with, uh, uh, and he just charged up to d4. And I think rook d4, yeah. c d4, knight b3, how are you evaluating this? For me, it looks overwhelming. Yeah, well, you know, he he, he might Just have uh, been playing quickly, but he's not actually up on time against Ding. They're about at the same time on the clock. Maybe it's just because there's no increment and he's also in a hurry. Also, it's move 28, and now yeah. he has he's back to three minutes per move. So why is he blitzing? Look at Ding. Look at that posture. That's the posture of someone who who sees something and is trying to figure it out, right? Bingo. Yes. Yes. Bingo, it's over. Wow, hold on. Game over, I think. Ding just went for it. So the exchange sack and Nepo looks a little bit surprised. Looks a little bit taken aback by that. But he's got to have seen knight b3 now. Sure. And knight b3, so is the point. And are. basically your knight, well, if you get the pawn and you get your knight in here, then it's definitely game over. Well, Ding's walking away. Yeah, Ding's walking away. Um, yeah, feeling pretty good about his position. They, 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 this was insane. I don't think... Uh, uh, Jan's position was so terrible just three moves ago. He just right. went knight f5, knight d4, everything without thinking. Yeah, it's true. The it's things nuts. have gone downhill so quickly for him. I mean, yeah. we did not predict this at all. Okay, so now let's see. I mean, how can this pawn be protected, right? Now, it's not many ways when you have two rooks like that and a queen on the side of the board. Yeah, you let the knight come here. It's definitely a game over. So this was the only chance. And so the line that we were looking at, also, surprisingly, maybe is relevant. Also, maybe d6 is resigned. Yeah. Wait a minute. Just, just let's just rule out d6, and d6. then we can stop. We can go home. And it's just yeah. rook e6, yeah, uh, takes, queen takes, queen d5. And, uh, and that's then promote game over your as well. pawn. Oops, yeah, promote the pawn. Yes, and uh, queen here. Yeah. Or d7 wins because d6. I have queen a8, e8 mate. This is... Uh, wow. Like, even that move wins, huh? The queen is I mean, completely if, out if, of the game. If Yen uh, loses this game, I'm going to say he squandered it. He squandered a lead for nothing, and uh, the problems were not so great. He was, his mm. position was quite reasonable even a few moves ago, I think. I was finding it very hard to break this pattern and go forward. And uh, it's suddenly in three moves, here we are. Oops. I keep. Here we go, all the way to Last E8. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's amazing how quickly And this is the look of a man who has missed something. Oh, yes. So knight b3 and... Uh, I think Ding can't believe this. Oh, Ding has put knight b3 on the board, and yes. he left the board, yeah. Wow, so the, what do we think were the key mistakes from, from Nepo? Because up to this point, okay, his move f6 seemed normal, knight d6 improving the knights, right? Um, well, you know, we were considering keeping the light squared bishops on the board because this bishop is not amazing. And uh, the white rooks are stuck as well. And mm -hmm. it, uh, if you go knight b1, I can take the with the bishop. I think I'd rather have knight versus bishop in the end. But um, so that was my reasoning. This so is so this crazy. this is where it started to kind of go in the wrong direction, Correct. right? He allowed takes, this takes. trade and the attack on the pawn, and then we already could feel some danger. Yeah, I mean, it, I was initially trying to take on f4, but then suddenly yeah. I saw knight b3, and I said, let's just take, and then boom, it happens. And, I mean, his move queen h6. I mean, it, the queen winds up being absolutely horrible here. Correct. So, I mean, you could have even played knight d4. Knight d4 is at least like a better version. Because the, it's version. the queen on d4, not the knight. Right. And that itself would have been, 
well, harder to crash. I yeah. mean, I was playing knight b1, c3. What I should have right, been doing is right. moving so the queen and bringing knight b3, d4 anyway. So Yeah, so we were looking at rook d4 here, pawn <coughs> takes queen d4, and at least this version, yeah, it's not quite so devastating because maybe this knight yeah. is not so good. But so what we were thinking about here, Vishti, like this position, how did we evaluate this? I didn't quite know. I mean, I, I was shuffling my knight here and there, and I felt, mm -hmm. but you're hiding behind the spawn wall. How can it possibly be wrong? Yeah, but instead of that, he just went with... Queen h6, the worst queen possible H6, way to execute this. Yes. Queen f3. That felt very strange, this move, queen h6, I yes. have to say, because the decentralization of that queen was suspicious. And then... Even here, I could yeah. have gone back to d6. Mm -hmm. Rook takes e4, mm -hmm. and then played um, f5. Mm, you want to trap my rook somewhere, Correct. maybe, but... Well, even there, there'll be an exchange act, yeah. possibly, but uh, if you go queen e3, then I go g5 and f4 But already and queen here, f6 it's starting to look bad, though, for black, right? I yes. mean, here, here we can't really say black is feeling too good. That is true. Yeah. So and it always comes back to these pawns on d5, e6. Even at the end, you win an exchange. I've got d5 and e6, so... Yeah, so, I mean... Basically, once he allowed this and this pawn was hanging, like what options did he have? I mean, was there was there still g5, is she? And maybe then backtrack with yes. the knight to d6? Because you get queen g6, you get a rook mm -hmm. g7, you, and your king can wander to e7 in some end game. You know, it's... Yeah. No, uh, Nepo looks so unhappy. No, I think, you know, first of all, Kramnik is going to be right. It's going to yes, be an up and down up match. And down match. Yeah. You know, well, now neither, I think we, we yeah. have a very good chance of up and down match because both sides will have tasted blood. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did not expect it to disappear so fast. Yeah, well, you should have expected, Vishy, for the players to give you a parting gift. You know, you know you're leaving Astana in a couple of days. So, you know, it's nice to see some exciting chess before, before you go. And we got... So yeah, if g5 here, what do we do for white? I just try to get back with my knight. It's still a reasonable move. I don't... Uh, yeah, it doesn't seem... I mean, I can't play g3 because of queen Nine takes, queen takes h3, h3. I h3, uh-huh. I mean, knight d6, gf4, maybe I'm even happy, but uh, queen takes h3. If gf4, you take and you go hit g4 and... Mm -hmm. So you're saying, on. okay, this move you take, Take queen takes f3. Queen takes f3. Knight, knight f3, f3 and g4. And, g4 and, and suddenly I have h5, rook g7, knight d6. Uh, yeah, pieces of definitely scanning, still nicely, still yeah. unbalanced, right? So, so basically, I mean, this move, um, knight d4, is really a bit of a shocker that yes. he went for this so quickly. What was his point? After queen takes f4, he just evaluated this, and probably c6 and rook d8 or mm. rook d8 and yeah, b5. Yeah, you were talking about that. He just that. thought, I'm yeah. going to undermine everything and get out. You can just go c6 here, yeah? yeah I guess that was the idea that you're going to go and pile up on that pawn. c6, I can't take and move the knight. No, no, I can't. No, it's, this one works. Oh man, Ding, Ding looks so satisfied with his position. Ding, he knows he's equalizing, and he, you know you can just see it in his face. So, and I, I just you know can't imagine the boost of confidence this is going to give him. Yeah, it's a it's a gift to be honest to have suddenly an opponent uh, fall apart like this. Mm. Um, but I mean, do you think it's more more of a gift than what he gave to Nepo in the second game? I mean, it wasn't like that game was much of a struggle from him either. You can compare these things. I know just the emotional effect. It feels like my game with Boris because uh, mm. uh, a match which was suddenly looking uh, almost hopeless suddenly comes back to life, and uh, mm -hmm. and Boris blundering a piece in 17 moves is not your everyday <laughs> thing. Mm -hmm. So you know you you feel you got a, a gift, and um, you're not. I mean, I wasn't even sure if I fully deserved that, but uh, you know I'm back in the match, and um, for Ding. It was looking very grim just a day ago, and now uh, he'll go into this rest day uh, super happy. So question, does anyone have a worse poker face than Nepo? Well, he is very expressive, Vishy, isn't he? He is expressive. Um, I want to make some quip about uh, some poker hands being so bad that no face can save them anymore. but. Uh, What's yeah. the point of pretending in this position? Ding is too yeah. strong not to know the evaluation. Right. It's, it's <laughs> not like Ding doesn't know that he wants to take the pawn and get his yeah. knight in here. 
and man. he can evaluate a C4, D5, E6 yeah. versus F6, F4, G7. You know what, what I think is really surprising here is that actually this is not a deep calculation. This is really not like, you know, too high level, the idea that like, okay, white can sack the rook for the knight. Mm. I mean, we've known this knight has been strong for a while. White's already we've talked about sacking the rook for the knight on many different occasions. And so this is like an obvious try. And then what, what did he miss? Like he just missed a knight b3 I think here? It, yeah. Sometimes you just blitz a move, uh, you know, putting a knight on d4 feels yeah. like, it's not that you miss rook d4, c d4, knight b3. It's that mm -hmm. you miss that uh, knight. g5. Yeah, it's a little late. It's a little late for that idea, but yeah. he's trying G6. it now. Maybe yeah, we Queen shouldn't G6. Uh, laugh too much. Because um, he's going H5, He's going to go H5, G4. G4. There's going to be one last uh, Hail Mary. Mm -hmm. And uh, You know what's really interesting here is like if we try to get something to F5. How, G4? Yeah, even via G4, like if you go there and H5 and Queen here, does that make sense? Yes. Because um, because cause if I wind up putting my knight here and you just move your rook away, my knight is Well, then not what I wanted much. to do was to take on a7, come mm -hmm. back to b5, sack on c7, and go d6. But mm. maybe that's a bit slow. You're right. Uh, it might be worth putting in the effort to go g4. I mean. g4 is good. Yeah, so queen g4. No, g4. Oh, g4, g4 you want me to play. I was thinking of. Queen oh, g4, okay. maybe. Uh -huh. but, um, g4, interesting. Oh, I wasn't even thinking about that. OK, like that. Yeah. It's not over because I'll play h5, but I, maybe I could even toss in gh5 there and then go queen g4, knight f5 mm -hmm. or something. And if you can't play h5, then what have you got? Yeah, so if you go, yeah, because unfortunately the queen does not have a square in the h file that is normal, right? And then I just go queen g4. Yeah, here. and then the knight gets in and yeah, it looks very good for ding. Um, and if you don't G4's have a that. tough decision uh, yeah. to make. You kind of want the position to play by itself. You don't mm. open on the side, but maybe it's worth... Uh, what about something like queen a3 with the idea uh, queen takes a7? Mm. And you know, I'm just trying to get the pawn mass through, but. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, f I, I really like this move. Yes. I mean, I just think that landing a knight there, that has to be. Ah, the right you know what I want to do? Queen mm -hmm. a3 and c5. So that you play bc5, I go queen c5. And I think that mm -hmm. is also an improvement. Interesting. But if by the time you've gotten g4 on the side, you start to feel. Slightly yeah, I really want to like preempt your counterplay on the king side. So like, G4 so if you take is good, is good. Yeah, FG, uh, FG and I mean, there's not much you can do to stop this knight from getting here. And it's actually interesting that although you have this whole open diagonal, there's not a single square. Right? Exactly, right? So I mean, if you get your knight here, you don't have to worry about your king side. And I think, yeah, you're gonna absolutely squash Black's counterplay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I would do, Vishy. I mean, if I saw the move G4, I would feel oh, very making comfortable it? Sorry, making it. it. Yeah, not. You're right. Um, yeah. G4, once you get past the initial yeah. hesitation, I think it becomes obvious it's the right move. Because we're, as a bonus, we're stopping H5 initially. Mm. Yeah, like you don't even have to go knight of 5 and allow that rook to escape. You just go G takes H5. You just take it. Right. You force the queen back, and then you settle in on these light squares. Right. Yeah, that's a beautiful move. And actually, it's quite beautiful because you're, you've got all these pawns on the light square, great control of the light squares, mm. and this really reinforces it. Yeah. So that's what, that's what we're expecting Ding to play. Look at him. He's like comparing his lines, going like that, um, kind of bobbing his head. And yeah, he seems really excited. I think he just did it. Yay. Yes, All right, G4. applause for Ding. He went for G4. No, but he's acting like a man who, you know, who sees he's going for the kill. And yes. It's, it's, you know, when some positions are so good that you feel you can even start playing faster and everything, you know, you yeah. just kind of think. Well, I guess that he's going to be. This match has sprung right back to life. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing how two days ago everything seemed so dismal. And, uh, and just two days later, it's, um, it's going to be Ding's turn to taste victory. Yeah. In fact, would you even bother taking that rook? I would leave the knight on f5 as long as I could. I got to read you something, Vishy, before our session today is over. It's a book, a book I'm reading um, on Kazakhstan. And this is, the book starts with a little poem by the Kazakh poet Abai. Mm -hmm. And he says, in, in translation to English, it says, who has not encountered misfortune? To lose hope is spineless. Truly, nothing in the world is immutable. How can you say that misfortune lasts forever? 
is not a harsh winter with thick snow, followed by a good summer with thick grass and bountiful lakes. It's beautiful, isn't it? And I feel like yes. it kind of um, goes well with what Ding is experiencing so far in this match. Very much. That's a beautiful way to put it as well. Uh, you know, the seasons will change, and yes. next year will be beautiful, so you have to move on. Yeah, I mean, so he basically lost the first mini match, and he's winning the second mini match. And, you know, the match is blasted wi wide open. So FG3 let's see. FG3 and H5 and by an FO. You clearly don't want to volunteer G4, so let me go Knight F5. Mm -hmm. I think he just did it. Knight F5. And if he goes G4, you can go Queen E4 mm. uh, and play H4. So then you have sealed that, oh, uh, very nice. that window as well. Let's just show that idea, because I, I think. Or you could even go hit G4, hit G4, Queen E4, mm. and um, shift your rook up to G4, F4, or rook E2, H2. So yeah, but hold on one second, Vishy. Let's just paralyze all of Black's pieces. Yeah. So you're threatening to, to take that rook, win the queen, and I whenever. Guess you're F8. Yeah, whatever you do something. And then, like, I mean, this queen literally cannot move. Like, when He's are you ever. He's going to rook at 7, okay? Yeah, when are you ever going to see a piece that cannot move like that? So. All right, he's gone rook h7. Now what should I do? Queen e4? Queen e4 does threaten 97. 97. Yeah. yeah, that's not a bad idea. And basically that way, either way you push the pawn, I'm going to be able to close up lines on the king side, right? Correct. I don't think he's going to close with h4, so g4 is the best mm -hmm. uh, shot. And um, yeah. But true, we now get to the point where how are you going to clinch this? Mm -hmm. How are you going to shut this mm -hmm. down? I could play g4 here uh, because you have no way to double on the h file. But mm -hmm. it feels risky to try this, to volunteer this, right? Yeah, to play g4 and open up like the h file for this rook, it definitely feels a little strange. Well, okay, let's see how we're going to break through. So right now your queen is trapped. You have to move your king somewhere, right? Where do you want to move your king? I think it's some uh, like king here. Yeah, and then let me, if I do c5, b c5, rook c1, can you take that seriously? Just to play rook take c5 and break through. There's still some work to be done, isn't it? Mm. You, it's a one position, but you've got to win it. Yes. Okay, let's try to find the way that we're going to break through here. I mean, it's not as simple as playing e7, right? Because then you kind of give up the f7 square to them. E7 looks good to me, mm -hmm. then you can but I wouldn't play it that easily. For D6. It right. feels... Uh, okay, so like, let's say I do go here. You know, I could also start taking my king out, go king F2, mm -hmm. king E3, D4 or something, and uh, put it on the queen side, and rook F1. This is... Uh, black is completely closed. Yeah, He's they don't have squares, anything to missing, do. Uh, things, so king E2, E3 looks lovely to me. Wow, just that level of patience just bringing out your yeah. king. Because in G4, H4, you don't have G5, you don't have H6, you don't have E7, you don't have G7. Your mm. pieces are squashed, and you cannot play C6 easily. So basically, but okay, so you're saying that there's just no knockout blow that we can find? Because it would be nice to find something a little bit more What flashy. is Black's knockout blow? Is he going to play B5? Is he going to play C6? He can't play C6 with mm. a D6. B5 makes no sense because I'll play C5. Yeah. You have no moves. Why should I touch my thing? I'll just go king f2 no. e3. No, okay. okay I, get, I, I see your yeah. point. Yeah, just kind of put I mean, I was also initially trying to force battle, but now I see. Yes. Let's just uh, go with the king, right? So king f2, and you're saying black basically has no moves. This king can't move. This rook can't move. Uh, this rook doesn't really want to move either. Can you technically move this rook, Vishy? Can it go somewhere? Like, I don't know, just some random square. King e3. Maybe I will take my king to c6 after all. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> not, well, well, not with the queen. Yeah, but <laughs> e7 and back, and we got kind of an extra tempo. Can we use that? I mean. You want to go about queen e6? Yeah, maybe use that tempo, maybe get the queen here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are getting very short of squares, short on squares for these pieces. And then eventually, maybe I can play. Yeah, I can actually, once I come here, I'll be collecting stuff. Well, but you'll have to protect the g yeah, in some way, either yeah. with g4 or something. I don't touch. Why do you want to touch that pawn? I'll just move the king up to c3 or whatever, and then I can slowly think of a winning plan. Rook f1 followed by c5. Mm -hmm. The rook is protecting the knight. Everybody's protecting everybody, you know. Because I don't even need a queen floating around there. 
Uh, if my rook is in f1 mm -hmm. and my queen goes to a4, that's great progress. I'm forcing you to weaken your pawns even more. They've got 20 minutes each for about six moves. Um, so that's not, not a big deal. They, they will both be able to make that. That's not uh, time control. Yeah. Um, Rishchuk mm -hmm. doesn't consider it time trouble uh, on over a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any suggestions in general on how to convert a winning position when it's not super obvious how to win it? Uh, be patient and uh, <laughs> don't blow it, I guess. Take away all your opponent's counterplay? There is no foolproof method. There's always some lapse of concentration, things like that in the air. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, uh, concentrate, double check everything, take your time. Um, because this, it, it hardly gets better. Black has no counterplay at all. So don't forget that at some point, when you open mm -hmm. the position, black might actually have some, uh, one move that was not possible before. You know, go through this usual checklist, but uh, it's not difficult. I think anything with patience. Queen e4, and like I said, the king to the queen side is lovely. What else could he be thinking about? I mean, because he doesn't really want to allow this move, does he? I don't even think g4 is good for black because it'll simply allow me more squares. My, I can go king h2, um, collect the h3 pawn, go rook f1, f4. It gives mm. me extra squares. You're saying that even if they go here, we just go like queen But f4. now I'm f seized by this urge just to shut things down. Mm -hmm. Queen e4, and uh, whichever pawn move you make, I make the opposite one, and then I'm, I'm not exchanging. Because I can laugh at your rooks. They just uh, they make no sense on h7 and e8. All right, so let's try again. Queen e4, king h8, and we just go king f2. Yeah. Yes. Developing some counter here, counterplay here for black is a tall order. Um, yeah, I think the only plan is like moving around these rooks. Maybe can I try to bring my queen yes. somewhere back? Uh, I was just thinking of that, but I thought that uh, as long as for queen e8, I can meet with queen d4. And uh, when you come back to g6, uh, if I have a rook on f1, then uh, even that little bit of counterplay is uh, snuffed mm. out. So what, what are you so saying So instead here? of king f2, I could start with rook f1. Let's just uh, okay, be more let precise. emphasize the point. So now if you run away with the rook, I just mm -hmm. go queen d4, make a move. So you protected your knight, so you can move your queen, and you're tying me down from even playing yeah, that. And I'm going to do rook f2 if I want. Mm. And then king f1, e1, I can do that. I have the luxury of doing anything, anything. I want. Anything, yeah. So well, he's following. And now you can't, your f6 pawn means you're not going to be able to move anything, so. Yeah, he's following um, our analysis, and he just played queen e4. So we're expecting Nepo to come back and move his king over so that he avoids the losing uh, discovery with knight e7 that is being planned. And Ding has also left the board. So, okay, here, rook f1 is your finesse. Just to be able to play queen d4. Mm. And um, I like my queen sitting on c3 because I can go to a3, come back, mm -hmm. something here and there. So. Yeah, so if we go here, here, and okay, if I sit, I know I sit in place, Vishy. Sure. So it's like I it's mean, hard to push are, these pawns through. Yes, but I'll just go rook f2. Mm -hmm. Once my king is on b2, then it'll be time to sort of push those pawns. Also, I can play g4 with a clear conscience then. And that frees up the rook to play mm. things. Uh, it's just, I can't see how. Yeah, OK. So I mean, basically, he's stuck like, um, OK, moving things around. Did he play king h8? He did. He, did. he played it instantly as he got to the board. Black's moves are easy now. There's yeah. nothing to be done. Because there's no plan. You know, it's easy to play. Yeah with no plan. So rook f1 is one option. What other options do we have? We looked at king f2, rook f1. I could also sit with rook e3, a3, provoke that a5 move, um, move somewhere else. Mm. But you know, even an open b file, uh, why do it is more or less my reasoning. Yeah, let's just show people why it's not so easy to just like push mm -hmm. through the pawns, right? Because I think that's maybe what is on everyone's mind. Uh, so basically, this allows like queen f7, right? Stopping maybe queen but e6. But then d6 wins. d6, and then you're going to hit the queen in the end with a check. 
I think we're going to try to prove. There we Why go. Why is not good? Yeah. <laughs> prove that it clinches well, that's my specialty <laughs> this year. I didn't say we have to be consistent here. Um, so yeah, we set out to prove why this is bad, but we discovered why it was good. Um, okay, so go ahead, let's try something other than queen f7. I mean, you don't have a whole lot of other moves, must be said. Yeah, I'm threatening queen e6, and uh, yeah. then you don't have a move, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's good to ask ourselves, why can't pass pawns be pushed? Hmm. I do really like the idea of getting that queen in. Yeah, it's a very direct approach, right? I was a little cons concerned about this, but really, yeah, if I get that fork in the end, um, oh yeah, we should really show the details of why this works. Um, also, uh, put the pawn back on d6, yeah, mm -hmm. because on 98. Yeah, games, 98, yeah. that's... Also, queen d4 and rook e6 becomes an option. Uh, queen d4 here. Queen d4 right here. Uh -huh. And the uh, next move, uh, rook e6. Rook e6, yeah. And then how you're going to um, contort yourself trying to defend this... Uh, uh, yes. F pawn. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, queen uh, g6, I can meet with rook e6 simply. Uh, so this is. I see somebody is asking why they have so many rest days, Vishy, because it seems, you know, maybe exorbitant to people who don't understand uh, why the players need to have a rest day after two um, days of play. Did you see what Ding just did? He did e7. Instantly. Okay. okay, very good, nice. Good boy. There we go. That pawn. So, I mean, it's not going to be a long maneuvering win no. for white. Now it's going to be a lot more direct. Yeah, so why do players need so many rest days? Um, one of the problems if you don't have rest days, if uh, people don't have enough time to refresh um, opening at tries, as I said, it's very easy to get neutralized and then. Uh, a uh, couple of games you can just get stuck. Mm. Um, we already see that by the end of the matches, sometimes people don't have serious tries mm -hmm. left and they don't want to gamble uh, with the match tied, uh, so they just dash into the tie break. There's a good argument for removing rest days, but um, the question is how you would do it. Maybe you could do four games in a rest day or something like that. But it is exhausting. You can't squeeze them too much more. Uh, maybe a rest day every two days comes to what five plus some rest days for the tie break and so on. So we, and then we get a rest day between eleven and twelve. This was the old format. Um, we could drop it down to four maybe, but the players do need to recover a bit. There's um, uh, there's often the work. Um, yes, and this time the rest days on either side of game seven. Mm -hmm. But we have this problem that um, um, you want the players to recover and be able to play an interesting game of chess. Yeah, you want them not to just be completely physically exhausted. Correct. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And also, I mean, the rest day is And also, not in a sense, mm -hmm. technically exhausted. You don't want to find them in a situation where they don't have any ideas to play, and they're just yeah. pottering around uh, uh, experimenting wildly. Yeah. Uh, you know, you'd like them to have time to come up with some serious tries and put pressure. In the long run, it rewards the uh, fans better because you actually get to watch something with content. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect we could shave off one but I don't know how low you can go because people do need to recover. Yeah, and I mean, the players are not exactly luxuriating in their rest day either, unfortunately. Like when Nepo was asked about his rest day, it was basically like, I'll just be reviewing lines, review, Correct. review, Absolutely. review. Absolutely, don't, uh, uh, nobody's sitting on the beach. Yeah, which is, in a way, it's too bad because I don't know, it might, it might, sometimes it might help you more to sit on the beach. Yes, um, I, I think if you can step away for a while, it might be thing. Because in the end, uh, so much of the stuff you keep revising doesn't even happen. Mm -hmm. So you might as well cut yourself some slack and say, the hell with it. Uh, but typically, people will do that. Like, once their position is desperate or uh, they lost a game and they think, I don't care anymore. I'm just going to do what makes me feel good. And sometimes it even works out. Yeah. Um, I mean, not for a match, but Levon once said uh, he, he was so disgusted with his play, he took a book and didn't uh, prepare the whole morning. He just read the book the whole day. And then he won easily. So, um, well, all Levon stories end like that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, his they have point, a nice his point ending, is yeah. valid. <laughs> I mean, have you ever done something like that, Vishy? Just you know, decided to blow off the preparation and do something um, to re to relax in a different way. Um, not in the matches that I played in the second thing. No, not really. Once in New York, a couple of times I went to visit uh, friends in New Jersey. Mm. Uh, so, you know, Ken Thompson used to live in New Jersey mm -hmm. then. And he's, uh, so I, one day I was so disgusted with my play that I 
took off went there. That was a nice change when I came back. But you also come back and suddenly realize that uh, your problems didn't go away. So. so when Gary decided to play the dragon in that match, was that a big shock to you? I didn't expect it. But um, if um, I had, I mean, my idea was to play something sensible, um, have a small, you know, you almost pretend to be pressing, mm -hmm. and then to go home and calmly look at it. And mm -hmm. if I hadn't blundered at the end of the game, uh, the whole yeah. story would be different. As it looks, it uh, as it happened, it looked like some stroke of genius. But in fact, uh, it's only the last blunder that made it look <laughs> so ridiculous. All right, so Nepo needs to come up with something here. But it's very hard to stop this move, especially because you can't really move your queen. Um, well, I don't know. What about uh, queen g8? Am I really going to suggest that? Queen g8, then again, uh, queen d4. I, this is the other move mm. I want to make. Right. Because Just if you go, go queen g6, mm -hmm. I can go rook e6. Oh, that's a beautiful line. Because if queen takes f5, rook takes f6, and there's a discovery, and you'll never be able to. If queen b1 check, I have rook f1 check. Mm -hmm. Oh. And that's, that's the problem pretty. for you. That is pretty. Yes. You win the queen. And if you go queen takes f6, rook takes f6. Uh-huh. Uh, queen takes f6, and you go king, uh, no, king g8, queen g6 yeah. wins. You go rook mm -hmm. g7, and the mm -hmm. easiest is queen f8. Uh, uh, rook g7 and queen f8. Queen f8, rook g8, and oh, queen oh, f6. Oh, and a beautiful mate. mate. Yeah, so it all works out. Yeah. Well, He's gone queen f7, mm -hmm. and now's a great time to switch queen d4. So, wait, we also said d6 is winning, though. Yes, that is true. Yeah, so he can guide the go for the really direct win. I mean, this one tries to just go for the throat right away. Because you're threatening to push. He's got to take. I mean, he's just going to be down a piece, isn't he? Yes. I mean, this. I, I can't yeah, argue this. Yeah, this, uh, this is a clear piece. I don't think there's anything really that unclear. I don't know. Maybe no. he's thinking about this end game. He has one pawn for the knight. He has four pawns, and uh, f6 is going to drop. I mean, the, the danger of um, not winning because you have no pawns left is not real anymore. Yeah, you don't so. think this is going to be a big technical? No. Especially because this king is completely. And the worst thing is, f6 cannot even be defended. Yeah, and this um, king is completely cut off in like yeah. the worst possible place. Yeah, so Ding could go for that, or he could go for the slower build up with queen d4, rookie Ah, six. sorry, for queen g8, I was doing queen d4. So yes, anyway, yes. But, but, but yeah, I do win. think d6 is, is, I mean, I feel like someone who wants to get their first win in the match is going to go for the most direct route that is Well, Ding Loren is uh, double checking d6 for sure. Yeah. I mean, when, at which point would you throw in the towel for Nepo? I mean, would that move make you resign, or in a world championship I don't know. Match? You Sometimes you. You play some moves out of inertia. Yeah. Also, you trick yourself by telling yourself that <coughs> till I resign, I'm still ahead in the match, though effectively it's gone. Um, some people resign early, some people resign late. Some people do it both in different games. You know, it doesn't matter. Well, while we're waiting to see what uh, Ding is going to choose here, I had a question for you, Vishy. Um, a little bit of a chess question. So both of these players actually reached the 2700 level when they were age 20. So they have that in common. Mm -hmm. And it took them actually quite a different number of years to reach the 2750 level, to cross that threshold. Um, actually, it took Nepo a very long time, like six years of being in that range before he finally crossed 2750. Ding did it in like two and a half years. I mean, when you reach 2700 these days, what's the next significant threshold that shows that you're a better player, right? Because like if you're 2720 or 2700, it doesn't feel like it's a difference. When you're preparing against someone, Vichy, at which point do you know this is like um, a different level of chess player? I would say it's a process of getting to 50 points without falling, you know, two steps forward, one step back is probably the best, most you can permit yourself. And ideally you want to be even more consistent than that. So uh, when you get to 2700, after that, or even 2650, every stage after that is about consistency. Mm -hmm. uh, fewer defeats, more wins. I mean, it sounds very banal, but Fewer defeats, fewer unnecessary defeats, fewer slip-ups, more of everything else, and that should carry you through. So, I mean, what, in what uh, sense But they're constantly working and they're improving, so that's what probably tipped them over in the end. What do you think is like the difference between 2700 and 2750? Can you feel it when you play or not? It's hard. Uh, in general, the, it seems that when I'm preparing for the higher rated players, the ones mm -hmm. they have more interesting opening ideas, more qualities mm. in small measures. And uh, as you drop down, you feel 
they are 99% of it, but there's always that one little thing uh, perhaps lacking, and that's mm -hmm. what is holding back. In this, uh, at the higher ends of the rating list, uh, small differences get magnified in actual performance and uh, mm. ratings. So. so it's all about small differences Correct. at that level. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's not even a difference in just understanding, simply how they cope with the tension at the board. Uh, a better decision, a better risk, a better, mm. you know, all these things uh, then become magnified in importance. You talk in your book about how it took you a while to develop the mindset to want to become a world champion, how for some time, you know, you were quite happy with how your career was going, and, you know, the world championship was not necessarily, you know, the be-all and end-all. And, you know, how did, that, how did that come about, Vishy, that eventually you were like, okay, this is my goal? It was always my goal, and, uh, you know, I would have been happy to take it, but there comes a point, perhaps, when you realize that, uh, uh, it, it calls for unlimited sacrifice and focus and you know your willingness to do what it takes and and maybe that's really what uh, I was referring to in a sense because you come to a point when you just think um, it doesn't matter how hard it gets I've got to invest more and the whole time when you're playing you've got to take everything that in you know in your stride like Nepo will have to take this one in his stride mm -hmm. and just like Ding Liren took two rounds ago in his stride we just have to take in the stride, you know, there's uh, no room for self-pity, you just get on with it and uh, uh, keep trying to improve. Um, and you'll also have to improve on, I think his D6 has happened. Yes. Okay, he's going for my favorite move. And is that a resignation? Nope, he's still, he's still fighting on, so, okay. Uh, he's going to be giving up that rook on No, he didn't eight. go queenie. He went yes. queen g8, yeah. And now... Uh, the deck take queenie six. Uh, mm -hmm. And Ding is going to bring in his queen right now. Yeah, there's not much Nepo can do because the queen wait, is... Wait, 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 wait. Mm -hmm. uh, king g7? King g7. Um, okay, so uh, you're saying on rook f1, you're going to be defending with what, rook h6? Yes. But then I can even go like rook here. And rook okay, in. so let's see rook d1, and maybe he just wants to go king g6 and make him come back. Okay, this is the position on the board for now. So, yeah, yeah what happens rook on rook, I mean, rook f1 looks very efficient. Rook f6, and then even some move like rook f2, and it's looking ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, why, and why were you saying you don't like this one? Is there some. No, this is also fine. Yeah, it seems uh, like we're going to yeah. be able to get yeah. in with yeah, rook no, d8. No, excuse me. Yeah. So the match with Casper was a very pivotal point in your life, yeah? Um, not too much. It was very early. I realized some shortcomings, and I mm -hmm. realized that uh, it was very interesting. Maybe I remember reading this uh, remark of um, Kramnik. I think I mentioned in my book as well. Kramnik said uh, in an interview when he played, when he beat Casper, I think, um, he said, um, I knew uh, I could face him on even terms. And on top of that, when I was working with him, when I was working with Kasparov, I, um, I immediately asked myself, why not the Berlin defense? Because mm. even then it seemed to me that it was an obvious gap in Kasparov's um, preparation. Or it was just a very good opening against him. Mm. And I remember thinking, Never once in 95 or 96 or 97 or 98 did I consider the Berlin defense as a serious open. I mean, I, as I consider it as something I wanted part of my repertoire. Hmm. And then I, um, I felt quite embarrassed. He said both with short and with uh, mm -hmm. Anand, it seemed like there was no plan at all. Mm -hmm. Slightly cruel observation, but I, when I read it, I thought, he's got a point. <laughs> and... Uh, I was very pleased that in Bonn I was able to do this because in Bonn essentially I found the nature of the match that I wanted to have mm -hmm. with him and I think that's uh, helped me a lot in terms of what um, we got to in the end. So um, that was one moment. You also have to decide what kind of, um, what you want the end result to be. Let's put it that way. It's no longer only about uh, just choosing an opening, working on it and fixing it. Um, what are the qualities I need? Um, what are the things that will happen during the tournament? All you know, it's a whole bunch of thoughts. Essentially, it's much, much more than uh, just technical work. You think of psychological work. You try to understand your opponent. All those things. I did it, but at a superficial level in '95, 
in 2008, I think uh, that's when I really think I got it right. You know, when I read that book, I think that remark by, by Kramnik, it stayed with me as well, because I was like, yeah, that's kind of a very honest but cruel remark. I can see how it's, you know reading something like that would sting. But at the same time, he kind of gave you like a push, right? Like a push, he's like, okay, this is how you have to think um, in your world championship matches. And it seems like you basically applied everything um, d you know, differently by the time you played your match with him. Correct. Um, it seemed to me that um, uh, I was looking for something in that match and I wanted to do it. I tried to approach it simply that I wanted to be, I wanted to play creatively. And by the way, this match could end at any minute. Queen takes f5, I don't see a defense. Queen e5 check, I don't see a defense. Uh, this oh, game yeah. is going to end at any moment. We take f5 as well because you can't even take on e7. So. I guess the point of this is like the king is going. But here. then queen takes f5 check. Yeah, and are you coming around from h7? I think yes. you are. And I'll go queen at 7 check. Oh, queen. Uh, yeah, queen at 7 check. King so e6. Look at that active king. That reminds me of and a Ronian's now, king. A rookie 1 check. Um, or a queen e4 check, whichever I want. Yeah, rookie 1 check. Yeah, king here. And now queen e4, for instance. It's just lovely. Yeah, you're not supposed to really have a king like that in chess, are you? No. Yeah, that threatens to win the rook. Okay. No, I just, I just recalled this, uh, this famous um, blitz game between Caruana and Aronian from the American Cup, where Aronian had a king like this forever and somehow managed to not get mated. But of course, in, in a classical game, that king um, is going to get mated a lot more easily. We are playing for content, Fabi. Is that the one? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think that was it. That was a great match. Yeah. I enjoyed watching that one. It was amazing how long Levon's king managed to stay alive. Um, okay, so right now we got uh, Ding thinking he's got... He's enjoying himself ooh, a tad yeah. too much. You know what? Oh, they've made the time control. It's so 47. Yeah. No, it's not the... Yeah, move actually. That's an, move. that's an hour and seven minutes, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> not, they're not a minute definitely past the time control, yeah. so it doesn't matter that they have... Um, Oh, yeah, well, they, it's not a minute, it's like an hour and 12, that's it, that's what it is. Yeah, hour and 12 versus an hour and 6, so, I mean, in the next few minutes, we expect this game um, to be over and for Ding to have equalized the match, and he just needs to figure out, right now, given where the, the queen is hanging, does he On want to take... I would play queen takes f5, I think that's easier. Yeah, you just take the pawn, they obviously can't take on... And I'm threatening rook d8 anyway, so you yes. have to go rook f6. You have to go here. Whereupon I take on take. g5 as well. And if you go king f7, mm -hmm. then I take on h5 as well. And thank you very much. You it's can just, just trade off everything. Yes. Yeah, you just take and then. Rookie one check. And and it's then, not trading. Yeah, it's not even, it's not even trading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't, you can even take either way and you yes. win stuff. Yeah, I guess. Okay. I think he did not take anything. I think yes. he chose queen king, e5. Okay, he's gone queen e5 check. And if yeah. queen f7, then queen f5, rook f6. It's also winning. So queen e5 and basically rook f6 walks no, right into the pin. No, rook f6 and rook d6, so you have to yeah. go king f7 now. Yeah. Is Nepo going to bother? I don't know. He is going to bother. Yeah, he's going to bother. But of course, you know, the writing is on the wall in this game. And Ding is going to be capturing the pawn. And the pawn cannot be captured because of rook e1. So rook f6, yep. And we were looking at queen h7 here. Let's just make sure there's nothing else. Queen d5 check, you go... Rook e6, whereupon queen h5, my g take, queen takes g5 might be winning, but you don't want to really give the e7 yeah. call, right? No, I mean, I, I do like yeah, the simplicity of that, because you're basically forcing this king way out into the open. And Rook e1. And, and um, yeah, you go maybe here. Then I can go queen, uh, yeah, e4 anyway, because the king has no squares. Yeah, you just come back. I think why ding, is Nepo doing yep. Why is Nepo yeah, doing this to himself? Yeah, he's playing it out. He's, um, yeah, it's must But you be see, you're just so angry at yourself. And mm. um, you're almost punishing yourself by doing this. The right king's right. on e6, yeah. Rook e1 check. OK, so ding. It's just amazing in chess how you can really see by the players' faces what is going on in the game. I mean, even though chess players are supposed to kind of uh, be quite a have stolid expressions at the board, but I mean, everything is quite evident in the body language, who's mm -hmm. the victor. Very much. Yeah. Um, and okay, king e6, what other moves are we expecting here? Yeah, rook e1, most natural. So where's the, where's the win, Vishy? We're gonna go Just back. Queen e4 centralize. Queen e4 centralize and say, king here is not very safe. 
Uh, you can't pick up this pawn. Well, hold on. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, this is actually a Queen checkmate. Yeah. yeah, that's not just a harmless check. You can't even use your rook to defend your king. So basically, you're threatening what? Like to, to bring out this king even further into the middle. That's the idea. Yeah, and the queen is the worst possible blockader of a pass pawn. Yes, and Ding is thinking about this move rookie one. I guess, you know, there's no hurry for him in this position. I mean, the one thing that he doesn't want to do is attack the queen. I, th I wondered if even this, you could win the thing, but uh, like queen e4 check, but you've lost control, right? Queen uh, d5 check. Yeah. Queen e6, uh, it's not over. Yeah, I mean, and that's basically the only way nuts. to blunder this away. So. That's not what's going to happen. But by this time, we are in the point where we think, even if there's a one in a million chance my calculations are wrong, I'm not going to go there. There's something simpler. Yeah. <laughs> so rookie one is just it. Yeah. Rookie one, because it forces the king further out. I mean, you don't want to go back there, because actually, that's where the queen just you was, You could basically. do that as well, because king f7, rookie one, but then king g7, and you still have to mm. get the job done. Yeah. No, this is very nice and simple. Rook here. No matter where the king goes, queen comes back to the center, and then and the attack I'm goes saying that, that uh, side. I'm going to fork your king and rook somehow, and uh, like if you go king c7, then I go queen e5 and rook d1, and I'm, it's over. So mm. uh, this way, there is no way you can save it. Yeah, it's amazing the power of that pawn. You can also repeat twice. You can go queen e4 check, queen f7 check. Well, Ding, I think, has handled this part of the game very confidently. Yeah. Right after, after he sacked the exchange, it was just flawless. And G4. Yeah. Very nice, yeah. That was a pretty touch. All right, so. And look, he just uh, calculated E7, D6. None of this. Uh, I yeah. won't spoil this thing that I was trying to do. So good job. Yeah. Trying to give us a shorter day. Um, Has he gone rookie one? No, that's No, you. Okay. he's still thinking. But I think he's, he's going to be making a move soon. So what do you think You know, the, the match dynamics are going to be like after this game is over, Vishy? <laughs> Um, nothing now. Jan will settle into the new situation, and we have a match with a tight score and everything still. But both of them have sort of gone through this test of fire. Mm -hmm. There's something a, de a defeat and a win uh, awakens in you that just mm -hmm. drawing you can still sometimes go on autopilot. Yeah. But this is beautiful for both of them to wake up, and this is perfect. So. Yeah. Okay. Did he make a move? Is he reaching? He's reaching for a d different move completely from what we were looking at. Wow. We did not even consider this one at all. I think Jan is also a little bit surprised by it. But um, it's fine. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, he wants to go rookie one. It's the winning threat. It's a little strange so that he Jan decides. Go rook G6? Uh, it's a little strange that he decided to do it without Oh, then checks. Queen F8 even went. Rook G8, Queen F8. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can't even take the pawn because right. of rookie one. And, and Rook G8, then even Queen takes G8. Mm. Oh, that's so pretty. Yeah, and then Rook D8. So mm -hmm. not that. Queen G7 wins. And you even. Yeah, Queen G7, I guess one of but the many I winning tries. I think Rook G1, Queen E4 is going to be plus seven as well. Yeah, then yeah, then yeah. So it's not a hardly a. Serious choice. So, I mean, basically, mm. he's going after this rook. This king is trapped here. He cannot go anywhere, right? There's barely any moves to be made. Um, can he try? OK, you can't even go there because of the check. Then we promote. And if uh, rook f7, queen g6 even. And you're kills. pinned, and oh, man, mm. that gets ugly. No, I think Jan is appreciating the power of this move, too. Yeah. But you see how hard it is to just walk away. You're just furious with yourself, and uh, uh, it's, you know, he just can't bring himself to walk away. He's f he must be very, very upset. But as I said, he'll have to take it on the shin and, and uh, get ready for the next. Yeah, games. I mean, um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just uh, really struck by how spot on Kramnik's prediction is. Uh, turned yes. out to be, and in fact, you know, I had prepared to read it today, and that's how it's working out. He has not resigned. Rook g6. Yeah. And now queen f8. Mm -hmm. Along with every other move as well, but uh, queen f8. Yeah. I mean, okay. I guess you can always throw in rook e1, but 
But I'm pretty sure that your queen f8 is, is like his point. Yeah, and rook it g8, a, queen yeah. g8 is pretty, but. It is a pretty move. I mean, I suppose if he didn't want to do it. Um, By the way, uh, mm -hmm. queen f8, rook g8, rook d8 wins as well. Yeah. Just so can, the full sandwich. You can win, sandwich, you can win a rook. Sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's quite funny. You just win that rook with check. Or queen takes e7 and rook g8, whichever you like. Yes. It's just not, this is crazy. Yeah, no, queen f8 is very nice and simple. And queen f8, uh, okay, I mean, let's stop. <laughs> Queen F8. Okay, Ding's settling in for a think here, probably on the last couple of moves of the game. Yeah, they're going to be in kind of these symmetric situations, you know. A couple of days ago, Ding was very depressed at this press conference, and today I think Nepo is is um is also going to be feeling that I don't know yeah. that's why I feel like you got to feel some happiness when you play chess you know you get those wins because like who knows when this day is going to come and you're going to be so far queen from that yeah. queen of fate is on the board yeah. and Jan has resigned yeah so very big comeback from yeah. Ding very big and uh, uh, very courageous play because for me Holding these pawns on d5 mm -hmm. seemed very difficult, but um, um, and Ding went for queen f3, rook takes d4, knight b3 all instantly because it is winning. And, um, yeah, I mean, I guess very significant moment in this game was when Ding decided to sacrifice a pawn with c5, and that basically set up the whole middle game play with him having these strong center pawns. Um, that Nepo had to deal with for the whole game. And ultimately, the next big critical point was when uh, Nepo allowed this exchange sacrifice with rook takes d4. He came in with his knight. Probably not a great idea as, well, White's position after that was just winning. Absolutely. It, uh, it just went straight downhill after that. So we have a few minutes left until the press conference. And I wanted to let our viewers know that today is sadly the last game that Vishy is going to be commentating with us from Astana. And from game five, I'm going to be joined by Grandmaster Daniil Dubov. So Vishy, this is the second world championship match that you've agreed to uh, serve as a, an official match commentator for. And I wanted to thank you on behalf of the whole chess community for coming here to share your experience and knowledge and your love of chess with us. And for me personally, it's been a big honor and pleasure to, to work with you this week. So, you know, thank you for giving back to chess in this way because it is very special for a world champion to be here with us and guiding us through the experience of a world championship match. Thank you so much, Irina. It's been a pleasure working with you as well. And uh, uh, it's an added bonus that uh, this year's match is um, so much more dramatic. And uh, it's been four days of fun. Yeah, no, these have been great days of chess. And already two decisive games out of the first four. I mean, a very fighting match. And I'm leaving you guys in a good place. Exactly. And, uh, uh, I'm sure you and uh, Daniel will do a great job in, for the remaining eight games, or how many other games there are. Yeah, but hopefully uh, eight. Hopefully eight, yeah. and then a day of tie breaks, you know, to sure. make it super exciting. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it can be better than this. I mean, already two, two blows landed, both players having tasted blood, and, um, and I mean, Ding is going to be feeling, obviously, so much better. I mean, you know, this, it's funny, Vishy, because I already felt, right, that things were changing yesterday. It was just palpable, you know, how, how much better he was feeling, how much happier he looked. And it wasn't that Nepo wasn't looking good. It was just the, the change was coming from Ding. You know, but, you know, who could have predicted that such a big win today? And so this is also what I went about many matches. Uh, Nepo seemed top of the world two days ago. Today's thing, these things can switch very fast. And uh, the match initiative goes back and forth multiple times. We will uh, see this often. Um, and, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to leave on this note. This was, uh, it's nice to have chess played like this. Yes. And, um, oh, I think the press conference is about to start, guys. Yeah. Players are sitting down. Um, and we will see you in a couple of days after the rest date for game five. Thanks for watching.
today's day's games have ended and they will run as one continuous game, which makes the um, results tie to two. Uh, we're starting with the questions for me. I will open the press conference and of course I will give the floor to the press. So the first question to uh, think, what is your immediate feelings after this game? Uh, please also start the microphone. Well, of course I'm very happy to win the game and yeah, I'm also with the p uh, I'm pleased with my um, uh, the, the quality. Yeah, it's a very hard game, and I I managed to uh, keep things under control. So I'm very happy. Thank you. Uh, to Jan, the same question: What is your immediate feeling after the game? And yeah, not great. Uh, I guess it was very, a very tense game, so I think um, I think I misjudged the, uh, like the position after like C5, like letting uh, all this structure happen, so I thought it's quite nice for black, but uh, if, even if so, it's incredibly difficult to play, yes, so I mean, you have basically no idea what to do. Uh, but I guess it was... Uh, I mean, more or less, more or less playable, of course, and until I just um, lost uh, my focus and uh, uh, ended up letting uh, rook d4 happen. But I guess uh, if not rook d4, I mean, okay, if not go for this like um, <coughs> uh, uh, for this maneuver like knight f5, just play slowly like rook d8, c6, or something. So I should be, I should be still quite tense. But uh, yeah, clearly it's much easier to play f for white. Uh, talking about this moment of knight d4 and rook d4, I would ask uh, the next question right away, Jan. Um, have, you, have you missed this rook d4 move or you have seen it? And if you have seen it, what was the evaluation of that position? Uh, no, somehow, of course, I, I missed it. So I saw, okay, this move is possible. But, uh, you know, uh, of course, rook d4 is strong, but it, it wouldn't be as that deadly if not, if not knight b3. And c5, like, never works because of d6. Uh, so yeah, it was quite unfortunate, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dink, um, the question about this moment of knight d4 and rook d4. We have seen your reaction on camera. Um, you, your, your face uh, expressions changed right away, and you made uh, this rook sacrifice, exchange sacrifice in about one minute. Can you please share these feelings that you're fe feeling at that moment? Uh, to be honest, when I play Queen F3, uh, uh, I was calculating something like Knight D4 and Queen D3 back. Uh, but when he played Knight D4, I, I suddenly saw the idea of exchange sacrifice and the important point is after C5, I have D6. This is very, very uh, lucky for me since C5 doesn't work and he not only lose the pawn, but also my knight is very, very strongly placed on d4. So it's like, uh, yeah, suddenly I feel I was winning at that point. So, yeah, it's uh, a little bit hard to, hard to believe. Right. And uh, this is your first victory at the World Championship match. Does it feel different uh, than the other victories in the other tournament? Uh, yeah. Mm. I'll say. Yeah, this game, I, I guess I, I, I made myself to, uh, to fully, com fully focus on the game and it went, the result was what as I expected. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, uh, I can say it's the most important win so far since World Championships is, is uh, totally different, for example, let's say, uh, candidates. Right, thank you. And if I may ask the same question to Yanis, you have won 
the first game in the World Championship match is just on, uh, on round two. Does it feel different when you're winning at the World Championship match rather than the other tournaments? I already forgot. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess that's it from, from my side. Now it's time to open the floor to the press. Please go ahead. Добрый вечер. Вообще эта позиция, она выглядит такая, по-человечески ее играть достаточно, видимо, все-таки сложно. Или вам было комфортно и просто вот что-то пошло не так в этой такой нестандартной пешечной структуре и вообще в нестандартной позиции? Dear, dear young, uh, the, the question is to you, it's um, this pawn structure that you had, that position, was it comfortable for you to play or, or what do you think about it? Ну, как я уже сказал, позиция довольно интересная, но, наверное, неправильно оценил, потому что я не знаю, какая оценка объективная, но на практике просто очень сложно делать ходы. То есть, может быть, просто надо черными стоять или, там, не знаю, не трогать коня на d6, то есть, или, может быть, вообще оставить пешку на e5 и просто стоять. Вот. Но, в принципе, белые как-то пытаются усилиться. Вот. Ну, наверное, не стоило допускать такую структуру. Uh, just a moment, we need to translate this and then please. So uh, Jan replied that, uh, yeah, actually the position is quite interesting, but it's of course uh, hard to play and um, the, the, there are opportunities also available. Yeah, I shouldn't have expected like D6. Uh, um, so so it's, it's possible so to play this game. Ну, как показала партия, наверное, не обязательно было. Uh, the question was, uh, was it required to play f6? As uh, Jan said, uh, the game showed not. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions from press? Uh, Mike Klein with chess.com. My question is for Ding Loren. Uh, in order to get to this moment, you had to play some games in China to achieve the minimum number. You also had to work out travel difficulties to get to Spain. You had to have Magnus decline. So a lot of things happen to get you here. I'm wondering, do you believe in fate or destiny or anything like that? Well, it had all, all passed, I guess, yeah, before uh, there are many, a lot of feelings co uh, come across to me, but now I was totally focused on this match yet. Thank you. Next one. Maria, please. Uh, hello. Uh, Maria with <coughs> Photoshop from chess.com. Uh, the first question is uh, for Ian. Uh, were you aware of uh, this line until move 10 uh, being played in 2013 by Richard against uh, Zaragatsky? Were you aware of this game uh, before? Well, uh, surely I uh, I knew this line. I tried to recall some prep, uh, so though maybe I mixed up things. But uh, yeah, I guess the position is very very solid for Black. But uh, uh, once again, uh, probably this like was ever optimistic to let this c5 e5 happen. Uh, but uh, but particular game of uh, uh, I said report. Uh, Prob prob probably not, but uh, I guess uh, I play with Ding, not with Report, yeah. I, and the second question is uh, to Ding uh, the sa about the same uh, position. It seems like you had an improvement uh, on move 11, playing Castle uh, instead of H4, which played Richard in uh, 2013. Was it uh, prep uh, in advance with your second? Uh, do you need to repeat the yeah, question? I, 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 yeah. Please louder, yeah. because we cannot really hear that, that well. Yeah, so it seems like until move 10, you were following the game that your second report played uh, 10 years ago. Uh, ha have you prepared it with him, and have you prepared the improvement of move, move 11 to play Castle? No, to be honest, I was out of paper after night F4. Okay. So I was on my own after that. Okay, so it was not a novelty on move 11, no. at least not, not that you were aware of. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have next question? Uh, all right, now we have the time of Twitter segment. We are bringing some of the questions that the audience has from online, and Jesse will bring that. Hello, my name is Jesse February. 
the first question is for Ding. Is staying ahead on time, on the clock, something you ever think about? Uh, you need to repeat the question once again, a bit louder, right. please. No problem. Is staying ahead on time, on the clock, something you think about? On time? Yeah, like um, the clock. Sorry. <laughs> it's OK. I can move on to the next question. Next question, so yes. For both of you, from Emil, how much contact do you have with your family and parents during the match? Uh, I can say my mother, they accompany me. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> and to Jan, how much contact do you have with your family during the match? Uh, like every day, basically, but uh, <coughs> uh, not too much. Thank you. All right, the next question is from Jade. For Nepo, did you anticipate the English opening today? Sorry, again? Did you anticipate the English opening today? Have you expected English uh, opening today? Yes, not this particular line, but uh, yeah, it's one of the main openings for, uh, for Ding, so yeah. Uh, shame on me for not repeating lines properly. Yeah, thank you. Um, next question. Just and uh, the last one from Cleo Mania. Ding. If this game was an 80s song, which song would it be? <laughs> you would like to me to compare the game to a song? <laughs> no, it's not uh, some classical games. The, I mean, the sacrifice for initiative, maybe like some kind of, uh, it's a modern way to approach approach to chat, not some, uh, not from the uh, classical world championship, I guess. Thank you, Jesse. We have more questions. Mike, please. Mike MikeLineChess.com. My question is for Grandmaster Jan Nepomneshi. At the last world championship, you had some losses and different players, I imagine, deal with losses in different ways. Maybe you review the game right away. Maybe you don't look at it again. Uh, did you discuss with your team how to handle a loss this time in case it happened, and do you plan to maybe react differently than you did in Dubai in any way? Well, I'll surely discuss tonight. Uh, but uh, no, I guess it's, I mean, it's a long match, so it's, it's only beginning. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't compare as well to Dubai, it was like a different story, so. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think we can have last few questions for today. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. And we have, I think, from commentary team as well, right? Okay, go ahead, Mike. Uh, still Mike Klein, chess.com. Question is for Grandmaster Ding Loren. Uh, you seem like you're getting more comfortable at the press conferences as well as at the board. Is that an accurate statement? Do you feel more comfortable here answering questions than at the beginning of the match? You feel very comfortable at the press conference yeah. as well as the playing venue. Do, do you feel more comfortable now? Yes, clearly I feel more comfortable. <laughs> uh, we have one more question. Thank you very much. Ulrich Stock from German newspaper Die Zeit. Um, I heard Ding that you are back in this hotel again. Is it true? Yeah. And why is that? Well, I, I started to get used of this hotel, and I want to try to win. That, that's uh, that's the main reason I come back. So, so you spent just one night in a different place? Uh, one or two nights, I, I couldn't remember. Thank you, Dink, for the answer. Uh, one more question from, from this side. The question to Dean Clarem. In the second game, you played d4. Today, you played c4. Maybe we can expect to play e4 next game with white. Uh, well, I cannot review if I. Also, now I'm not sure w which opening will I play on the next game. Nothing to do with the first game, first move, but with uh, opening with the ideas, which ideas you want to try in this specific game. And also another question, 
here I have seen the famous grandmaster from first generation of Chinese grandmaster, Hu Jun, and he is in the team. Yeah, he yeah, he's the coach of the Chinese national team. И последний, это не вопрос, а пожелание Яну хорошо провести выходной день и успешно сыграть следующие партии. Спасибо. So the, the last was not a question, it was more a wish to Mr. Yan have a great holiday tomorrow and wish you good luck in the future games. All right, thank you. I see there's no more press questions. I have one last question uh, before we call it a day. That's to Yan, not just question. <laughs> Uh, we know that you have a cat and a dog at home. Mm -hmm. If you could, would you have brought Snow, your dog, and Richie, your cat, to Asana to bring you comfort? Ah, uh, that's quite double-edged. Because uh, normally it's, I mean, uh, you know, these, uh, these guys, they wake you up like when they need, so it uh, could also be harmful. But yeah, for the good mood, for sure. And uh, the question to you, to the, do you also have a pet? Pets? No, no, not now. <laughs> not now. All right, all right. I see we don't have more questions. I don't have more questions to you. Thank you so much. Uh, we can conclude today. Tomorrow <coughs> is a rest day, and we will resume the match the next day. So thank you very much. We have a long history of supporting um, chess players with disabilities uh, and uh, some of them were able to take part uh, in previous Olympiads, uh, but just a few of them. We thought uh, they deserve better, they deserve to be uh, full-scale participants uh, of our major events. Serbia is really the place where chess is important and historically speaking now this is the first ever Olympiad for chess players with disabilities and this was the best place for such an event. Many of these players, for them chess is a way of you know, entering the social life, interacting with others, meeting friends. So by playing this game, these people really have a life. That's why it's so important to have this. I'm very happy that first Olympiad uh, for people with disabilities is uh, organized here in Belgrade. I'm happy to see that uh, playing hall is very nice and the conditions are very nice. And as I see, participants are very satisfied with uh, all that uh, Belgrade uh, organized. So I'm glad to be here and to see it. It's a historical event that is happening for the first time. This is a huge event, brings us to community together and to, to move forward in the future. This will be very nice. I tell my players, but being part of the national team is a responsibility for us to inspire other people that disability should not hinder us to achieve goals, dreams just like any other person in my country without disability. Chess is the only sport where there is no difference between a uh, person with no disabilities and a person with disabilities. Like, it, it gives me the opportunity to beat giants. You, you see, I'm a small person. I cannot uh, walk, I use a wheelchair. And this sport gives me the opportunity to challenge myself against a regular people, you know. It's not so difficult for me to play chess with disability because it's just it's important uh, to have a good mind and to be uh, I know, calm. I go to a normal school with normal children so 
For me, it's not difficult. Those who are learning chess, uh, new beginners, those who are, uh, if they are blind, they need to touch the board a lot. But once you attain a level of, let's say, above 1600 or 1800, the board actually becomes a kind of like an extra help to you because you can visualize the position. Chess brings us together and it provides the equal and diverse ground, but also it is too available and suitable for all kinds of diversities. And I think this tournament uh, shows very well this fact. The first Olympiad is the most critical step of this important message. Chess is one of the most suitable uh, sport for disabled people. Chess is, you know, suitable for all of us. This event is a great opportunity for people with disabilities uh, to feel this atmosphere of uh, Olympiad and overcome our limits. I've been speaking with um, some of the players here, with uh, some of the relatives uh, of them here, and uh, they cannot uh, find the, the words uh, uh, to express their gratitude uh, of uh, this event uh, really uh, happening, because that's the happening of the lifetime for them. That's a special experience for them. They feel um, great satisfaction of being able to demonstrate the skills that they've been acquiring in under the very special conditions. We believe um, uh, it's just um, a first step uh, in a very long journey that we are going to uh, make um, uh, to have chess uh, fully inclusive uh, for all these uh, players, whatever disability uh, they have.